Hello and welcome to the 52nd annual Berkshire Hathaway shareholders meeting live from the CenturyLink Arena in downtown Omaha, Nebraska. I'm Andy Serwer of Yahoo Finance with my colleague Jen Rogers. Good morning. Andy and I are so happy to be here this Big day is finally here. It's informative, it's fun, and it's an experience that you can only get by being here or watching our stream. We're just about 15 minutes away from hearing from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. Uh, this uh, expo hall was very busy not that long ago with tons of people. They're going upstairs to take their seats now. And you can see uh, this is uh, Warren Buffett making his way around the expo earlier. Uh, not, a, not an inch in there. Now that everyone's upstairs getting ready, what, what do you think is going to be the most important thing to listen for today? Well, first of all, Jen, just look at those pictures, the throng. And, you know, among so many things that Warren Buffett does so well is he is a marketing genius. I mean, this is just an amazing event that grows every year. And the energy here is incredible. And remember, this is an annual meeting. Yes, I've been to other annual meetings. Right. It's like watching paint dry. Exactly. So it's all about the questions, Jen, and, and that's what makes this meeting so different is that he and his partner, Charlie Munger, sit there for hours. I think it's about seven hours, um, and we're going to be showing it all. Mm -hmm. um, and shareholders ask questions, and it's really interesting stuff, and I think people are going to be talking about a couple of issues that are really most important to them when it comes to Berkshire Hathaway. They want to talk about IBM mm -hmm. and the fact that uh, Buffett has reduced his stake in that company. Also, his investment in Apple and uh, probably some issues uh, at Wells Fargo. Right, and the IBM news just came out uh, before this meeting started, so that's really fresh in people's minds. So a change there, what will he say? And Apple, of course, for so long, uh, he wasn't really in tech, and that move to get into it has paid off pretty handsomely, at least with Apple so far. That's right, and there's always a story behind the story. In that case, Jen, um, his two investment managers, uh, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler, were the ones who made the decision to get into Apple. So he'll have questions about that, and I'm sure there will be questions about politics as well, Donald Trump, and what that means for Berkshire, for the markets, and for the American economy. And certainly the airlines possibly coming up as well. That's been an area that we have seen him move into. And it's also been in the news recently with some customer service videos that have surfaced and uh, made for a lot of uh, controversy. That's right. And, and also, you just don't know what people are going to ask. I mean, yep. as he says, you know, it's an open mic and people ask all kinds of questions. They'll ask about the countries that they're from and there are people from all over the world here. They'll ask about raising their kids mm -hmm. and the best values to impart to them. It, it's, it's really pretty interesting. It uh, really runs the gamut. Mm -hmm. So for just the second year, today's meeting is being live streamed globally and exclusively on Yahoo Finance. Millions of people online and a near record 40,000 are expected to be in attendance here at the arena in Omaha. The long lines began here at CenturyLink very early this morning. It was still dark. In fact, I would say it was barely early morning, Andy, because some of the early birds that I talked to started arriving at 1 a.m. They had their pizza boxes. They just had to sit there the whole night. A usual carnival-like atmosphere, which is really why so many people call this annual gathering the Woodstock of capitalism. But I would say that Woodstock did not have Warren Buffett dolls. So uh, talking about all of the brands and that this guy is a real branding genius, all of the companies around here uh, have their little tchotchkes, basically. Right. So this right. is one. This is a, he actually talks. I'm going to play him for you. <laughs> one more. So this is one of the uh, things that I picked Come up. On. I don't think they had that at Woodstock. Uh, there are items here that you can only get right now on the floor. One of them is a cherry flavored Coke can with the Oracle of Omaha on it. For China. You can see, yeah, for China. Chinese market. Mm -hmm. Chinese market there. Where he is, of course, a rock star. Rock star. The people at the very beginning of the line, uh, those people that I was just talking about that got here at 1 a.m. from Hong Kong. Amazing. They and, flew and, all the way from yep. Hong Kong. They're in the States for five days, and they... You know, they're like, we are going to get the best seats. We want to look Warren Buffett right in the eyes while he's talking. 
Yeah, it's just amazing out there, and people pay other people to wait in line, um, and it's it's just oh. it's really crazy. Here I also they all are all just starting oh, to rush in. This yeah, is when I, they let them in. Right. I know you had another great shot of that too. You were right there. You almost got run over. I did almost get run over. Um, some other stuff. I've got something here, which is which is kind of interesting. Um, there are all manner of books about Warren Buffett. Yes, but there's this a whole bookshop. A back bookshop there. right behind us. This is the Oracle's Fables. It's actually, yep, a kid's book, and it's sort of based on Aesop's fables. And so each story has a little Buffettism. Have you read any? Have you learned like how to become a billionaire? I haven't cracked this yet. Obviously, I haven't learned how to be a billionaire. <laughs> Finally, I have to show you the Jello. The what? Yeah, Jello. So this is a, a Kraft Heinz product, Jello. And Andy, I made this in my hotel room Get last night. Yeah, they're Jello. They're in the shape of Warren and Charlie Munger. And maybe later I'll figure out how to get them out of here. So Lunch. Bes besides my very busy morning of Jello making, uh, we have also gotten a sort of a who's who here on the floor. Uh, Warren Buffett walking around. You saw those pictures. Bill Gates, Kathy Ireland. They were all here taking part in the fifth annual event known as the newspaper toss. So this is one of the more popular traditions here, Andy. You know, it's amazing. There's so many rituals now um, at this meeting. Um, there's this, there's, you know, the Borsheim shopping, which mm -hmm. is the big jewelry store on Sunday. There's Buffett's tour of the area. Um, and, and there's, you know, people have a whole routine. You know, they'll come here on Saturday, they'll shop, they'll go out to dinner with friends. There's a lot of different meetings and dinners that take place both on Friday night and Saturday night with with groups of investors and also just friends. And I mean, right. people have been coming here for decades. And family. A right. lot of people you can see, oh, hey, there's Lynn. We were interviewed oh, her yesterday. That's that 15-year-old uh, from Texas. You can see these uh, kids, uh, a lot of people bringing their kids. It is a real family event. Whether their kids are young, I mean, I saw people bringing their 50-year-old kids as well. <laughs> so here's today's schedule. In just a few minutes, the meeting will formally begin. There's a break at noon, and at that point, we're going to have our halftime show. At 1 p.m., the meeting resumes. Then we'll have our post-game show with highlights and analysis. At 3.45 p.m., we go back inside the arena. Andy, I, I'm exhausted just reading everything on here, and neither of us are over 80. I don't know how these guys do it. I mean, they are up there answering questions for hours. Um, Andy, I know you actually got a chance to talk with Warren already, uh, a sneak peek of sorts. Yeah, so the question is, how is today's meeting going to be different? And that's one of the questions I asked Warren Buffett when I sat down with him. Well, they won't be much different. I mean, it, it, we've got a format that seems to work, so we're not going to change it uh, in any material way. It was, it was a big change that, to have it uh, streamed by you last year, and it worked out so well that you know, we're just looking to, to widen that experience worldwide. But uh, Charlie and I are both a year older combined. Uh, we're 179 <laughs> years of age, and, and uh, we're just gonna have fun like every year. So has the live stream changed the way you thought about the annual meeting? Because the Super Bowl, you know, is of course broadcast, and I think they look to do more at the live event itself to make it different from the stream experience. But have you thought about that at all? We just get up there and improvise. I mean, Charlie and I do not plan anything ahead of time. We don't. Sometimes we don't even see each other until we get backstage after after the movie show, and, and uh, it makes it interesting for me because I never know what Charlie's going to say. You know, I mean, we can go from PG to R pretty fast sometimes. <laughs> Does it get tiring for you up there? No, no, it never gets tiring at all. It's as much fun at three thirty as it is at nine thirty. Have you thought about changing the way that you're communicating with shareholders using technology and email and more things like that at all? Or there's no hierarchy of shareholders at Berkshire. I mean, somebody can. Some mutual fund can own billions of dollars worth, and they do not get any special audience over somebody that's got one share of, of the B. So we've got this, and we're not looking to attract uh, big shareholders or anything of the sort. We, we want people to join us that have read the annual report and, and really share our philosophy. I mean, it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit like having a church. You really don't want everybody to join you. You want people that have similar beliefs. And, and, and so we don't measure it. We don't think it's a good idea to have different people in there every Sunday. <laughs> we want people who are going to stick. And, and therefore, we want to communicate to everybody in language they understand. We want to tell them the same things about Berkshire that I would tell my two sisters 
who have got a significant portion of their net worth in Berkshire, if they would ask me, you know, what, what what's interesting about Berkshire this year? What do I, what should I know that I didn't didn't learn last year? And we want to talk to the maybe a million shareholders, whatever we have, the same way I talk to my sisters. It's, it's the same approach. So many people have questions about investing, Warren, and you talk about that a lot. But do people really learn from what you say and then go out and successfully invest themselves, do you think? Well, I think some are helped. I mean, the main thing we want to give them, both Charlie and I feel this way, is the, the right attitude toward investing. I, I mean, you've got a big tailwind if you've invested in America over time, a huge tailwind. I would say that I hope our main message is to, to stay away from trying to trade stocks or do, do things that are kind of self-destructive and, and just, just let America do the work for them. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you, what are those mistakes? I mean, what, what do people do wrong? Well, the big mistake is thinking they know when to buy and sell stocks, that there are times to buy them and times to sell them. There's times to buy them. You know, and eventually maybe when you decide to start dissaving when you're 70 or 80 years of age or something of the sort, at that time you may sell them. But, but basically, uh, any attempts to pick the times to buy or, or sell, I think, are a mistake for 99% of the population. And I think that even attempts to pick individual securities, is, uh, uh, that's a mistake for people that they, they will do better with a very, very low cost S&P 500 index fund. Speaking of uh, your annual uh, letter to shareholders, you were very optimistic this year. Were you actually more optimistic because you sensed that there was pessimism out there that you wanted to address? Well, I think there was, there was more, probably more uncertainty there. That certainly when you, you probably had a, an election where more people came away disappointed and it would have been that way in either direction, but I mean, it, either way it went, you, you had people that probably were deeper in their beliefs for each candidate and who weren't going to get over it the next day. When you had Bush versus Gore, I mean, that was, the stage was set for terrific unrest going to the Supreme Court and everything, but America went to work the next day and, and people seemed to be forgot about it. This one on both sides, I think either side, uh, a, a significant percentage of the voters that supported would have supported the losing candidate would have had trouble getting it over quickly. But America is America. I mean, and, and, but I've always said it felt the same way. It, I just wrote about it in a little different terms this year, perhaps. But aren't you concerned a little bit, Warren, because it seems that right now we are divided politically, and perhaps that reflects an economic divide as well. And it doesn't seem to be getting better right now. You know, we've had a civil war in this country we got over, so uh, this country can get over a lot. I mean, uh, you know, you may not be old enough to remember the late 60s and early 70s, but there was, the divisions were very, very sharp there. And, and so we've, we've had plenty of times in this country where the, the, where the feelings have been intense, but it has never stopped the country. The American people as a whole, Amer America has never been wealthier than it is today. Now, the inequality bothers people, including me. I mean, uh, I think that in a country where the GDP real terms has gone up six for one since I was born, I would think there, there shouldn't be anybody that's willing to work 40 hours a week and has a couple of children where it really doesn't give them a fairly decent standard of living. And, and our market system, as it gets more specialized, produces more overall wealth, but it also leaves it, it, it leaves significant numbers of people behind. If you'd been in the waiting room with my, my dad in 1930 when I was being born. Thank you and good morning. Uh, that's Charlie, I'm Warren. Uh, you can tell us apart because uh, he can hear and I can see. That's why we uh, <laughs> work together so well. We usually have our specialty. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to, uh, we got a lot of out of towners here, and I'd like to welcome you to uh, Omaha. It's a uh, terrific, uh, it's a terrific city, and Charlie, uh, Charlie's lived in California now for about 70 years, but he's still got a lot of Omaha in, and both of us were born within two miles of this. Uh, building that you're in, 
And Charlie, uh, as he mentioned in his, in his description of his amorous triumphs in high school, Charlie uh, graduated from Central High, which is about one mile from here. It's a public school. And my dad, my first wife, my three children, and two of my grandchildren have all graduated from the uh, same school. In fact, my grandchildren say they've had the same teachers that my dad, my <laughs> they, but uh, oh, it's a great city. I hope you get to see a lot of it while you're here. Uh, and in just a minute, we will start a question period, hopefully in a question and answer period, uh, that will last till about noon, and then we'll take a break for an hour or so. We'll reconvene it at one. And then we'll go continue with the question and answer period till 3.30. And then we'll break for 15 minutes or so. And then we'll convene the, the annual meeting of Berkshire, which I we have three uh, uh, propositions that people wish to speak on. So that could last perhaps as long as an hour. Um, before we start, uh, I'd like to make a couple of introductions. Uh, the first being uh, Carrie Solva, who's been with us about seven years. And can we have a, a light on Carrie? I think she. Carrie, are you there? <laughs> Carrie. Stand up, Carrie, come on. <laughs> Carrie puts on this whole program. She came with us about seven years ago, and a few years ago I said, why don't you just put on the annual meeting for me? And she handles it all, and uh, she has two young children, and uh, she has dozens and dozens and dozens of exhibitors that she works with, and, and as you can imagine, with all of what we put on and all of the numbers of you that come, the hotels and the airlines and the rental cars, and and everything, uh, she does it as if, you know, she could do that and, and, uh, and be juggling three balls at the same time. She's, she's amazing, and I want to thank her for putting on this program for us. And, uh, I also uh, uh, would like to uh, welcome and have you welcome our directors they will be voted on later. Uh, uh, so I'll do this alphabetically. They're here in the front row, and if we could just have the spotlight drop on them as they're introduced. And alphabetically, there's Howard Buffett, Steve Burke, Sue Decker, Bill Gates, Sandy Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, we have Charlie Munger next to me, Tom Murphy, Ron Olson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitmer. Yeah. <laughs> One more introduction I'm going to make, but I'll save that for just a minute. And uh, our earnings report was put out yesterday. Uh, the, as we regularly explain, the realized investment gains or losses in any period really mean nothing. I mean, they, uh, we could take a lot of gains if we wanted to, we could take a lot of losses if we wanted to, but we don't really think about the timing of what we do at all except in relation to the intrinsic value of what we're buying or selling. We are not, we do not make earnings forecasts, and uh, we have, on March 31st, we have a, over $90 billion of net unrealized gains. So if we wanted to report almost any number you can think of and count capital gains as part of the earnings, uh, we could do it. And so in the first quarter, and I would say that we have a very, very, very slight preference this year if everything else were equal. Uh, well, it's true in any year, but it's a little more so this year. We, we would rather take losses than gains because uh, 
of the tax effect if, if two securities were equally valued. And there's probably just one touch more of emphasis on that this year because we're, uh, we are taxed on gains at 35 percent, which means we also get the benefit, the tax benefit at 35 percent of any losses we take. And I would say that there's some chance of that rate being lower, meaning that losses would have less tax value to us after this year than they would have this, this, uh, after this year than this year. Uh, that is not a big deal, but it would be a very slight preference, and it may get to be more of a factor in deferring any gains and perhaps accelerating any losses as the year gets closer uh, to December 31st, assuming, and I'm making no predictions about it, but assuming that there were to be a tax act that had the effect of reducing the earnings. So in the first quarter, uh, insurance underwriting was the swing factor, and then uh, the, there's a lot more about this in our 10Q, which you can look up on the internet. And you really, if you're, if you're seriously interested in evaluating our earnings or our businesses, uh, you should go to the uh, uh, 10Q because uh, the summer report, as we point out every quarter, does not really get to the main, a number of the main points of valuation. I would just mention two factors in connection with the insurance situation, which I love. Uh, in the first four months, not the first three months, but the first four months, Geico has had a net gain of 700,000 policyholders, and that's the highest number I can remember. There may have been a figure larger than that somewhere in the past. I'm not, I did not go back and look out at the mall. But last year, I believe that figure was like 300,000. And this has been a wonderful period for us at Geico because several of our major competitors have decided, and they, they publicly stated this. In fact, one of them just reiterated it the other day, although they now changed their policy. But they, they, they intentionally cut back on new business because new business uh, carries with it a significant uh, loss in the first year. There's just costs of acquiring new business. Plus the loss ratio, strangely enough, on first year business uh, tends to run almost 10 points higher than on renewal business. And uh, so not only do you have acquisition costs, but you actually have a higher loss ratio. So when you write a lot of new business, you're going to lose money on that portion of the business that year. And uh, we wrote a lot of new business, and at least two of our competitors announced that they were lightening up for a while on new business because they did not want to pay the penalty of, of the first year loss. And of course, that's made to order for us, so we just, we just put our foot to the floor and, and try to write as much business, good business as we can, and, and there are costs to that. A second factor, uh, well, it's not a factor in the PL, but uh, an important event in the first quarter is that we increased our float. And on the slide, I believe it shows it year over year, 16 billion. 14 billion of that came in the first quarter of this year. So we, we, uh, we had a $14 billion increase in float. And for some years, I've been telling you it's going to be hard to increase the float at all. And I still will study the same thing. but. It's nice to have $14 billion or more, uh, which is one reason, if you look at our 10Q, you will see that our cash and cash equivalents, including Treasury bills, uh, now has come to well over $90 billion. So I think uh, I feel very good about the first quarter, even though our operating earnings were down a little. But one quarter means nothing. I mean, over time, what really counts is whether we're building the value of the businesses that we own. and and. I'm always interested in the current figures, but I'm always dreaming about the, about the future figures. There's one more person I would like to introduce to you today, and I'm quite sure he's here. I haven't seen him, but I, I understood he was coming. Uh, there's a, I believe, uh, uh, that he's made it today, and that is Jack Bogle, who I talked about in the annual report. Jack Bogle has probably done more for the American investor than any man in the country. And Jack, could you stand up? There he is.
Jack Bogle, many years ago, he wasn't the only one that was talking about an index fund, but he, it wouldn't have happened without him. I mean, Paul Samuelson talked about it, Ben Graham even talked about it, but uh, the truth is it was not in the interest of, invest, of the investment industry of Wall Street. It was not in their interest, actually, to have the development of an index fund, of the index fund, because it brought down fees dramatically. And as we've talked about some in the reports and other people have commented, index funds overall have delivered for shareholders a result that has been better than Wall Street professionals as a whole. And part of the reason for that is that that they brought down the costs very significantly. So when Jack started, uh, very few people, certainly Wall Street, did not applaud him. And he was the subject of some derision and, and uh, uh, a lot of attacks. And now uh, we're talking trillions when we get into index funds. And we're talking a few basis points when we talk about investment fees in the case of index funds, but still hundreds of basis points when we talk about fees elsewhere. And I estimate that Jack, at a minimum, has saved, left in the pockets of investors without hurting them overall in terms of performance at all, uh, gross performance. He's put tens and tens and tens of billions into their pockets. And those numbers are going to be hundreds and hundreds of billions over time. So it's Jack's uh, 88th birthday on Monday. So I just say happy birthday, Jack, and thank you on behalf of American investors. And Jack, I've got great news for you. You're going to be 88 on Monday. And in only two years, you'll be eligible for an executive position at Berkshire. Uh, <laughs> so hang in there, buddy. <laughs> OK. We're, we've got a panel of expert journalists on this side and expert analysts on that side and expert shareholders in the uh, middle. And we're going to, to rotate. Uh, Starting with the analysts and some who are here, I have a, here we go. And we will, uh, we'll do this uh, through the afternoon after we, if we get through 54 questions, which would be, would be six for each journalist, six for each analyst, and, and uh, uh, 18 more for the audience. Then we will go strictly to the audience. Uh, I don't think I've got any information as to what the situation is on overflow rooms. Uh, but uh, we'll go to at least one of them. But let's start off with uh, Carol Loomis uh, of Fortune magazine, the uh, longest serving employee in the uh, history of Time Inc., I believe, with 60 years. And Carol, go to it. Um, thank you. Um, Thanks from all of us journalists up here. Um, I know that there are many, many people out there who have sent us questions that aren't going to get answered. And I just want to say that it's very hard to get a question answered. The one thing I can suggest is you follow Warren's thought uh, in the annual report that he wants everybody to go away from this meeting more, um, more uh, educated about Berkshire than uh, they were when they came. And one way you can do that is keep your questions quite uh, directly Berkshire-related or uh, relating to the annual letter. Even then, it will be hard to get your question answered. The, the three of us only have 18 questions in total. Uh, but I encourage you to think in the Ber Berkshire-related uh, direction when you're submitting a question next year. Now, my first question. Uh, it's about Wells Fargo which is Berkshire's largest equity holding, $28 billion at the end of the year. And, and this question comes from a shareholder who did not wish to be identified. In the wake of the sales practices scandal that last year engulfed Wells Fargo, 
The company's independent directors commissioned an investigation and hired a large law firm to assist in carrying it out. The findings of the investigation, which were harsh, have been released in what is called the Wells Fargo Sales Practices Report. You can find it on the internet. It concludes that a major part of the company's problem was that, and I quote, Wells Fargo's decentralized corporate structure gave too much autonomy to the community bank's senior leadership, end of quote. Mr. Buffett, how do you satisfy yourself that Berkshire isn't subject to the same risk with its highly decentralized structure and the very substantial autonomy given to senior leadership of the operating companies? Yeah, it's true that we at Berkshire probably operate on this. We certainly operate on a more decentralized plan than any company of remotely our, our size. And we uh, count very heavily on principles of behavior rather than uh, loads of rules. It's one reason that every annual meeting you see that Solomon uh, uh, description, and it's why I write very few communiques to our managers, but I send them one once every two years, and it basically says that we've got all the money we need. We'd like to have more, but we, we're, we're, it's, not a, it's not a necessity, but we don't have one ounce of reputation more than we need, and that our reputation at Berkshire is in their hands. And Charlie and I believe that if you establish the right sort of culture, and that culture to some extent self-selects who you obtain as directors and as managers, that you will get better results that way in terms of behavior than if you have a thousand page uh, guidebook. You're gonna have problems regardless. We have 367,000, I believe, employees. Now, if you have a town with 367,000 households, which is about what the Omaha metropolitan area is, people are doing something wrong as we talk here today. There's no question about it. And the real question is whether the managers at uh, are in a better, are, are worrying and thinking about uh, finding and correcting any bad behavior, and whether if they fail in that, whether the message gets to Omaha and whether we do something about it. At Wells Fargo, you know, there were three very significant mistakes, but there was one that dwarfs all of the others. You're going to have incentive systems at any business, almost any business. There's nothing wrong with incentive systems, but you've got to be very careful what you incentivize. And you can incentivize bad behavior, and if so, you better have a system for recognizing it. Clearly, at Wells Fargo, there was an incentive system built around the idea of cross-selling and number of services per, per uh, customer, and the, the company in every quarterly investor pre presentation highlighted how many services per customer. So it was the focus of the organization, a major focus, and undoubtedly people got paid and graded and promoted based on, on that number, or at least partly based on that number. Well, it turned out that that was incentivizing the wrong kind of behavior. We've made similar mistakes. I mean, oh, any company's gonna make some mistakes in designing a system, uh, but it's a mistake. And you're going to find out about it at some point, and I'll get to how we find out about it, but the biggest mistake was that, and I don't know, obviously I don't know the facts as to how the information got, this, got passed up the line at Wells Fargo, but at some point, uh, if there's a major problem, the CEO will get wind of it. And that is, at that moment, that's the key to everything, because the CEO has to act. That Solomon situation that you saw happened because I'm on April, I think, 28th, the CEO of Solomon, the president of Solomon, the general counsel of Solomon, sat in a room 
and they had described to them by a fellow named John Merriweather some bad practice, terrible practice, that was being conducted by a fellow named Paul Mosier, who worked for him. And Paul Mosier was flim-flamming the United States Treasury, which is a very dumb thing to do. And he was doing it partly out of spite, because they didn't, he didn't like the Treasury and they didn't like him. So he put in phony bids for U.S. Treasuries and all of that. So on April 28th, roughly, uh, the CEO and all these people knew that they had something that had gone very wrong, and they had to report it to the Federal Reserve Board in New York, the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. And the CEO, John, good friend, uh, said he would do it, and then he didn't do it. And he undoubtedly put it off just because it was an unpleasant thing to do. And then on May 15th, another Treasury auction was held, and Paul Mosher put in a bunch of phony bids again. And at this point, it's all over, because the top management had known ahead of time, and now a guy that was a pyromaniac had gone out and lit another fire, and he lit it after they'd been warned that he was a pyromaniac, essentially. And it all went downhill from there. It had to stop when the CEO learns about it. And uh, then they made a third mistake, actually, but again, it pales in comparison to the second mistake. They made a third mistake when they totally underestimated the impact of what they had done once it became uncovered, because they, there was a penalty of $185 million, and in the banking business, people get fined billions and billions of dollars for mortgage practices and all kinds of things. I, the total fines against the big banks, I don't know whether it totals 30 or 40 or billion or whatever the number may be. So they measured the seriousness of the problem by the dimensions of the fine, and they thought a $185 million fine signaled a less offensive practice than something that involved $2 billion, and they were totally wrong on that. But the main problem was they didn't act when they learned about it. It was bad enough having a bad system, but they didn't act. At Berkshire, uh, we have the main source of information for me about anything that's being done wrong at a subsidiary is the hotline. Now, we get 4,000 or so hotline reports or that come, uh, we get communications on the hotline perhaps 4,000 times uh, a year, and most of them are frivolous. You know, the guy next to me has bad breath or something like that. I mean, it's a, but, but there are, are a few serious ones. And uh, the head of our internal audit, Becky Amick, uh, looks at all those people, a lot of them come in anonymous, probably most of them, uh, and some of them she refers back to the companies, probably most of them. And, but anything that looks re serious, you know, I will hear about. And that has led to action, uh, we'll put them more than once. Uh, and we, we spent real money investigating some of those. We put special investigators sometimes on them. And like I say, it is it is uncovered certain practices that we would not uh, uh, at all condone at the parent company. I think it's it's a good system. I don't think it's perfect. I don't know what, I'm sure they've got an internal audit at Wells Fargo, and I'm sure they've got a hotline. And I don't know the facts, but I would just have to bet that a lot of communications came in on that, and I don't know what their system was for, for getting them to the right person, and I don't know who did what at any given time. But that was, it was a huge, huge, huge error if they were getting, uh, and I'm, I'm sure they were, getting some communications and they ignored them or they just sent them back down to somebody down below. Uh, Charlie, uh, you, you followed, what, what, what are your thoughts on it? Well, uh, put me down as skeptical when some law firm thinks they know how to fix something like this. If you're in a business where you have a whole lot of people under incentives, very likely to cause a lot of misbehavior, of course you need a big compliance department. Every big wirehouse stock brokerage firm has a huge compliance department, and if we had one, we would have a big compliance department too, wouldn't we, Warren? Absolutely. Absolutely. But that doesn't mean that 
everybody should try and solve their problems with more and more compliance. I think we've had less trouble over the years by being more careful in whom we pick to have power and having a culture of trust. I think we have less trouble, not more. But we will have trouble from time yes, to time. Yes, of course. Yeah. We'll be blindsided someday. Charlie says an ounce of prevention. He said when Ben Franklin, who he worships, uh, said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, he, he, understood, he understated it that an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure. And I would say a pound of cure promptly applied is worth a ton of cure that's delayed. And problems don't go away. John Goodfriend said that problem originally was, uh, what do you, he called it a traffic ticket. He told the troops there at Solomon it was a traffic ticket, you know, and it almost brought down a business. That, uh, uh, some other CEO that they described the problem that he had encountered as a footfall, you know, and it resulted in incredible damage to the institution. And so it, it, you've got you've to act promptly. And frankly, I don't know any better system than hotlines and anonymous letters. To me, I get anonymous letters. And I've gotten, I've gotten three or four of them, um, probably in the last six or seven years, that have resulted in major changes. And uh, very, very occasionally they're signed. Usually, almost always they're anonymous, but it wouldn't make any difference because there will be no retribution against anybody, obviously, if they call our attention to something that's going wrong. But I will tell you, as, as we sit here, somebody is doing, quite a few people are probably doing something wrong at Berkshire, and usually it's, it's very limited. I mean, it may be stealing small amounts of money or something like that. But when it gets to some sales practice like was taking place at Wells Fargo, you can see the kind of damage it would do. Uh, we will now shift over to the analysts and uh, Johnny Brent. Hi, Warren. Hi, Charlie. Thanks for having me. You've addressed the risk of driverless cars to GEICO's business, but it strikes me that driverless trucks could narrow the cost advantage of railroads even if the number of crew members in a locomotive eventually declines from two to zero. Is autonomous technology more of an opportunity or more of a threat for the Burlington Northern? Oh, I would say that the driverless trucks are a lot more of a threat than an opportunity to the Burlington Northern, and I would say that uh, if, if driverless cars became pervasive, it would only be because they were safer, and that would mean that, that the overall economic cost of, of uh, auto-related losses had, had gone down, and that would drive down the premium income of GEICO. So I would say both of those an au autonomous vehicles, uh, widespread, uh, would hurt us uh, if they went to, if, if they spread to trucks, uh, and they would they would hurt our auto insurance business. I think my personal view is that they will they will certainly come. I think they may be a long way off, but but uh, uh, that will depend. It'll probably, frankly, depend on on experience in the first. Uh, early months of the, uh, of the introduction in other than test situations. And if, if, uh, if, they, if they make the world safer, uh, it's going to be a very good thing, but it won't be a good thing for auto insurers. And similarly, if they learn how to move trucks um, more safely, there tends to be driver shortages in the truck business now. It obviously uh, improves their position vis-a-vis -vis the railroads. Charlie? Well, I think that's perfectly, perfectly clear. Yeah. <laughs> Finally approval, all these years. <laughs> okay, station one, the shareholder. Hi. Hi, Warren and Charlie. My name is Brian Martin, and I'm from Springfield, Illinois. In the HBO documentary, Becoming Warren Buffett, you had a great analogy comparing investing to hitting a baseball and knowing your sweet spot. Ted Williams knew his sweet spot was a pitch right down the middle. When both of you look at potential investments, what attributes make a company a pitch in your sweet spot that you'll take a swing at and invest in? Yeah. Well, I, 
I'm not sure I can define it in exactly the terms you would like, but the, 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 we sort of know it when we see it, and it, it would tend to be a business that, for one reason or another, we can look out five or 10 or 20 years and decide that the competitive advantage that it, that it had at the present would last over that period, and it would have a trusted manager that would not only fit into the Berkshire culture, but that was eager to join the Berkshire culture. And then it would be a matter of price. But the main, you know, when we buy a business, essentially we're laying out a lot of money now based on what we think that business will de deliver over time. And the higher the certainty uh, with which we make that prediction, the better off, the better we feel about it. You can go back to the first, uh, wasn't, for, wasn't the first outstanding business we bought, but it was, it was kind of a, a watershed event, which was a relatively small company, Seize Candy. And the question when we looked at Seize Candy in 1972 was would people still want to be both eating and giving away that candy in preference to other candies? Uh, and it wouldn't be a question of people buying candy for the low bid, and we had a manager we liked very much, and we bought a business that was pay $25 million for it net of cash, and it was earning about $4 million pre-tax then, and we must, must be getting close to $2 billion or something like that pre-tax that we've taken out of it. But it was only because we felt that people would not be buying necessarily a lower price candy. I mean, it does not work very well if you go to your wife or your girlfriend on Valentine's Day, I hope they're the same person, uh, and, <laughs> and say, uh, you know, here's a box of candy, honey, I took the low bid. You know, it, it doesn't, it, it loses a little of it as you go through that speech. And we made a judgment about C's candy that it would be special and probably not, not in the year 2017, but we certainly thought it would be special in 1982 and 1992, and fortunately we were right on it. And we're looking for more C's candies, only a lot bigger. Charlie? Yeah, well, but it's also true that we were young and ignorant then. And <laughs> now we're old and ignorant, yeah. <laughs> and, yes, that's true too. And, and the truth of the matter is that it would have been very wise to buy C's candy at a slightly higher price and if they'd asked it, we wouldn't have done it. So we've gotten a lot of credit for being smarter than we were. Yeah, and to be more accurate, yeah. if, it had been, if it had been five million more, I wouldn't have bought it. Charlie would have been willing to buy it. So <laughs> yeah. fortunately, that we didn't get to the point where we had to make that decision that way. But he, he would have pushed forward when I probably would have faded. It's a good thing, it's a good thing that the guy came around, actually the seller, uh, was the uh, was the grandson of, of Mrs. A, wasn't he, Charlie? He was Larry C's son, am I correct? Or Larry C's brother, but uh, he was not interested in the business. And he was, he was, he was interested in, more interested in girls and grapes, actually. And, and he almost changed his mind. Well, he did change his mind about selling. And I wasn't there, but Rick Aaron t told me that Charlie went in and gave a, an hour talk on the merits of girls and grapes over having a candy company. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, folks. <laughs> and the fellow sold to us, so that, I pulled Charlie out in emergencies like that. He's, <laughs> we were very lucky that early the habit of buying horrible businesses because they were really cheap. It gave us a lot of experience trying to fix unfixable businesses as they headed downward toward doom. And that early experience was so horrible, fixing the unfixable, that we were very good at avoiding it thereafter. So I would argue that our early stupidity helped us. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we learned we could not make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. No, so, we learned. So we learned. We went around looking for silk. But you have to that. try it for a long time and fail and have, rub, have your nose rubbed in it to really understand it. <laughs> okay, Becky. 
Okay, quick. Uh, this question comes from a shareholder named Mark Blackley in Tulsa, Oklahoma, who says, there has been more news than usual in some of Berkshire's core stock holdings, Wells Fargo and the incentive and new account scandal, American Express losing the Costco relationship and playing catch up in the premium card space, United Airlines and customer service issues, Coca-Cola and slowing soda consumption. How much time is spent reviewing Berkshire stock holdings and is it safe to assume if Berkshire continues to hold these stocks that the thesis remains intact? Well, we spend a lot of time thinking those are very large holdings. Uh, if you add up American Express, Coca-Cola, and Wells Fargo, I mean, you're getting up, uh, you know, well into the high tens of billions of dollars. And, and those are businesses we like uh, very much. They're, they're, they're different characteristics. In the case of you mentioned United Airlines. We actually are the largest holder of all four of the large. Uh, we're, we're the largest holder of the four largest airlines, and that is much more of an industry thought. Uh, but all businesses uh, have problems, and, and some of them have some very big pluses. Uh, I personally, uh, they mentioned American Express. If you read. American Express's first quarter report and talk about their platinum card. The platinum card is doing very well. Uh, the gains around the world, you know, I think there were 17 percent or something like that in buildings in the UK and 15 percent is the original currency or the local currency, Japan, Mexico, and very good in the United States. Uh, uh, there, there's competition in all these businesses. If we thought we did not buy American Express or Wells Fargo or United Airlines, but Coca-Cola with the idea that they would never have problems or never have competition. What we did buy, why we did buy them is we thought they had very, very strong hands and we liked the financial policies in the case of many of them. We, we, liked, we, we liked their position. We bought a lot of businesses and we, we do look to see where we think they have durable competitive advantage and we recognize that if you've got a very good business you're going to have plenty of competitors who are going to try and take it away from you. And then you make a judgment as to the ability of your particular company and product and management to ward off uh, competitors. They won't go away, but uh, uh, we think, I'm not going to get into the specific names on it, but those companies generally are very well positioned. I, I've likened essentially, if you've got a wonderful business, even if it's a small one like Seize Candy, you basically have an economic castle. And in capitalism, people are going to try and take away that castle from you. So you want to moat around it, protecting it in various ways that can protect it. And then you want a knight in the castle that's pretty darn good at warding off marauders. But they're going to be marauders and they'll never go away. And uh, if you look at, uh, I think Coca-Cola was 1886, American Express was 18, I don't know, 51 or 52, uh, starting out with an express business. Uh, uh, Wells Fargo with, uh, I don't know what year they were started. Incidentally, uh, American Express was started by Wells and Fargo as well. Uh, so uh, these companies had lots of challenges, and they'll have more challenges than the companies we own have had challenges. Uh, our insurance business has had challenges, but, you know, we started with national indemnity as $8 million purchase in 1968. And fortunately, we've had people like Tony Nicely at Geico, and we've had, we've had G. Jane, who's added tens of billions of value. And we've got some smaller companies that you probably don't even know about, but really have done a terrific job for us. So there'll always be competition in insurance, but, but there'll, always be, there'll always be things to do that a really intelligent management with a decent distribution system, various things going for them, can do to, to ward off the marauders. So I, I uh, to the specific question, how much time is spent reviewing the holdings, I would say that I do it every day. I'm sure Charlie does it every day. Charlie? Well, I don't think I got anything to add to that either. Yeah. <laughs> we'll cut his salary if he doesn't participate here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Jay Gelb. 
This question is on Berkshire's retroactive reinsurance deal with AIG, which was the largest ever of its kind. Based on AIG's track record of reserve deficiencies and the opportunity for Berkshire to invest the float, what is your level of confidence that this contract covering up to $20 billion of AIG's reserves in return for $10 billion of premiums will ultimately be profitable for Berkshire? Well, at the time we do every deal, I think it's smart. And then sometimes <laughs> I find out otherwise as we go along. The deal, the Jay knows, but might be unfamiliar to many people, is that AIG uh, transferred to us the liability for uh, 80% of 25 billion, excess of 25 billion. In other words, they had to pay the first 25 billion, and then on the next 25 billion, we had to pay 80% of what they paid up to a limit of 20 billion, 80% of 25. And we got paid $10.2 billion for that. And we had, and this applies to their losses in many classes of business, written or earned before December 31st. 2015. So Ajit Jain, who has made a lot more money for Berkshire than I, uh, for you than I have, but he evaluates that sort of transaction. We talk about it a fair amount ourselves. I just find it interesting. I particularly find the 10.2 billion that they're going to give us interesting. And the uh, we come to the conclusion that. We think we'll do well by getting $10.2 billion today with a maximum payout of $20 billion uh, over some indefinite, I mean, uh, between now and, and, and Judgment Day on this, on this large piece of business. AIG had very good reasons for doing this because their reserves had been under criticism and, and this essentially probably, and should have, I think, put, put to bed the question when the, whether they were under-reserved on that business. And uh, we get the $10.2 billion, and the question is how fast we pay out the money and how much money we pay out. And Najit does 99 percent of the thinking on that, and I do 1 percent, and we, we project out what we think will happen. And we know, whatever our projection is, that it will be wrong, but we try to be conservative. Uh, and we've done a fair amount of these deals. This is the largest. The second largest was a creature that was formed out of Lloyd's of London some years ago. Uh, and we've been wrong uh, on one transaction that involved something over a billion a premium. I mean, clearly wrong. And uh, there are a couple of others that, that may or may not work out, depending on what you assume we have earned on the funds. But they're OK. Uh, they're, 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 you know, but they, they probably didn't come out as well as we thought they would, though. Uh, but overall, uh, we've done OK on this. Uh, it's less OK when we're sitting around with 90 plus billion of cash, so the incremental 10.2 billion we took in in the first quarter uh, is earning us peanuts at the moment. And peanuts is not what fits into the formula for making this an attractive deal. So we have, to, we do have to assume we'll find uses of the money, but the money will be be with us quite a while. And I think our calculations are on the conservative side. They're not the identical calculations that AIG makes. I mean, we, we, we come up with our own estimate of payouts and all of that. And I think it, actually, I think it was quite a good transaction from AIG's uh, standpoint, because uh, they did take $20 billion of potential losses off for $10.2 billion. And I think they, they satisfied the investing community that they were, were quite unlikely to have adverse development in the period prior to 2015 that was not accounted for by this transaction. Charlie? Well, I think it's intrinsically a dangerous kind of activity. And, but that's one of its attractions. Uh, I don't think there are any two people in the world are, that are better at this kind of transaction than Ajit and Warren. 
and nobody else has had the experience we've had. Just get me in a lot more of those businesses, and I'll, let, I'll, I'll accept a little extra worry. There's one thing I should mention, too, that we actually were the only uh, insurance operation in the world that would write that sort of a contract and that where it would be satisfactory to the other party. I mean, when somebody hands you $10.2 billion and says, I'm counting on you to pay $20 billion back, even if it's 50 years from now, on the last dollar, there are very few people that they want to hand $10.2 billion to. Uh, and they're, uh, so it's a, there's limited people on the other side. I mean, there's not that many people remotely that have that kind of size deal. Very but, few is a good expression. He means one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll go to station two. Uh, hello, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger. Uh, my name is Grant Gibson. I'm from Denver, Colorado. And this is my fifth consecutive year here, so thank you for having us. Thanks for coming. Uh, <laughs> appreciate it. Uh, with all due respect, Mr. Buffett, this question is for Mr. Munger. Uh, in your career of thousands of negotiations and business dealings, could you describe for the crowd which one sticks out in your mind as your favorite or as otherwise noteworthy? Well, I don't think I've got a favorite, but the one that probably did us the most good as a learning experience was Seeds Candy. It just, the power of the brand, uh, the unending flow of ever-increasing money with no work. Uh, Sounds nice. It, it, uh, <laughs> it was, and I'm not sure we would have bought the Coca-Cola if we hadn't bought the Seas. I think that a life properly lived is a, it's just learn, learn, learn all the time. And I think Berkshire's gained enormously from these investment decisions by learning through a long, long period. Every time you appoint a new person that's never had big capital allocation experience, it's like rolling the dice. And I think we're, we're way better off having done it so long. And, and, but the decisions blend. And the one feature that comes through is the continuous learning. If we had not kept learning, you wouldn't even be here. You'd be alive, probably, but not here. <laughs> There's nothing like the pain of being in a lousy business to make you appreciate a good one. <laughs> well, there's nothing like getting into a really good one. That's a very pleasant experience, and it's a learning experience. I have a friend who says, the first rule of fishing is to fish where the fish are. And the second rule of fishing is to never forget the first rule. And, and we've gotten good at fishing where the fish are. Yeah, that's only metaphorically. I went, I went to fish with Charlie there, one there time. There are too many other fish. boats in the damn water, but, <laughs> but the fish are still there. Yeah, we, we bought a department store in Baltimore in 1966, and there's really nothing like being in the experience of trying to decide whether you're going to put a, a new store in an area that hasn't really developed yet enough to support it, but your competitor may move there first, and then you have the decision of whether to jump in. And if you jump in, that kind of spoils, and now you've got two stores where even one store isn't quite justified. Uh, how to play those games, those business games, uh, is you, you learn a lot by trying, and, the, and what you really learn is which ones to avoid. I mean, if, if you just stay out of a bunch of terrible businesses, <laughs> you're, you're off to a very great start, as far because we've, we've tried them all. But um, you can really learn because the experience is a lot like eating cockle burgers, and it really gets your attention. <laughs> well, we won't expand on that. Uh, <laughs> Andrew Ross Sorkin. Good morning, Warren. Uh, this question comes from a longtime shareholder who I should tell you accosted me last night in the lobby of the Hilton Hotel with this question. Warren, for years you stayed away from technology companies saying they were too hard to predict and didn't have moats. Then you seemed to change your view about technology when you invested in IBM and again when you recently invested in Apple. But then on Friday you said IBM had not met your expectations and sold a third of our stake. 
Do you view IBM and Apple differently? And what have you learned about investing in technology companies? Well, I do view them very differently, but you know, obviously, when I bought the IBM, started buying it six years ago, I thought it would do better in the six years that have elapsed than uh, it has. And uh, Apple, I, I regard them as being quite different business. I, I think Apple was much more of a consumer products business in terms of the, in, in, in terms of sort of analyzing uh, moats around it and consumer behavior and all that sort of thing. It's obviously a, a, a product with all kinds of tech built into it, but in terms of laying out what their prospective customers will do in the future as opposed to, say, on IBM's customers, it's, it's a different sort of analysis. That doesn't mean it's correct, and we'll find out over time, but th they are two different types of decisions, and, and, and uh, I was wrong on the first one, and we'll find out whether I'm right or wrong on, this, on the second. But I, don't, I do not regard them as uh, apples and apples, and I don't quite regard them as apples and oranges, but it's somewhat in between on that. Charlie? Well, we avoided the tech stocks because we felt we had no advantage there, and other people did. And I think that's a good idea not to play where the other people are better. But you know, if you ask me, in retrospect, what was our worst mistake in the tech field? I think we were smart enough to figure out Google. Those ads worked so much better in the early days than anything else. So I would say that that we failed you there. And we were smart enough to do it and didn't do it. We do that all the time, too. Yeah, We were their customer very early on with, with Geico, for example, and we saw, I, I don't these figures are way out of date, but I, as I remember, you know, we were paying them 10 or 11 dollars a click or something like that. And anytime you're paying somebody 10 or 11 bucks every time somebody just punches a little thing where you've got no cost at all, uh, you know, that, that's a good business unless somebody's going to take it away from you. And uh, so we were close up uh, seeing the impact of that. And incidentally, if any of you don't have anything to do in your hotel rooms tonight, just, just keep punching progressive or something. And you're gonna <laughs> <laughs> don't really do that. <laughs> the thought just happened across my mind. <laughs> but, you know, that is, you know, you've never seen a business, almost never seen a business like it where, and, and I think for LASIK surgery and things like that, I, I think the figures were, you know, 60 or 70 bucks a click with no incremental, no cost. So, and I knew the guys. I mean, they actually designed their prospectus. They came to see me. And they, a little bit after the original one, when they went public, a little bit after Berkshire even. And so I, I had plenty of ways to ask questions or anything of the sort and educate myself, but, but I blew it. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, we blew, we blew Walmart, too. When, yeah. the, when it was a total cinch, we were smart enough to figure that out, and we didn't. Yeah. Yeah, figuring out execution is what counts. So, <laughs> but, uh, anyway, well, and I could be making two mistakes on IBM. I mean, the, 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 the you know, it, the, 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 it's harder to predict, in my view, uh, the winners in various items, or how much price competition will enter in uh, to something like cloud services and all that. It, I, will, I, I made a statement the other day, which it's really remarkable, and I was I asked Charlie whether he could think of a situation like it, where one person has uh, built an extraordinary economic machine in two really pretty different industries, you know, almost simultaneously, as has happened. From a standing start at zero. From a standing start at zero with other, with competitors with lots of capital and everything else. To do it in retailing and to do it with the cloud, like Jeff Bezos has done, I mean, I, 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 I mean, people like the Mellons invested in a lot of different industries and all of that, but he has been in, the, in effect the CEO simultaneously of two businesses starting from scratch uh, that if, you know, Andy Grove used to use, at Intel used to say, you know, think about 
if you had a silver bullet and you could shoot it up and get rid of one of your competitors, who would it be? Well, I think that both in the cloud and in retail, there are a lot of people that would aim that silver bullet at Jeff. And, and he's done a, a, it's a different sort of game. But he's, you know, at the Washington Post, he's played that hand as, as well as anybody, I think, possibly could. So it's, it's a remarkable business achievement where he's been involved actually in the execution, not just bankrolling it, of, of two businesses that, that are, are probably as feared by their competitors almost uh, uh, as any you can find. It's, Charlie, you got further thoughts? Well, we're sort of like the melons, old-fashioned people who've done all right. And Jeff Bezos is a different species. And we missed it entirely, incidentally. We never owned a share of Amazon. <laughs> okay, Greg Warren. Warren, my question relates to some recent stock purchases as well. Unlike the railroads, which benefit from colossal barriers to entry due to their established, practically impossible to replicate networks of rail and rights away, the airline industry seems to have few, if any, advantages. Even with the consolidation we've seen during the past 15 years, the barriers to entry are few and the exit barriers are high. The industry also suffers from low switching costs and intense pricing competition and is heavily exposed to fuel costs, with rising fuel prices being difficult to pass on and declining fuel prices leading to more price competition. Compare this with rail customers who have few choices and thus wield limited buying power and where fuel charges allow the industry to mitigate fuel price fluctuations. While you've noted several times since the airline stock purchases were announced that the two industries are quite different and that comparisons should not be made to Berkshire's move into rail railroads a decade ago, could you walk us through what convinced you that the airlines were different enough this time around for Berkshire to invest close to $10 billion in the four major airlines? Because it would seem to me that UPS, which you have a small stake in, and FedEx, both of which have wider economic moats built on more identifiable and durable competitive advantages, would be a better option for long-term investors. Yeah, the, the decision in respect to airlines that no connection with our being involved in the railroad business. I mean, you can you can classify them and you know maybe in uh, as transportation businesses or something, but it, it had no connection, no more connection than the fact we own Geico or you know or uh, any other business. Uh, you couldn't. You couldn't pick a tougher industry, you know, ever since, since Orville went up and I said, you know, that if anybody had really been thinking about investors, they should have had Wilbur shoot him down and <laughs> saved everybody a lot of money for a hundred years. Uh, you can go to the internet and type in airlines and bankrupt and you'll see that something like a hundred airlines in that general range, you know, gone bankrupt in the last few decades and, and actually, Charlie and I were directors for some time of U.S. Air, and be, be, people write about how we had a terrible experience in U.S. Air. It, it, it was the, one of the dumbest things I've ever done. And, and there's and a lot of made a fair amount of money out of it, too. Yeah, and we made a lot of money out of it. It was undeserved. <laughs> but we made a lot of money out of it because there was one little brief period when people got all enthused about U.S. Air, and after we... Uh, left as directors, and after we sold our position, U.S. Air managed to go bankrupt twice in the subsequent period. I mean, you've named all of the, not all of them, but you've named a number of factors that just make for terrible economics. And I will tell you that if, uh, if capacity, uh, you know, it's a fiercely competitive industry. The question is whether it's a suicidally competitive industry, which it used to be. I mean, when you get virtually every one of the major carriers and dozens and dozens and dozens of minor carriers are going bankrupt. You know, it ought to come upon you finally that maybe you're in the wrong industry. Uh, it has uh, been operating for some time now at 80 percent or better of capacity uh, being available seat miles. And um, you can see what deliveries are going to be and that sort of thing. So if you make the, I think it's fair to say that they will operate at higher degrees of capacity uh, over the next five or 10 years than the historical rates 
which caused all of them to go broke. Now the question is whether, uh, even when they're doing it in the 80s, they will do suicidal things in terms of pricing. Uh, remains to be seen. They actually, at present, are earning uh, at quite quite high returns on invested capital. Uh, I think higher than either FedEx or UPS, if you actually check that out. Uh, but that doesn't mean tomorrow morning, you know, if you're running one of those airlines and the other guy cuts his prices, you cut your prices. And as you say, there's more flexibility when, future, when fuel goes down to bring down prices than there is to raise prices when, when, the, when prices go up. So the, the, the industry, uh, you know, it is no cinch that the industry uh, will uh, have some more pricing sensibility uh, in the next 10 years than they had in the last 100 years. But the conditions have improved for that. They've got more labor stability than they had before because they're basically all going to – they've been through bankruptcy and they're all going to sort of have an industry pattern bargaining, it looks uh, to me like. They're going to have a shortage of pilots to some degree. But it's not – it's not like buying C's candy, Charlie. No, but the investment world has gotten tougher with more competition, more affluence, and more absolute obsession with finance throughout the whole country. And we picked up a lot of low-hanging fruit in the old days where it was very, very easy, and we had huge margins of safety. Now we operate with a less advantageous general climate and maybe we have small statistical advantages where in the old days it was like shooting fish in a barrel. But that's all right. It's okay if it gets a little harder after you get filthy rich. Yeah. Charlie's more philosophical than I am on that point. <laughs> so, well, I can't I, bring back the low-hanging fruit, Warren. Yeah, You're just going to have to keep reaching for the higher branches. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, the... Uh, I don't. I think the odds are very high that there are more revenue passenger miles uh, five years from now or ten years from now. Uh, if the airlines, uh, if, the, if the airline companies are only worth five or ten years from now what they're worth now in terms of equity, we'll get a pretty reasonable rate of return because they're going to buy in a lot of stock at fairly low multiples. So. So if, if the company's worth the same amount at the end of the year and there's fewer shares of stock outstanding, over time we make decent money and all four of the major airlines are buying in stock at a... you got to remember that the railroads were a terrible business for decades and decades and decades, and then they got good. Yeah. It, I, we like, I like the position. Obviously, by buying all four, it means that it's very hard to distinguish uh, who will do the, at least in my mind, it's hard to distinguish who will do the best. I, I do think, I think the odds are quite high that if you take revenue passenger miles flowing five or ten years from now, it will be a higher number and that will be, there'll be low cost people to come in and, you know, the s spirits of the world and jet blues, whatever it may be. But the, my guess is that all four of the companies we have will have higher revenues the question is what their operating ratio is. They will have fewer shares outstanding by a significant margin. So even if they're worth just what they're worth today, uh, we could make a fair amount of money, but, but it is no cinch by a long shot. Okay, station three. Good morning, everybody. My name is Sibylla Arians. I'm from Germany, and I'm member of board of Ethican Foundation Ethics and Economy. I'm very happy that I could put my question here, and um, maybe you are not as happy as I am to listen to it. Oh. <laughs> well, we'll try to stay happy. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Buffett, a few years ago, I saw a movie in which you proclaimed that the print of the dollar bill in God We Trust does not really oppress your philosophy. In your opinion, only cash counts and your credo is in the dollar I trust. 
I don't think I don't think I don't think I've ever said that actually. But uh, well, I, I can show you the movie. <laughs> that will prove. Oh well, I, I, well send you, me a clip. Maybe I, it was I, just joking, <laughs> but always behind a joke there is also a truth. So um, well, you laughed heartily at that moment. Um, you, as one of the most richest men in, uh, of all times on this earth, a, humored, a good humored, friendly, elderly gentleman. Whatever motivated those who designed the dollar notes, they certainly wanted to say that there is something higher than the value of this printed paper. Regrettably, you have shown many times in your life that you see this differently. You have accumulated billions of dollars, showed extraordinary cleverness and skill, and you know, you know better to pick up than many others who, like you, use the rules which are inherent to capitalism for their own intentions. But have you ever given a thought to what troubles and sacrifices, slavery and destruction of Mother Earth and even diseases and deaths stick to the dollar bills, which you gather so eagerly. Let's take Coca-Cola. Ethican Foundation Ethics and Economy from Germany has awarded the Black Planet Award to the members of the board of directors, as well as to the large shareholders, Warren Buffett and, Alan, uh, and Herbert Allen, because you are co-responsible for all of what makes this group make so much money, isn't it? Among other things, Coca-Cola deprives people well, of I, their drinking at some water point, uh, yeah, in drought-prone areas well, of the I, world. Are you asking a question? I, I, contaminate I, the groundwater in I, these areas. I don't want to interrupt um, you, but are you, are you making a speech or asking a question? Well, I put my question right now. OK, good. your Coca-Cola shares if the destruction of the environment, the monopol monopolization of the right to healthy drinking water, and the shameless exploitation of the workers continue? Huh. Well, that's more this of a speech than a question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. yeah. I, I don't think that quote you had earlier. I, I have, I've said, I've said once or twice that it should say in the Federal Reserve we trust because they print the money and uh, uh, if they print too much of it, it could decline in value. But uh, uh, I have, I, I have never, uh, to my knowledge, I, I've never said anything like you originally said. I, and I would say this: I, I think, I think, I've been eating things I like to eat all my life and. Uh, uh, Coca-Cola, this Coca-Cola is uh, 12 ounces. I drink about five a day. Uh, it has, it has about 1.2, it has about 1.2 ounces uh, of sugar in it. And uh, if you look at what people, different people get their sugar and calories from, they get them from all kinds of things. I, I happen to believe that, uh, that I like to, get 1.2 ounces of, with this, and, and it's enjoyable. Since 1886, people have found it pleasant. And uh, uh, I would say that uh, if you uh, pick every meal in terms of uh, what somebody in some recent uh, publication has told you is the very best for you, I, I uh, offer you that. <laughs> I say, go to it. But if you told me that I would live one year longer, and I don't even think of that. I would live one year longer if I'd eat nothing but broccoli and asparagus and everything my Aunt Alice wanted me to eat all my life, or I would eat everything I enjoyed eating, including chocolate sundaes and Coca-Cola and steak and hash browns. You know, I would rather eat what, in a way I enjoy for my whole life than, and, uh, than you know, eat some other way and live another year. <laughs> And I do think that choice should be mine. You know, if, if somebody if somebody decides sugar is harmful, you know, maybe you'd encourage the government to ban sugar. But 
but sugar and Coca-Cola is not, <laughs> is not different than eating sugar, you know, put on my grape nuts in the morning or whatever else I'm having. Uh, so I, uh, I think Coca-Cola has been a very, very positive uh, factor in America for, and the world for a long, long time. And you can look at a list of achievements of the company. Uh, and I really don't want anybody telling me I can't drink it. <laughs> Charlie? Well, I've solved my Coca-Cola problem by drinking Diet Coke, and I swill the stuff like other people swill. I don't know what. And I've been doing it for just as long as you've been taking all those Coca-Colas that are... I've had breakfast with Warren when he has Coca-Colas and nuts. And Pretty damn good, too. Yeah. <laughs> if you keep doing that, Warren, you may not make a hundred. Well... I think there's something in longevity to be feeling happy about your life, too. So I, Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Carol. Um, this question is from Franz Tromberger of Austria, and it concerns intrinsic value, which is neither, uh, Warren may rather, he may amend this, my definition here, but which is neither a company's accounting value nor its stock market value, but is rather its estimated real value. So the question is, at what rate has Berkshire compo compounded intrinsic value over the last 10 years? And at what rate, including your explanation for it, please, do you think intrinsic value can be com compounded over the next 10 years? Intrinsic value, you know, can only be calculated or gains, you know, in retrospect. But, but the intrinsic value, pure definition, would be the, the cash to be generated between now and Judgment Day uh, discounted at a, an interest rate that seems appropriate uh, at the time, and that's that's varied enormously over a 30 or 40 year period. If you pick out 10 years uh, and you're back to uh, May of 2007, you know, we had some unpleasant things coming up, but we, I would say that we've probably compounded at about 10%, and I think that's going to be tough to achieve in fact, almost impossible to achieve if we continued in this interest rate environment. That's the number one question. If, if you ask me to give the answer to the question, if, if I could only pick one statistic to ask you about the future uh, before I gave the answer, uh, I, would not I would not ask you about GDP growth. I would not ask you about who was going to be president. I would, a million things I would. I would ask you what the interest rate is going to be over the next 20 years on average the 10 year or whatever you wanted to do. And if, if you assume our present interest rate structure is likely to be the average over 10 or 20 years, then I would say it'd be very difficult to get to 10%. On the other hand, if I were to pick with a whole range of probabilities on interest rates, I would say that that rate might be, it, it might be somewhat aspirational and it might, well, it might be doable. Uh, and it, you would say, well, we can't continue these interest rates for a long time. I would ask you to look at Japan, you know, where 25 years ago we couldn't see how their interest rates could be sustained, and we're still looking at the same thing. So I do not think it's easy to predict the course of interest rates at all, and unfortunately, predicting that is embedded in giving a good answer to you. I would say the chances of getting a terrible result in Berkshire are probably as low as about anything you can find. Chances of getting a sensational result are also about as low as anything you can find. Uh, so if I, I would, I, my best guess would be uh, in the 10% range, but that, that assumes some what higher interest rates, not dramatically higher, but somewhat higher interest rates in the in the next 10 or 20 years than we've experienced in the last seven years. Charlie? Well, there's no question about the fact that the future with our present size is, in terms of percentage rates of return, is, is going to be 
less glorious than our past. And we keep saying that, and now we're proving it. Do you want to end on that note, Charlie, or would you care to? <laughs> well, I do think Warren's is right about one thing. I think we have a collection of businesses that, on average, has better investment values than, say, the S&P average. So I don't think you shareholders have a terrible, terrible problem. And I would, I would say we probably, well, I'm certain on my way. We have a, we, we do have more of a shareholder orientation than the S and P 500 as as a whole. I mean, for, uh, you know, the uh, this company has a culture where decisions are made uh, for uh, as as an owner, as a private owner, would make them. And, and frankly, that's a luxury we have that many companies don't have. I mean, they are under pressures today sometimes to do things. One of the, one of the questions I ask the CEO of every public company that I meet is, what would you be doing differently if you owned it all yourself? And the answer, you know, is usually this, that, and a couple of other things. If you would ask us, the answer is, is you know, we're doing exactly what we would do if we owned them all, all the stock ourselves. Uh, and I think that's a, a small plus over time. Anything further, Charlie? I think we have one other advantage. A lot of other people are trying to be brilliant, and we're just trying to stay rational. And, and it's, an, it's a big advantage. Trying to be brilliant is dangerous, particularly yeah. when you're gambling. Okay, Jonathan. If corporate tax rates are reduced meaningfully, Berkshire will enjoy a one-time boost to book value because of its sizable deferred tax liability, and its go-forward earnings should be higher too, at least in theory. How much of the reduced tax rate will be passed along to Berkshire's customers through, for instance, lower electricity rates or lower railroad shipping rates, and how much will go to Berkshire shareholders? Yeah, the question is, uh, in the case of our utility businesses, uh, all benefit of lower tax rates uh, goes to customers, and it should be, because we are allowed a return on equity uh, in general. I mean, I'm simplifying a little bit, but the, we're allowed a return on equity that's computed on an after-tax basis, and the utility commissions uh, would, if taxes were raised, would presumably give us higher rates to compensate for that, and if taxes are lowered, they, they would say you're not entitled to make more money just because tax rates on equity because tax rates have been lowered. So forget about the utility portion of the deferred taxes. Uh, the deferred taxes that are applicable to our unrealized gains in securities, we would get all the benefit of because I mentioned we had 90 billion plus of unrealized gains, and if the rates were changed on those uh, in either direction, our owners, dollar for dollar, will participate in that, in that. And then you get into the other businesses. You mentioned the railroad, but it can be all of our other businesses. To some extent, if tax rates are lowered, uh, do different degrees in different industries, depending on the number of players, the, the competitive conditions, some of, it may, some of it almost certainly gets competed away and some of it would likely not be competed away. And that's, that, you know, economists can argue about that a lot, but I've, I've seen it in action in a lot of cases. You've had a big decline in, in rates, for example, in the UK, and, and, and we've had them over my lifetime. We had 52% corporate rates, you know, we've, we've had a, a lot of different numbers. So I've, I have seen how behavior, economic behavior works. And I would say that it's certain that some of any lower rate would be competed away, and it's, 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 it's virtually certain that some would, uh, would inure to the benefit of the uh, shareholders. And it, it's very industry and company specific in how that plays out. Charlie? 
But with dollar for dollar, I mean, there's 90, 90 or 95 billion at the rate were to drop 10 percent, that that nine and a half billion is, is, is by 10 percentage points, that that nine and a half billion is real. On the other hand, if it goes up as it did, went up from 28 to 35 percent, they can take it away from us too. Well, I, I think it's true that we're peculiar in one way. If things go to hell in a handbasket and then get better later, we're likely to do better than most others. And we don't wish for that, and we don't want our country to have to suffer through it. And we fear what might happen if the country went through the ringer like that. But if that real adversity comes, we're likely to do better in the end. We're good at navigating through that kind of stuff. Yeah, and occasionally there will be a lot. In fact, we're quite good at it. There will be there will be occasional hiccups in the American economy. It doesn't have much to do with who's president or anything like that. They, they, those people may get blamed or given credit for different things, but it's just a, it is the nature of market systems uh, to uh, occasionally go haywire in one direction or other. And, it's been ever thus, you know, it'll be ever thus. Uh, it's not, it does not have a, there's not a, it's not a, on a regular sine wave type uh, uh, picture or anything of the sort, but it, it's certain to happen from time to time. And we will probably have a fair amount of money and credit at that time. And we certainly, we're not affected when the rest of the world is fearful we know America is going to come out fine, and we, we will not have a trouble, any trouble psychologically acting at all. And then the question is, how much do we have in the way of resources? We'll also never put the company in any kind of risk, just because we, we see a lot of opportunities. We'll grab all the ones we can that we can handle and not lose a day of sleep. <laughs> I didn't quite get that. But, uh, uh, in any event, we will now go to uh, Station four, and if the person yelling out. Dr. Are we up Bru there in station four? Are you in yes, station sir. four? Dr. Bruce Hertz from Glenview, Illinois. I wanted to thank you for allowing me to attend. I feel both honored and blessed. My question for Mr. Buffett is, you've always advised us to purchase equities that appreciate in value. Yet, a few years ago, you sold your used Cadillac at a tremendous profit. How can you justify selling a depreciating asset for its significant profit? Thank you. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually, I gave it to Girls, Inc., and they sold it, and, and uh, that was kind of an interesting <laughs> A very nice guy bought it for a hundred and some thousand dollars, and uh, uh, I did not. Uh, and Girls Inc. got the money, and he got in the. He came later, actually, with his family, and he drove it away without any place. He was driving back to New York, and he got picked up by the police uh, in Illinois, and he said, "Well, he started giving this explanation about how he." given this money to Girls, Inc., and was driving the car back, and had this nice-looking family with him. And the cops were quite, quite uh, skeptical. But fortunately, I had signed the dashboard for him as part of the deal. When he gave, and so they looked at that, and then they just said, well, did he give you any stock tips? And they let him go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 I can't recall ever selling a used car at a profit, but, but uh, uh, um, we, uh, I don't, I don't think I've ever sold any personal possession. Well, I've got a house for sale. You don't say. have any personal possession. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, uh, any, anything you see with a figure attached like that. You're a I've, fatter <laughs> version of Mohammed Gandhi. Mahatma <laughs> <laughs> Gandhi. The guy was a very nice guy that bought it, and his check cleared, so we're fine. <laughs> Becky? 
Um, I'd like to qu ask a question that can serve as a follow-up to the question that Carol had asked. And, and Charlie, in that response, said that he thinks the Berkshires businesses on the whole will do better than the S&P 500. Clark Cameron from Birmingham, Alabama, who owns 281 shares of Berkshire B, writes in and asks, why have you advised your wife to invest in index funds after your death rather than Berkshire Hathaway? I believe Munger has counseled his offspring to, quote, not be so dumb as to sell. She, she, won't be, she won't be selling any Berkshire <laughs> to buy the index funds. All, all of my Berkshire, every single share, will go to philanthropy. So the, I don't even regard myself as owning Berkshire, you know, basically. It, it's, it, it's committed. And I've, I, so far, about 40 percent has already been distributed. So the question is, somebody who is not an investment professional, will be, I hope, reasonably elderly by the time <laughs> that the uh, uh, estate gets settled. And what is the best investment, meaning one that there would be less worry of any kind connected with and less people coming around and saying, why don't you sell this and do something else and all those things? She's going to have more money than she needs. And the big thing then you want is money not to be a problem. And there will be no way that if she holds the S&P, or virtually no way, absent something happened with weapons of mass destruction, but virtually no way that she won't have, she'll have all the money that she possibly can use. She'll have a little liquid money so that if stocks are down tremendously at some point, they close the stock exchange for a while, anything like that, she'll still feel that she's got plenty of money. And the object is not to maximize. It doesn't make any difference whether the amount she gets doubles or triples or anything of the sort. The, the important thing is that she never worries about money the rest of her life. And I had an Aunt Katie here in Omaha, who Charlie knew well, and worked for her husband, as did I. And she worked very hard all her life and had lived in a house she paid, I think, I don't know, $8,000 for 45th and Hickory all her life. and. Uh, because she was in Berkshire, uh, she ended up, she lived in 97, she ended up with you know, a few hundred million. And she would write me a letter every four or five months, and she'd said, you're warned, you know, uh, I hate to bother you, but am I going to run out of money? And, <laughs> and I, would, I would write her back, and I'd say, dear Katie, it's a good question, because if you live 986 years, you're going to run out of money. And, <laughs> and then about four or five months later, she'd write me the same letter again. And I, I have seen there's no way in the world, if you've got plenty of money, that it should become a, a minus in your life. And there will be people, if you've got a lot of money, that come around with various suggestions for you, sometimes well-meaning, sometimes not so well-meaning. So if you've got something that's certain to deliver, you know, it was all in Berkshire. They'd say, well, if Warren was alive today, you know, he would be telling you to do this. I, I just don't want anybody to go through that. And, and the S&P will be a, f I think actually what I'm suggesting is what, what a very high percentage of people should do something like that. And I don't think they will have as, I think there's a chance they won't have as much peace of mind if they own one stock and they've got neighbors and friends and relatives that are trying to do some, like I say, sometimes well-intentioned, sometimes otherwise, to do something else. And so I think it's a policy that will get a good result and is likely to stick. Charlie? Well, as Becky said, the Mongers are different. I, I want them to hold the Berkshire. Well, I want to hold the Berkshire, too. <laughs> no, I bet. I mean, I, I, I don't like the Berkshire. I recognize the logic of the fact that that S&P algorithm is very hard to beat. You know, diversified portfolio of big companies, it's all but impossible for most people. But, you know, it's, I'm just more comfortable with the Berkshire. Well, it's the family business. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, but it, it uh, I've just, I've seen too many people as they get older, particularly being 
susceptible. And just having to listen to the arguments of people coming Well, along. if you're going to protect your heirs from the stupidity of others, you may have some good system, but I'm not much interested in that subject. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Jay. Berkshire reportedly partnered with 3G in Kraft Heinz's attempt to acquire Unilever for $143 billion. How much was Berkshire willing to invest in this deal? And does this mean Berkshire's next large acquisition is likely to be in partnership with 3G? Yeah, well, Kraft Heinz, uh, you have to distinguish between two situations. Kraft Heinz was a widely owned company in which uh, we and 3G uh, act as a control group and have a little over 50 percent of the stock. But as originally contemplated, no certainty that this is exactly what would have happened, uh, we would have invested an additional $15 billion and 3G would have invested an additional $15 billion if a friendly uh, uh, agreement uh, could have been reached. Uh, so uh, if the deal had been made, if the independent directors of Christ, Kraft Heinz had approved uh, the transaction, uh, the likely — well, then the likelihood is that uh, we would have invested $15 billion. But it would, have, it would have required the approval of the independent directors as well. Now, Kraft Heinz in going forward with making that offer, wanted to be sure that there would be enough equity capital uh, in addition to the debt that would be incurred uh, to make the deal. And, and so informally, we, we had basically committed the, the $15 billion. It, it only was approved on the basis that it would be a friendly deal with Unilever and, and uh, uh, initially uh, we thought they uh, would, would be at least possibly interested in such a deal, and when we found out otherwise, uh, we withdrew the offer. So it would have been $15 billion of additional money in all probability. Okay, Station 5. Dear Honorable Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, I'm Tian Dehua from China. My company, AI Holdings, is spreading value investing philosophy in Asia. My biggest partner, Ken Chi, Zhou Guiying, and I are committed to awake 100 million Chinese people to return to the rational way of investing. The hardest thing in this world is to change people's values or belief system. And we should like to awake investors to change from speculate in the market to investing in the market. It's like changing the speculator's values or belief system. May I ask you, Mr. Buffy, can you kindly advise us what we should do to spread, to spread your value investing philosophy, or is there any word of encouragement? Thank you. Yeah, the um, when in any system, uh, Keynes wrote about this in 1936, I think it was in the General Theory or 35, I think it's Chapter 12. It's, well, it's best, it's a great chapter on investing, and he talked about investment and speculation and the propensity of people to speculate and the dangers of it, and worded eloquently, there's always the possibility of, I mean, there's always some speculation, obviously, and there's always some value investors and all of that sort of thing in the market, but there's, when speculation gets rampant and when you're getting what I guess Charlie would call social proof, uh, that it's worked recently, People can get very excited about speculating in markets, and we will have it from time to time in this market. There's nothing more agonizing 
than to see your neighbor who you think has an IQ about 30 points below you getting richer than you are by buying stocks, and, and whether it's internet stocks or whatever. And, it, and people succumb to it, and they'll succumb in this economy just as elsewhere. There's also a point which gets to your question. I would say that early on in the development of markets, uh, there's probably a, a — there's some tendency for them, I think, to be more speculative than markets that have been around for a couple of hundred years. Uh, the, it, it, it has a — invest — markets have a casino characteristic that has a lot of appeal to uh, people, particularly when they see, like I say, people getting rich around them. And those who haven't been through cycles before are probably a little more prone to uh, speculate than people who have have experienced the the outcome of wild speculation. So I, you know, basically in this country, uh, Van Graham was in the book I read in 1949 was preaching investment, and and that book continues to sell very well. But if the market gets hot, uh, new issues are doing well, and and people on leverage are doing well, uh, a lot of people will be attracted. To, not only speculation, but what I would call gambling. And I'm afraid that that will, that will be true in the United States. And I, I think that, that China being a newer uh, market, essentially, in which there's widespread participation, is likely to have some pretty extreme experiences in that respect. We will have some in this country, too. Charlie? Well, I certainly agree with that. The, the, the Chinese will have more trouble. Uh, they're very bright people. They have a lot of action. And, and uh, sure, they're going to be more speculative. And it's a dumb idea. And to the extent you're working on it, why, well, you're on the side of the angels. But lots of luck. Well, it will, it will, <laughs> it will offer the investor more opportunities, actually, uh, it, if, if they can keep their wits about them. If you have wild speculation, I mean, we, Charlie just mentioned earlier, you know, if, if, if we get into periods that are very tough, Berkshire, Berkshire certainly will do reasonably well because it, 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 it won't, and we won't be, we won't get fearful, and fear spreads like you cannot believe until you've seen a few examples of it. At the start of September, 2008, you had 35 million people with their money in money market funds with three and a half trillion dollars in them. And not, none of them were afraid that that dollar wasn't going to be a dollar when they went to cash in their money market fund. And three weeks later, they were all terrified, and the 175 billion flowed out in three days. And so the way the public can react is really extreme in markets. Uh, and that actually offers opportunities for investors. Uh, you'll never People like action and they like to gamble. And if they think there's easy money to be made, a lot of them, you'll get a rush to it. And for a while, it will be self-fulfilling and create new comfort, converts until the day of reckoning comes. So uh, just keep preaching, investing, and, and if the market swings around a lot, you'll, you'll keep adding a few people here and there to, the, to a group that recognizes that markets are are there to be taken advantage of rather than to instruct you as to what is going on. Okay, Andrew, gambling more on that train? We've done a lot of preaching, Warren, without much effect. Right. And that's probably good from our standpoint. <laughs> okay, Andrew? Thank you, Warren. This question comes from Ryan Prince. President Donald Trump and his advisors have talked about proposing a substantial investment tax credit to provide incentives for long-term corporate fixed capital investment. In BNSF, Berkshire owns a sprawling infrastructure portfolio requiring regular routine maintenance investment of substantial scale. What impact would an investment tax credit have on BNSF's capital investment decision-making from a return on investment uh, uh, a capital perspective, as well as in terms of timing? 
And just as importantly, given the current economy and employment picture, would such a tax credit amount to a subsidization of otherwise mandatory maintenance capital investment or a proper incentive to stimulate investment? Yeah, well, it would all depend on how it was worded, um, you know, because uh, we've had investment tax credits in this country, and we've had, we've had bonus depreciation, it's another form of it, we, and, and we do get extra first-year depreciation. Uh, that does not enter into our calculation very much. You know, in fact, uh, certainly at the Berkshire level, I've never instructed anybody to do anything different uh, because of index investment tax credits or, or accelerated depreciation. Uh, the, there may be some calculations done down at the operating co company level. Uh, it's certainly true in something like uh, uh, wind projects and solar projects. They are dependent on, on, on uh, the tax law currently. There may come a time when they aren't, but they wouldn't have been done without some subsidization through through the uh, through the tax law, but I would I, I, I would say if you change the depreciation schedules and you know double depreciation, triple depreciation, for that we're going to do what we need to do at the railroad uh, to make it safer and more efficient. Uh, if we just had ordinary depreciation, and I doubt if there'd be any. Dramatic differences. Obviously, if you were going to say buy a bunch of planes and the law was going to change on December 31st and the map made it better to wait till January 1st or do it this December 31st, you didn't make that kind of calculation. But I can't recall in all the years that I've ever sent out anything to our managers saying, let's do this because the tax law is changed is being changed or might be changed or something of the sort. As I mentioned earlier, it changes just a little bit if you think there's going to be a change in capital gains rates. At a given time, obviously, if it's going to, the rate's going to be lowered, you would take losses ahead of time and, 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 and defer gains maybe a little. And that's why it's useful. Actually, if the, if the tax committees, the Senate and the House, are working on something, uh, it might be useful if the chairmans would say that if we do make any changes, we're likely to use this effective date or something of the sort. And I think they've done that a few times in the past. We are not the, — the big tax-driven item uh, is uh, in wind and solar, and that is a specific policy because the government has decided they want to move people — or society has decided they want to move people toward those forms of, of uh, electric generation, and uh, the market system wouldn't do it. And uh, there may come a time when the market system will do it all by itself. We won't make big changes. And, and it, it's so speculative anyway in terms of even what the law would be. But, but uh, beyond that, if it becomes less speculative as the law, I mean, it really looks like something is going through, it doesn't change us big time at all. It, Charlie? Nothing to add. We're not right. going to change anything at the Berkshire, at the railroad for some little tax jiggle. If we, if we need a bridge repaired. We're going to repair the bridge, and, you know. And if we need, we need a lot of track maintenance all the time and that sort of thing. And it, it, it just, uh, I don't think Matt and I have ever had a talk about it since we've owned the railroad. But Greg, Warren, my question also relates to Burlington Northern. Despite the current administration's belief that they can bring the coal industry back, market forces continue to lead to the industry's demise. While 90 percent of U.S. coal consumption is driven by electricity generation, natural gas has been both cheaper and cleaner burning, and renewable electricity generation has remade parts of the market as wind and solar have gained scale and become cheaper alternatives. This has created problems for Burlington Northern, with coal shipments accounting for just 18 percent of volume and revenue for the railroad last year down from an average of 24 percent for both measures the previous 10 years. While some of this was due to a large buildup of coal supplies the past couple of winters, which finally seem to be working their way out, what are your expectations for the contribution coal can make to BNSF longer term? And I know that the rail will currently handle some export shipments going through Canada's Pacific Coast ports, but will there be enough growth there to offset domestic demand, 
or will BNSF need to rely more heavily on segments like intermodal to offset lost coal volumes? Yeah, the answer is coal, coal is going to go down over time. I don't think there's much question about that. Uh, the specifics of any given year relate very importantly to the price of natural gas. I mean, right now there are there the demand is uh, somewhat up, fair amount up from last year because natural gas is at 315 or 320, and the utilities uh, can produce electricity in many cases quite a bit cheaper with coal than with natural gas. Whereas with the two dollars, it would all be it would it would be natural gas. But over time. Uh, coal is, virt in my mind, is essentially certain to decline uh, as a percentage of the revenue of the railroad. The speed at which it does, you know, it, you don't build, create generation uh, plants overnight, and so it, uh, you can't predict the rate. And if natural gas is cheap enough, it's going to be a, you'll see a big conversion back to uh, natural gas. So coal is a coal is going to go down as a percentage of revenues significantly. Uh, you know, certainly a, over 10 years it'll be it'll be quite significant. And who knows exactly year by year? We are we are looking for other sources of growth than 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 coal. If you're tied to coal, uh, you've got problems, Charlie. Well, the, you go out. Over the extremely long term, I think that all the hydrocarbons will be used, including all the coal. So I think that in the end, these hydrocarbons are a huge resource for humanity, and I don't think we've got any good substitute. And uh, I've never minded saving them for the next generation. I don't like using them up very fast. So I, I'm a I'm off on a little road on my own on this one. And uh, people think that all this hydrocarbons are going to be stranded and the whole world's going to change. I think we're going to use every drop of the hydrocarbons sooner or later. We'll use them as chemical feedstocks. We'll, it, it's, I regard all these things as very hard to predict. And I'm not at all sure that. I would eventually expect natural gas to be pretty short in supply. A change in storage would make a big difference. We will produce, within a few years, as much electricity in Iowa, or virtually as much electricity in Iowa from wind as our customers use, but the wind only blows about 35 percent of the time or something like that, and sometimes it blows too hard. But the storage you know, having it 24 hours a day, seven days a week is a real problem, even if we've got the capability uh, of producing, like I say, a self-sufficient amount, essentially, in Iowa before very long. Uh, coal, uh, our shipments of coal are up fairly substantially this year on the BNSF. But they were very low last year, and as you said, stockpiles grew and have come down somewhat. They're still on the high side. Uh, but in my mind, Charlie's got a longer-term outlook on this. I'm, uh, in my mind, we're going to be shipping a whole lot less coal 10 or 20 years from now than we are now. On the other hand, I think there's some decent prospects in, in other long hauls. I mean, it's, it's a pretty cheap way to move bulk commodities long distance uh, rail is, and uh, I think it's a good business, but the coal aspect of it is going to diminish. Okay. Station 6. Hi, good morning. Good morning. It's Marcus Burns from Sydney, Australia. My question, Mr. Buffett, is you used to buy capital light cash generative businesses, but now buy lower growth capital consumptive businesses. I realize Berkshire generates a lot of cash flow. But would shareholders have been better off if you had continued to invest in capital light companies? Well, we'd love to find them. I mean, there's no question that buying a, a high return on assets 
uh, very light, capital intensive. Uh, business that's going to grow uh, beats the hell out of buying something that, that requires a lot of capital to grow. And this varies from day to day, but I believe, and, and I don't think it's sufficiently appreciated, I believe that the probably the five largest American companies by market cap, uh, and some days we're in that group and some days we aren't. Let's assume we're not in that group uh, on a given day. They, they have a market value of over two and a half trillion dollars. And that two and a half trillion is a big number. I don't know whether the aggregate market cap of the U.S. market is, but that's probably getting up close to 10 percent of the whole market cap of the United States. And if you take those five companies, essentially you could run them with no equity capital at all, none. That is a very different world than when Andrew Carnegie was building a steel mill and then using the earnings to build another steel mill and getting very rich in the process, or Rockefeller was building refineries and buying tank cars. And Generally speaking, over, for a very long time in our capitalism, growing and earning large amounts of money required considerable reinvestment of capital and large amounts of equity capital, the railroads being a good example. Uh, that world has really changed, and I don't think people quite appreciate the difference. You literally don't need any money uh, to run the five companies that are worth collectively more than two and a half trillion dollars, and who have outpaced any number of those names that were familiar if you looked at the Fortune 500 list 30 or 40 years ago, you know, whether it was Exxon or General Motors or you name it. So uh, we would love, I mean, there's no question that a business that doesn't take any capital and grows and has, you know, almost infinite returns on required equity capital is the ideal business. And we own a couple of businesses, a few businesses that earn extraordinary returns on capital, but they don't grow. Uh, we still love them, but if they had, if they were in fields that would grow, believe me, we would, uh, you know, they would be number one on our list. Uh, we aren't seeing those that we can buy and that we understand well. But you are absolutely right that, that that's a far, far, far better way of laying out money than what we're able to do uh, when buying capital-intensive businesses. Charlie? Yeah, the chemical companies of America at one time were wonderful investments. Dow and DuPont sold at 20 sometimes earnings, and they kept building more and more complicated plants and hiring more PhD chemists, and it looked like they owned the world. Now most chemical products are sort of commoditized, and it's a tough business being a big chemical producer. And in comes all these other people like Apple and Google, and they're just on top of the world. Uh, I think the questioner is basically right that the world has changed a lot and that, and that the people who have made the right decisions in getting into these new businesses that are so different from the old ones have done very well. Yeah, Andrew Mellon would be uh, uh, absolutely baffled by looking at the the high cap companies now. I mean, the idea that you could create hundreds of billions of value essentially without assets, without fast. tangible assets. Fast. Yeah. Fast, yeah. yeah. But that is the world. I mean, there is, when, when Google can sell you something that, where Geico was paying 11 bucks or something every time somebody clicks something, that is a lot different than spending years finding the right site and developing, you know, iron mines to supply the, supply the steel plants and, you know, railroads to haul the iron to where the steel is produced and distribution points and all that sort of thing. The, our world was built, uh, and when we first looked at it, our, our U.S., our capitalist system basically was built on tangible assets and, and reinvestment and all that sort of thing, and a lot of innovation and invention to go with it. But this is so much better uh, if you happen to be good at it. Uh, 
to essentially be able to build hundreds of billions of market value without really needing any, any, any capital. Uh, that's, that, is, that is a different world than exists in the past. And I think, isn't I think it's a world that's likely to continue. I mean, I, uh, the trend is, I don't think the trend in that direction is over by a long shot. A lot of the people who are chasing that sort of thing very hard now in the venture capital field are losing a lot of money. It, it's, it's a wonderful field, but not everybody's going to win big in it. A few are going to win big in it. Okay, Carol. Um, the, this question is from a shareholder in uh, California in the Silicon Valley uh, area who didn't want his name mentioned because he said he wasn't looking for publicity, uh, but whose picture makes him appear to be a millennial. Um, every Berkshire shareholder knows about the stock market value of Berkshire. But my question is about the value of Berkshire to the world. For instance, the value of Apple to the world has been iPhones. The value of GEICO is cost-effective auto insurance. The value of, of 3G, and I will tell you that there aren't all some shareholders who would be arguing about here, but the value of 3G is improved operations. But about Berkshire, I just don't know. In managing Berkshire's subsidiaries, as Mr. Munger once famously said, you practice delegation just short of abdication. So hands-on management can't be the answer. That means the majority of Berkshire's subsidiaries would do just as well if they were to stay independent companies. So that's my question. What is the value of Berkshire to the world? Yeah, well, the, I would say the question about, uh, I'm, I'm with him to the point where he says that, which he, uh, accurately describes as, as delegation to the point of abdication, but I would argue that that abdication actually, uh, in many cases, will enable those businesses to be run better than they would if they were uh, part of the S&P 500 and the target, perhaps, of, of activists or somebody that wants to uh, get some kind of a jiggle in the short term. So I, I think that our abdication actually has some very positive value on the companies, but that, you know, you'd have to look at it uh, company by company. That We've got probably 50 managers in attendance here, and, and uh, naturally they're not going to say anything probably on, on television or anything where they, they knock us or anything, but get them off in a private corner and just uh, ask them whether they think their business uh, can be run better uh, with a management by abdication from Berkshire, but with also the, all the capital strengths of Berkshire, that when any project that makes sense can be funded in a moment without worrying whether the banks are still lending, like in 2008, you know, or whether, whether Wall Street will applaud it or something of that sort. So I, I think our very, our hands-off style actually, I think, can add significant value in, in, in many companies. But we do have managers here. You can you could ask about that. We certainly don't add the value by calling them up and saying that we've developed a better system, uh, you know, for turning out additives at Lubrizol or, <laughs> or, or running Geico better than Tony nicely can run it or anything of the sort. Uh, but we do take a we have a very objective uh, uh, view about capital allocation. Uh, we can free manage them. I, I would say that we might very well free up at least 20 percent of the time of a CEO in the normal public, uh, who would have, otherwise have a public company, just in terms of meeting with analysts and and the calls and dealing with banks and all kinds of things that that essentially we relieve them of. So that they can spend all of their time figuring out the best way to run their business. So I, I think we bring something to the party, even if it, even if we're just sitting there with our feet up on the desk. Charlie? Yeah, we're trying to be a good example for the world. I don't think we'd be having these big shareholder meetings if there weren't a little bit of teaching ethos in Berkshire. And, and uh, I, I, I've watched it closely for a long time. 
I'd argue that that's what we're trying to do, is set a proper example. Stay sane, be honest. Yeah. So, I, so I'm proud of Berkshire, and I, I don't worry too much if we sell Coca-Cola. <laughs> we, uh, I would say, Geico is an extraordinarily well-run company, and it would be extraordinarily well-run if it were public. But it has gone from two and a fraction percent of, of the auto insurance market to 12 percent. And part of the reason, the small part, the real key is Geico and Tony nicely, but the, part of the reason is that when other, at least two of our competitors, big competitors, said that they would not meet their profit objectives if they didn't lighten up their interest in new business eight or ten months ago, uh, I think our business decision to step on the gas is a better business decision, but I think that GEICO as a public company would have more trouble making that decision than they do when they're part of GEICO, because it, we, we are thinking about nothing but where GEICO is going to be in five or ten years, and if that requires having we want new business costs to penalize our earnings uh, in the short term, and and other people have different pressures. I'm not arguing with how the, how they behave, because they have a different constituency than Geico has with Berkshire and and what Berkshire has with its shareholders in turn. And I think in that case, our system is superior. But it's not because we work harder. Charlie, <laughs> I don't do hardly anything. Uh, Jonathan. Could, could you please talk about your periodic payment annuity business? The weighted average interest rate on these contracts is 4.1 percent, which doesn't sound particularly attractive given the current interest rate environment. Is the duration of these liabilities long enough to make that an attractive cost of funds, or were these contracts executed primarily when rates were higher? Well, those contracts, these are what are called structured settlements primarily, and when somebody young has a terrible auto accident or whatever it may be, uh, perhaps urged by the court, uh, urged by uh, family members who really do have the interest of the, of the injured party at heart, they may convert what could be a large sum settlement, probably against the insurance company, you know, maybe a million dollars, maybe two million dollars, into periodic payments for the rest of the life of the injured party. And we issue those uh, for other insurance companies. In fact, sometimes the court directs that Berkshire, uh, or hints strongly that Berkshire should be the one to issue those, because you're talking with somebody's life 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, and the court or the lawyer or the family may want to be very, very sure that whoever makes that promise is going to be around to keep it, and, and Berkshire has a preferred position in that. We look, to get to your question, Johnny, we look for taking the longer maturity situations we always have, and we have to make assumptions about mortality, and we have to make assumptions, and then we have to decide on what interest rate will do it. The 4.1 uh, is a mix of a lot of contracts over a lot of years, obviously. We write maybe 30 million of these, 20 to 30 million a week, looking for the long maturities. And so if you take an average of 15 years or something of the sort, uh, that's how we come up with that sort of a figure. We, we adjust them to the interest rates at all times. And when doing that, we're making an assumption that we're going to earn more money than, than is inherent in the cost of these structured settlements. It's a business we've, I think we've got six or seven billion up now, uh, and we'll keep doing them. And incidentally, probably a significant per percentage of the six or seven billion, we're not yet paying anything on. Somebody else may have the earlier payments. Uh, and they're certainly weighted far out. So it's a business that, that uh, uh, we'll be in 10 or 20 years from now. We've got some natural advantage because people trust us more than any other 
company to make those payments. And the test is whether we earn over time a return above that, which we're paying to the injured party. And uh, that's a bet we're willing to make. Uh, but if interest rates continue to present levels for a long time, uh, we would, assuming we kept the money in fixed income instruments, uh, we would we'd have some loss in that. We've got an allowance in there instance, for the expenses, incidentally, of because we do make monthly payments to these people eventually. And we have to keep track of whether they're still alive or not, because you cannot count on the, the relatives of somebody that's deceased when a check is coming in every month to notify you promptly that the person has become deceased. Uh, but it's, it'll, that number will go up over time. If interest rates stay where they are, that 4.1 will come down a little bit as we had no business. Okay, station seven. Uh, thank you, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, for, for all you've done and the opportunity to learn even more from your approach to investing in life. Um, my name's Harry Hong. I'm a respirologist from Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, the question involves, back in 2001, you made an initial investment in USG shortly before the company declared bankruptcy due to the mounting asbestos liability. You held those shares through the bankruptcy process, even though standard wisdom says that the equity in Chapter 11 is usually worthless. Can you explain why USG's equity was a safe investment? Well, I don't really remember all the details then. It was uh, very cheap. <laughs> we uh, Very cheap. Yeah, but I would say this. USG, we own, I'm not sure what percentage, but it's a very significant percentage. I don't know. 20% or something. Probably 30% yeah. or something like that. But the um, USG overall has just been disappointing because the gypsum business has been disappointing. And um, I think, that, I may be wrong, I think they went bankrupt twice, first from asbestos going back and then subsequently because they just had too much debt. Uh, so it, is, it has not been a, a brilliant investment. Now, if, if gypsum prices were at levels that they were in some years in the past, uh, it would have worked out a lot better. But it hasn't but, been terrible. No, it hasn't been terrible. But it, Gibson took, has taken a real dive of several times, and there has been too much Gibson capacity. And then uh, when it comes back, the ma managements have been, not necessarily at USG, but, but including USG perhaps, they've gotten, more optimis they've gotten more optimistic about future demand than they should have. And they, they like, going back historically away, they like to build new plants. And, it's, it's a business where the, the supply has been significantly, potential supply has been significantly greater than demand in a lot of years. I mean, it, you've seen housing starts and since, since, two, since 2008 and 2009 not come back anywhere near as much as people anticipated. So gypsum prices have moved up and not dramatically. So I'll just put that one down as not one of our great ideas. Not one of my great ideas. Charlie wasn't involved in that. It's no disaster, though. No, it isn't. It's... Becky? Uh, this question. This question. Uh oh. oh. Hello? Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, this question comes from Axel Meyerseek in Germany, who writes, um, if Ajit Jain were to retire, God forbid, be promoted, what would be the impact on the insurance operations, both with regards to underwriting profit as well as the development of flow? Well, nobody will, could possibly replace a Jeep. I mean, it just it can't come close. But we have a terrific operation in insurance. We really do. Uh, outside of a Jeep, and, and it's terrific squared with a Jeep. Uh, there, there are things only he can do. Uh, but there are a lot of things that are institutionalized, a lot of things in our insurance business where uh, we've got extraordinarily able management too. 
Uh, so Ajit, for example, uh, bought a company that nobody here has heard of probably called Guard Insurance a few years ago, based in workers' comp primarily. It's based in improbably in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania, and it's expanding like crazy in Wilkesbury. And it it's been it's been a gem. And Ajit oversees it, but we've got a terrific uh, person running it. And we bought medical protective some years ago. Uh, Tim Kennessy runs that. Ajit oversees it, but Tim Kennessy can run a terrific insurance company with or without Ajit, but he's smart enough to realize that if you've got somebody like Ajit that's willing you to, to uh, oversee it to a degree, that, that's great. But Tim, Tim is a great insurance manager all by himself, and Medical Protective has been a wonderful business for us. Most people don't know we own it. The company goes back into the 19th century, actually. Uh, we've, we've got a lot of good operations. If you look at that section in the annual report called Other Insurance Company, I mean, that is, in aggregate, that is a wonderful insurance company. There's very few like it. Uh, Geico is a terrific company. Uh, so uh, Ajit has made more money for Berkshire than I have probably, but, but uh, we've still got what I would consider the world's best property casualty insurance operation, uh, even without him. And with him, you know, it, no, nobody, I don't think anybody comes close. Charlie? Well, a few years ago, California made a little change in its working compensation law, and Ajit saw instantly that it would cause the underwriting results to change drastically. And he went from a tiny percent of the market, about 10 percent of the market, which is big, and he just grasped a couple of billion dollars at least out of the air, like with snapping his fingers. And when it got tough, he pulled back. We don't have a lot of people like Ajit. It's hard to just snap your fingers and grab a couple of billion dollars out of the air. <laughs> but we, we actually, the California Workers' Comp, though, Guard has moved into the, I, we, we, have, we have got a lot of terrific insurance managers. I mean, I, I don't know of a better collection anyplace. Uh, and, uh, Ajit has found some of those. Uh, I've gotten lucky a few times. I mean, Tom Nerney at U.S. Liability, that goes back, yeah. what, 15, 16 years. He is a, a terrific operation. It's not huge, but it is so well managed. And uh, people don't even know we own these things. But you look at that last line, and now we've added Peter Eastwood with Berkshire Hathaway, especially. And, these are really good businesses, I gotta tell you. <laughs> when you can produce underwriting profits and on top of that just hand more float, uh, we don't have look, we don't have many businesses like that. Those are those are great businesses. We've got a hundred whatever it is, a hundred billion plus of money that we get to earn on, while at the same time, overall, you know, on balance we're likely to make some additional money for holding it. If you can get somebody to hand you $104 billion and pay you to hold it while you get to invest and get the proceeds, it's a good business. Now, most people don't do well at it. And, you know, the problem is that what I just described tempts lots of people to get into it. And recently, people have got into it really just for the investment management. It's a way to, to um, earn money offshore. And we don't do that. but, but, but uh, it can be done uh, for small companies with investment managers. So there's a lot of competition in it, but we have some fundamental advantages, plus we have, in certain areas, plus we have absolutely terrific managers uh, to, to maximize those advantages, and uh, uh, we're going to make the most of it. I've just been handed something Kraft Heinz came out with. Uh, they just came out with it commercially a couple of days ago, a few days ago, maybe a few weeks ago. At the director's meeting, they had this. I had three of these. Uh, 
I'm sure that there's a member or two of the audience who may not approve of it, but they, uh, <laughs> I got to tell you, folks, it's good. It's, it's, uh, it's, 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 it's a, a cheesecake arrangement with topping and Philadelphia cream cheese special on, so you create your own cheesecake. And I thought that I can eat it while Charlie's talking, and, and you'll be able to get it at the halftime. It's selling very well, and I think, just so you don't feel too guilty, I think it's 170 calories for this cherry one. I, like I said, I had three of these desserts. I don't mind having five or 600 calories for dessert. You know, I mean, I'll, I'll let somebody else eat the broccoli, and I'll have the dessert. <laughs> so we'll, we'll be eating this, but you too, at halftime, I think they brought eight or 9,000 of these. I'll be disappointed if we don't run out. Actually, I'll be disappointed in you, not them. <laughs> okay. Jay? This question is on the topic of succession planning. Warren, there seem to be fewer mentions by name of top performing Berkshire managers in this year's annual letter. Does this mean you're changing your message regarding the succession plan for Berkshire's next CEO? Well, the answer to that is no. And I didn't realize there were fewer mentions by name. I, I write that thing out and, and send it to Carol, and she tells me go back to work. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't actually think that much about how many personally get na named. I would say this, and this is absolutely true, we have never had more good managers now because we've got more good companies, but we have never had more good managers than, than we have now. So I, but, but it has nothing to do with, with uh, succession. Uh, Charlie? Well, I certainly agree with that. We don't seem to have a whole lot of 20-year-olds. <laughs> certainly not at the front table. <laughs> <laughs> no. Now we've got we've, we've got an ex extraordinary group of good managers, which is why we can manage by application. It wouldn't work if we had a whole bunch of people who were uh, had come with the idea of getting my job. I mean, if we had if we had 50 people out there, all who wanted to be running Berkshire Hathaway, it would not work very well. And, but they, uh, they have the jobs they want in life. Tony Nicely loves running Geico. You know, at the, and you go down the line, they, they, they have jobs they love. And, and that's a lot better in my view than having a whole bunch of them out there that are kind of doing their job there, kind of hoping the guy that's competing with them will fail so that when I'm not around, that they'll get the nod. It's, it's a much different system than it exists at most large American corporations. Well, we'll go to Station 8. Hi, Warren and Charlie. My name is Vicky Wei. I'm an MBA student from the Wharton School of Business. Uh, this is my first time to be in the first uh, in the annual meeting. I'm really excited about it. Thanks for having us here. Thanks my question. <laughs> my question is. Um, where do you want to go fishing for the next three to five years? Which sectors are you most bullish on and which sectors are you most bearish on? Thank you. Yeah. Charlie and I do not really discuss sectors much, um, nor do we let the macro environment or thoughts about it enter into our decision. We're really opportunistic and we we obviously are looking at all kinds of businesses all the time. I mean, it's a hobby with us almost, probably more with me than Charlie. But we're hoping we get a call and we've got, we've got a bunch of fillers. And I would say this to both of us, we probably know in the first five minutes or less whether something is likely to, or has a reasonable chance of happening. Uh, and it's just gonna go through there and, it, and it's going to, the first question is, is, can we really ever know enough about this to come to a decision? You know, and, and that knocks out a whole bunch of things, and, and there's a, a few, and, and then if it makes it through there, there's a, there's a pretty good, reasonable chance we're going to, we may do something. But
but it's not sector specific. It, we do love the companies, obviously, with the moats around the product long, where, where, where consumer behavior can be perhaps predicted further out. But I would say it's getting harder to, for us anyway to anticipate consumer behavior than we might have thought 20 or 30 years ago. I, I think that, that uh, that's just a tougher game now. But we'll measure it and we'll look at it in terms of returns on present capital, returns on prospective capital. We may have, we can, a lot of people give you some signals as to what kind of people they are even in talking in the first five minutes and, and, and whether you're likely to actually have a satisfactory arrangement with them over time. So a lot of things go on fast, but it, we know the kind of sectors we kind of like to, or the, the type of business we kind of like to end up in, uh, but we don't really say we're going to go after companies in this field or that field or another field. Uh, uh, Charlie, you want to? Yeah, some of our subsidiaries do little bolt-on acquisitions that make sense. And that's going on all the time. And, and of course, we, we like it. When, but I would say the general field of buying whole companies, it's gotten very competitive. There's a huge industry of doing these leveraged buyouts. That's what I still call them. The, the people who do them think that's a kind of a bad marker, so they say they do private equity. You know, it's like making a janitor call himself the chief of engineering or something. And, but at any rate, the people who do the leverage buyouts, they can finance practically anything in about a week or so through shadow banking, and they can pay very high prices and get very good terms and so on. So it's very, very hard to buy businesses. And we've done well because there's a certain small group of people they don't want to sell to private equity. And they love the business so much, they, they don't want it just dressed up for resale. We had a guy some years ago came to see me, and he was 61 at the time. And he, uh, he said, look, I've got a fine business. I got all the money I can possibly need. But he said, there's only thing one there's only one thing that worries me when I drive to work. Actually, there's more than one guy that's told me that. That's used the same term. There's only one thing that bothers me when I go to work. You know, if something happens to me today. My wife's left. You know, I've seen these cases where executives in the company try to buy them out cheap or they sell to a competitor and all the people. He says, I don't want to leave her with a business. I want to decide where it goes, but I want to keep running it. And I love it. And he said, I thought about selling it to a competitor. But if I sell it to a competitor, you know, their CFO is going to become the CFO of the new company, and they're, you know, on down the line. And all these people who help me build the business, you know, a lot of them are going to get dumped, and I'll walk away with a ton of money, and some of them will lose their job. He said, I don't want to do that. And he said, I can sell it to a leveraged buyout firm uh, who would prefer to call themselves private equity, but they're going to leverage it to the hilt. And they're going to resell it, and they're going to dress it up some. But in the end, it's, it, it is not going to be in the same place. I don't know where it's going to go. He said, I don't want to do that. So he said, it isn't because you're so special. He said, there just isn't anyone else. <laughs> if you're ever proposing to a potential spouse, don't use that line. <laughs> but that's what he told me, and I took it well. And we made a deal. Uh, so uh, logically, Unless somebody has that attitude, we should lose in this market. I mean, you can borrow so much money, so cheap, and we're looking at the money as pretty much all equity capital, and we are not competitive with somebody that's going to have a very significant portion of the purchase price carried in debt, maybe averaging you know four percent or something. At and he won't take the losses if it goes down. He gets part of the profit if it goes up. Yeah, yeah. His, his calculus is just so different than ours, and, and, and he's got the money to make the deal. So if all you care about is getting the highest price for your business, you know, we are not a good call. Uh, and, and we will get some calls in any event. And uh, we can offer something that, that wouldn't call it unique, but it's unusual. Uh, the person that sold us 
that business and a couple of others that have, actually it's almost word for word the same thing they say. They are all happy with the sale they made, very happy. And uh, you know, they are, they have lots and lots and lots of money and they're doing what they love doing, which is still running the business. And they, they know that they made a decision that will leave their family and the people who work with them all their lives in the best possible position. And that's, in their equation, they have, they have done what's best. But that is not the equation of, of many people, and it certainly isn't the equation of somebody who buys and borrows every dime they can with the idea of reselling it after they you know, maybe dress up the accounting and do some other things. So, and, uh, but there, when the disparity gets so wide between what a heavily debit, debt financed purchase will bring as against an equity type purchase, it, it, it gets to be tougher. There's just no question about it. And it'll, it'll stay that way. But it's uh, been tough for a long time and we've bought some good businesses. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Andrew? Warren, uh, this comes uh, from a shareholder who I think is here who asked to remain anonymous. Uh, writes, three years ago, you were asked at the meeting about how you thought we should compensate your successor. You said it was a good question and you would address it in the next annual letter. We've been patiently waiting. Can you tell us now, at least philosophically, how you've been thinking about the way the company should compensate your successor so we don't have to worry when the pay consultants arrive on the scene? Yeah. Well, that, unfortunately, at my age, I don't have to worry about things I say said three years ago, but this guy, obviously much younger, remembers. <laughs> I'm not, well, I'll accept his word that I said that. But the, uh, there's a couple possibilities, actually, uh, and I don't want to get into details on them, but you may have, and I actually would hope that we would have somebody, A, that's already very rich, which they should be, been, been working a long time, and have got that kind of ability, that's very rich, and really is not motivated by whether they have 10 times as much money as they and the families can need or 100 times as much. And they might even wish to perhaps set an example of by engaging for something far lower than actually what you could say their true market value is. And that could or could not happen. I think it'd be terrific if it did, but, but I, can't, I can't blame anybody for uh, wanting their market value. And then uh, if they didn't elect to go in that direction, I would say that you uh, would probably pay them a very modest amount and then have an option which increased in value by, or increased in striking price annually. Nobody does this hardly. The Washington, Graham Holdings has done it. The Washington Post Company did a little bit but would increase because, assuming that there were substantial retained earnings every year, because why should somebody retain a bunch of earnings and then claim they would actually improve the value simply because they withheld the money from shareholders? So very easy to design that, and in private companies, people do design it that way. They just don't want to do it in public companies because they get more money the other way. Uh, but they might have a very substantial one that could be exercised uh, but whether shareholders, shares had to be held for a couple of years after retirement so that they really got the result over time that the majority of the stockholders would be able to get them and not be able to pick their spots as to uh, when they exercised and sold a lot of stock. It, it would, it's not hard to design. Uh, and it really depends who you're dealing with in terms of actually how much they care about money and having money beyond what they can possibly use. And most people do have an interest in that, and I don't blame them. Uh, but I, I don't know, what do you think, Charlie? Well, I, one thing I think is that I have avoided all my life compensation consultants. To me, it's sort of, I hardly can find the words to express my contempt. <laughs> 
I will say this. If the, if the board hires a compensation consultant after I go, I will come back. <laughs> <laughs> Mad. Mad. <laughs> So I think there's a lot of mumbo jumbo in this field, and I don't I don't see it going away. Oh, it isn't going to go away. Yeah. No, it's going to get worse. And, and I mean the if you look at I mean it, it, the way compensation gets handled. I mean it, it you know everybody looks at everybody else's proxy statement and says we I can't know. possibly hire a guy that hasn't been. Uh, it's ridiculous. Know, so on and and the human relations department. You know, work for the CEO, come in and suggest a consultant. What consultant is ever going to get another assignment if he says you should pay your, your CEO below the, down in the fourth quartile because you're yeah. going to get a fourth quartile result? I mean, it just, you know, it, it, yeah. it isn't that the people are evil or anything. It's just the nature of the situation just, it produces a result that is not consistent with how representatives of the ownership should be hated. It's even worse than that. <laughs> Capitalism is the is the golden goose that that we all live on. And if people generally get so they have contempt for it because they don't like the pay arrangements and the system, uh, your capitalism may not last as well. And and that's like killing the golden goose. So. I think the existing system has a lot wrong with it. I think there is something coming in pretty soon. I may be wrong about this, where companies are going to have to put in their proxy statement the uh, CEO's pay to the average pay or something like that. That isn't going to change anything. I mean, it won't change a thing. It won't change a thing. And, and you know, it'll cost us. And by the way, it won't get any headlines either. Um, it'll be tucked away. It'll cost us a lot of money with 367,000 people employed around the world. and. Uh, I mean, we'll hope to get something that makes it somewhat simpler so we can use estimates or something of the sort. But to, to get the median income or mean income or whatever, however the rules may read, you know, and... That's and, what uh, consultants are for, Warren. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's, you know, it is human nature that produces this. And, you know, the most... I write in this letter to the managers every two years, I said, the only excuse I won't take on something is that everybody else is doing it. But of course, everybody else is doing it is exactly the rationale for why people did not want to count the cost of stock options as a cost. I mean, it was ridiculous. All these CEOs went to Washington, and they got the Senate, I think, to vote 88 to 9 to say the stock options aren't a cost. And then a few years later, you know, that it became so obvious that, that they finally put it in so it was a cost. You know, it reminded me of Galileo or something. I mean, all these guys. Worse. It was way worse. <laughs> but, the Pope behaved better to Galileo than the, he, he was. Well, anyway, it's, it, I would hope, you know, like I say, somebody, whoever, and it doesn't even have to be, I'm not talking about the current successor or anybody else. I mean, it, 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 there, these successors down the line are probably going to have gotten very, very wealthy by the time. They're running Berkshire, and and uh, the incremental value of of wealth gets very close to zero uh, at some point, and and uh, there is a chance to use it as a as a, a different sort of model. But I don't have any problem if it's a system is devised that recognizes retained earnings. Nobody, I've never heard anybody talk about it. Uh, you know it. The 20 boards I've been on, or you know, if you, if you and I were partners in a business, you know, and we kept retaining earnings in the business, and I kept having the value to buy a portion of you out at a constant price, you'd say this is idiocy. But of course, that's the way all the option systems are designed, and it's better to be to, for the CEO and for the consultants, and and of course, usually if there's there's some correlation between what CEOs are paid and what boards are paid. If CEOs were getting paid at the rate that they got paid 50 years ago, adapted to present dollars, um, director pay would be lower. At, uh, so it's, you know, it's got all these built-in things that to some extent uh, uh, sort of kindle the... No the, Berkshire director is in it for the money. Well, they are. They own a lot of stock. 
and they bought it in the market, just like this. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. No, it's, didn't. it's a very old-fashioned system. I looked at one company the other day, and seven of the directors had never bought a share of stock with their own money. Now they've been given stock, but not one of the, not one of the, the, the I mean, I didn't say not one. Seven of the directors had never actually bought a share of stock, and there they are, you know, making decisions on who should be CEO and how they should be paid and all that sort of thing. But then. You know, they've never felt like shelling out a dollar themselves. Now they've been given a lot of stock. It's, you know, we're dealing with human nature here, folks. <laughs> and that what you want is to have a system that works well in spite of how human nature is going to drive it. And, and we've done awfully well in this country in that respect. I mean, American businesses overall has done very, very well for, for the Americans generally. Uh, but not every aspect of it is exactly what you want to teach your kids. Okay, Greg. Warren, between yep. 2010 and 2015, intermodal rail traffic enjoyed double-digit rates of revenue growth as shorter haul freight converted from truck to rail. During the past year or so, though, cheaper diesel prices and more readily available truckload capacity have made trucking more competitive, leading to a decline in intermodal rail traffic. While carload growth is expected to be solid longer term, helping to offset weakness in other segments like coal, what impact do you expect the widening of the Panama Canal, which was completed last year, to have on the West Coast port shipments that BNSF has traditionally carried through to exchange points for the Eastern U.S. railroads, as shippers elect to have goods unloaded at ports in the Gulf of Mexico or up the Eastern Seaboard? And while a loss of volumes is never a good thing, could there be a small trade-off here as the bottleneck in Chicago, where most east-west cargo is handed off, eases a bit over time as some of the current traffic gets rerouted? Well, I, yeah, I, Chicago has got lots of problems and it's going to continue for a long I mean, that requires a big solution. When you think of how the railroads developed, I mean, they, Chicago was the center and, you know, the, you laid the rails and there were a whole bunch of different railroads, you know, <laughs> 100 years ago. and. The city grows up around them and everything, so Chicago is a, can be a huge problem. But getting to intermodal, I think intermodal <coughs> will do very well. But you are correct that car loadings actually hit a peak in 2006. So here we are 11 years later, and the investment of the five big class one railroads for the biggest. Uh, if you look at their investment beyond depreciation, it's tens and tens of billions of dollars and we're carrying less freight, uh, the four in aggregate, than we were in 2006. And coal will continue to decrease. It's a good business and it has big advantages over truck in many respects. Truck gets but much more of a free ride in terms of the fact that their right of way, which is the, the highway system, is, is, is subsidized to a much greater degree beyond the gas tax, uh, you know, we, than the railroad industry. Uh, but uh, it it is not it has not been a growth business in physical volume to any great degree. I think it's unlikely to be. I think it's likely to be a good business. I think we've got a great territory. I like. The West better than the East, and as you mentioned, you know there will be some, some, uh, some uh, intermodal traffic that gets diverted to Eastern ports, perhaps. Or so. Overall, I, we've got a terrific system in that respect, and we, we will do well. It would be more fun if we had something where you could expect aggregate car loadings to increase two or three or four percent a year, but that I don't think that's going to happen. Uh, I do think our fundamental position is terrific, however. I, I think we'll earn de decent returns on capital, but that's, I think that's the limit of it. Charlie? Nothing to add. Okay, Station 9. I'm from Shankar Anand from Gurney, Illinois. Thank you for doing everything you do for us. I have a question. The two of you have largely avoided capital allocation mistakes by bouncing ideas off of one another. Uh, will this continue long into Berkshire's future? And I'd like to, I'm interested in both at 
headquarters and its subsidiaries. Uh, it can't continue very long. I. <laughs> Don't get defeated, Charlie. <laughs> uh, any successor that's put in at Berkshire, uh, capital allocation abilities and proven capital allocation abilities uh, are certain to be uppermost in the board's minds, or in, in the current case, in terms of my recommendation, Charlie's recommendation, for what happens after we're not around. Uh, capital allocation is incredibly important at Berkshire. Right now we have 280 years, 90 billion, whatever it may be, of shareholders' equity. Uh, if you take the next decade alone, you know, nobody can make accurate predictions on this, but in the next 10 years, if you just take and depreciate, uh, depreciation, right now is another 7 billion a year, something on that order. Uh, the next the ma next manager in the decade is going to have to allocate maybe 400 billion or something like that, maybe more, and it's more than already has been put in. So, 10 years from now, Berkshire will be a, an aggregation of businesses where more money has been put in in that decade than everything that took place ahead of time. So you need a very sensible capital allocator uh, in the job of, of being CEO of Berkshire, and we will have one. Uh, it would be a terrible mistake uh, to have someone in this job where really capital allocation might, be, might even be their main talent. It probably should be very close to their main talent. Um, and of course, we have an advantage at Berkshire in that we do know how important that is, and there is that focus on it. And in a great many companies, people get to the top uh, through ability and sales. Sometimes they come from the legal side, something like that, all different sides. And they then have the capital allocation sort of in their hands. Now, they may not establish strategic uh, thinking divisions, and they may listen to investment bankers and everything, but they better be able to do it themselves. Uh, and uh, if they've come from a different background or haven't done it, it's a little bit, as I put in one of my letters, I think it's like getting to Carnegie Hall, playing the violin, and then you walk out on the stage and they hand you a piano. I mean, it, 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 is, it is something that uh, Berkshire would not do well if somebody was put in who had a lot of skills in other areas, but really did not have a, a, an ability of capital allocation. I've talked about it as, as being something I call a money mind. I mean, people can have 120 IQs or 140 IQs or whatever it may be, very similar scoring abilities in terms of intelligence tests, and some of them have minds that are good at one type of thing and some of them another. I've, I've, I've known very bright people that do not have money minds, and they can make very unintelligent decisions. They can do all kinds of other things that most mortals can't do, uh, but it just doesn't, it isn't the way their wiring works. And I've known other people that really would not do that brilliantly. They do fine, but on an SAT test or something like that, but they've never made a dumb money decision in their life. And Charlie, I'm sure, has seen the same thing. So we do want somebody Hopefully they've got a lot of talents, but we certainly do not want somebody that, if they lack a money mind. Charlie? Well, there's also the option of buying in stock, yep. which, so it isn't like it's some hopeless problem. One way or another, something intelligent will be done. And a money mind will recognize when it makes sense to buy in stock and doesn't. You know, and uh, in fact, it's a pretty good test for some people, in terms of management, how they think about something like buying in stock. Uh, because it, it's not a very complicated equation if you sort of think straight about that sort of a subject. But 
Some people think that way and some don't, and they're probably being miles better at some than something else. But they say some very silly things when you get to something that seems so clear as whether, say, buying in stock makes sense. Anything further, Charlie? No. Okay, Carol. This, this question comes from Steve Haverstraw of Connecticut. Uh, Warren, you've made it very clear in your annual letter that you think the hedge fund compensation scheme of 2 and 20 generally does not work well for the fund's investors. And in the past, you have questioned whether investors should pay, quote, financial helpers, unquote, as much as they can. But financial helpers can create tremendous value for those they help. Take Charlie Munger, for instance. In nearly every annual letter and on the movie this morning, you describe how valuable Charlie's advice and counsel has been to you and in turn to the incredible rise in Berkshire's value over time. Given that, would you be willing to pay the industry standard, quote, financial helper fee of 1% on assets to Charlie? Or would you perhaps even consider 2 and 20 for him? What is your judgment about this matter? Yeah. Well, I've said in the annual report that I've known maybe a dozen people in my life uh, and I said there are undoubtedly hundreds or maybe thousands out there, but I've said that I've known personally a dozen where uh, I would have predicted or did predict in, in a fair number of those 12 cases, I did predict that the person involved would do better than average in investing over a long period of time. And obviously, Charlie is one of those people. So would I pay him? Sure. But would I take financial advisors as a group and pay them 1% with the idea that they would deliver results to me that were better than the S&P 500 by 1% uh, and thereby leave me breaking even against what I could have done on my own? Uh, you know, there, there's very few. So it's, it's just not a good question to ask whether, you know, I pay Charlie one percent. That's like asking, you know, whether I'd have paid Babe Ruth, you know, a hundred thousand or whatever it was to come over from the Red Sox to the Yankees. I mean, sure I would have, but there weren't very many people I would have paid a hundred thousand to in nineteen nineteen or whatever it was to come over to the Yankees. So uh, the it's a fascinating situation because the problem isn't that the advisors are going to do so terrible. It's just that you have a an option available that doesn't cost you anything that is going to do better than they are in aggregate. And uh, it, it's an interesting question. I mean, if you, if you hire an obstetrician, uh, assuming you need one, uh, they're going to do a better job of delivering the baby than, you know, if the spouse comes in to do it, or if they just pick somebody up off the street. And if you, if you go to a dentist, if you hire a plumber, in all the professions, there is value added by the professionals as a group compared to doing it yourself or just randomly picking laymen. In the investment world, it isn't true. I mean, they, the active group, the people that are professionals in aggregate, are not, cannot do better than the people. The, aggregate of the people who sit, just sit tight. And if you say, well, in the active group, there's some person that's terrific, I, I will agree with you. But the passive people can't all pick that person, and they wouldn't, they don't know how to identify them. So I, I, uh, It's even worse than that. The passive, <laughs> the expert who's really good, when he gets more and more money in, he, he, he suffers just terrible performance problems. Yeah. And yeah. so you'll find the person who has a long career at 2 and 20, and if you analyze it, net all the people have lost money because some of the early people have had a good record, but more money come in later and they lose it. So it, it, the investing world is just, it's a morass of wrong incentives, crazy reporting, and uh, I'd say a fair amount of del delusion. Yeah, if you ask me whether I, those 12 people I picked would do better than the S&P working with $100 billion, I would answer that 
probably none of them would. I mean, that would not be their perspective of performance. Uh, there's no, but when I was when I was talking of them, I you know, or, or referencing them, and when they actually worked in practice, they dealt generally with pretty moderate sums. Uh, and as the sums grew, uh, their relative advantage diminished. It, I mean, it's so obvious from history. The, the example I used in the report, I mean, the guy who made the bet with me, and incidentally, all kinds of people didn't make the bet with me because they knew better than to make the bet with me. Uh, well, they, there were hundreds, at least a couple hundred underlying hedge funds. These guys were incented to do well. The fund to fund manager was incented to pick the best ones they could pick. The guy who made the bet with me was incented to pick the best fund to funds. You know, and tons of money, and just in with those five funds, a, a lot of money went to pay managers for what was subnormal performance over a long period of time. And it, it can't be anything but that. And it's an interesting, you know, it's an interesting profession when you have tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people who are compensated based on selling something that in aggregate can't be true, superior performance. So, uh, but it'll continue, and the best salespeople will tend to attract the most money, and because it's such a big game, people will make huge sums of money, you know, far beyond what they're going to make in medicine or you name it. I mean, you know, repairing the country's infrastructure, I think. I mean, the big money, is huge money, is in selling people the idea that you can do something magical for them. And if you have, if you even have a billion dollar fund, you know, and, and get 2% of it for terrible performance, make, that's $20 million. And in any other field, you know, it would just blow your mind. But people get so used to it, uh, you know, in the, in the field of investment that it just sort of passes along. And $10 billion, I mean, $200 million fees, We've got two guys in the office, you know, that are managing $11 billion. Uh, uh, well, no, they're not. I'm sorry. They're, 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 yeah, they're managing $20 billion, um, you know, between the two of them, $21 billion maybe. And uh, we, we pay them a million dollars a year, plus the amount by which they beat the S&P. They have to actually do something to get uh, contingent compensation, which is much more reasonable than 20 percent. But how many hedge fund managers in the last 40 years have said, I only want to get paid if I do something for you, you know, you know, unless I actually deliver something beyond what you can get yourself, uh, you know, I don't want to get paid. It just doesn't happen. And, you know, it, get back, it's get back, it gets back to that line that I've used, but when I asked the guy, you know, how can you in good conscience, charge two and twenty, and he said, "Because I can't get three and 30. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Any more, Charlie? Or are we used up our? I think you've beaten up on them enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, Jonathan. Precision Cast Parts represents the second largest acquisition Berkshire has ever made. There wasn't much qualitative or quantitative information about it in the 2016 annual. Would you be willing to update us here with how it is doing currently, what excites you about its prospects, and what worries you most about it? I'm also curious if there were any meaningful purchase price adjustments beyond intangible amortization that negatively impacted Precision's earnings in 2016, as was the case with Van Tile in 2015. And finally, are there any opportunities in sight for bolt-on acquisitions? Yeah, we've actually made acquisitions, and we will make more that fit there because we've got an extraordinary manager, and and we've got a terrific position uh, in the aircraft field. Uh, so there will be sensible, there will be the chance for sensible acquisitions, and uh, we've already made two anyway, and. We, could, we, we, we will make more over time. Uh, the, uh, it's, the amortization of intangibles is the only big purchase price adjustment. That's 
something over $400 million a year non-deductible. In my mind, uh, that's 400 and some million of earnings. I do not regard the economic goodwill of precision cast parts uh, being diminished at that rate annually. That is a, uh, and you know, I've explained that in some degree. Uh, the, as a very long-term business, you, know, you, you can worry about 3D printing. I don't think you have to worry about aircrafts being manufactured. Uh, but aircraft deliveries can be substantially altered uh, in relation to any given backlog in most cases. So the deliveries can be fairly volatile, uh, but I don't think the long-term demand is anything I worry about. Uh, and the question is uh, whether anybody can do it better or cheaper, or like I say, whether 3D uh, printing uh, at least takes away part of the field in some respect. But overall, I will tell you, I feel very good about precision cash parts. It's a, it is a very long-term business. I mean, we have contracts that run for a very long time, and like I say, the initiation of a new plane may be delayed or something of the sort. But if you take a look at the engine that's in the other adjoining room here and, and, and uh, uh, in our exhibition hall, uh, you would, if you were putting that engine together with a 20 or 25 year life or whatever it may have, uh, carrying hundreds of people, you would care very much about your supplier and you'd care not only in the quality, which would be absolutely you'd care, of the work being done, but you also, if you were an engine manufacturer or a an aircraft manufacturer further down the the line, you would care very much about the reliability of delivery on something because you do not want a plane that, or an engine is 99% complete while somebody is dealing with the problem of faulty parts or, or anything else that would delay delivery. So the reliability is incredibly important. I don't think anybody has a reputation uh, better than Mark Donegan for, and, and the company for delivery, so I, I I love the fact we bought precision gas parts. Charlie? Yeah, well, well, what's interesting about it, too, is that it's a very good business purchased at a fair price under, but this is no screaming bar bargain like the old days. Yeah. For quality businesses, you pay up now a lot more than we used to. Yeah, that's absolutely true, and we, you don't get a bargain price. Uh, the 400 plus million, incidentally, you know, goes on for quite a while, too. And, and we'll explain it in the report, just like, just as we'll explain that the depreciation charge at a railroad would not be adequate. I mean, it, it's the way accounting works. And starting, I don't even want to tell you about this one, but starting the first of next year, accounting is going to become a, sort of a nightmare in terms of Berkshire and other companies, because they're going to have us mark our equities to market, just like we were a Wall Street trading firm or something, and those changes in the value of Coca-Cola or American Express or anything are going to run through the income account every every quarter. In fact, they run through it every day on the, in this series, so that it really will get confusing. Now, it's our job to explain things so that you aren't confused when we report gap earnings, but gap earnings, as reported, will become even more meaningless looking only at the bottom line than they are now. And that was not necessarily a good idea. No, I think it's a terrible idea, but 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 we'll deal with it and we'll the I mean it's my job to explain to what extent gap accounting is useful to you in evaluating Berkshire and the times when it actually distorts things. Accounting isn't supposed to de it's not supposed to describe value. On the other hand, it's a terribly useful tool, if understood, in order to estimate value if you're analyzing businesses. And uh, so, in a certain way, you can't blame the auditing profession for doing what they think is their job, which is not to 
not the present value, although by, by using these market but values. But you can blame the audit. What's that? You can blame the audit profession okay. for that one. Yeah. That was really stupid. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I agree with that, actually. <laughs> but we will do our best to give you, we're always going to give you the audited figures, and then we're going to explain their shortcomings in either direction and how they, how, what you should use and what you probably should ignore in, in looking at those numbers and, and using them to come to a judgment as to the value of your holdings. And I'll explain it to you the same way I would explain it to my sisters or anybody else that, you know, I, I, we want you to understand what you own and we try to cover the details that are really important in that respect. Uh, I mean, there's a million things you can talk about that, that are just of minor importance when you're talking about a $400 billion market value. But they're the things that, that if I, Charlie and I were talking about the company, they, they'd be the figures or the interpretations or anything that, that we would regard as important in sort of coming to an estimate of, of the value of the business. But it's going to be, you can't knock the, the media. I mean, they've only got a few paragraphs to describe the earnings of Berkshire every quarter. But if they simply look at bottom line numbers, what can be silly this year will become absolutely ludicrous uh, next year because of the new rule that comes into effect for 2018. Okay, station 10. Uh, hello, Boris. This is a question from China. Uh, I'm James Chen, a pension fund manager from oh. China, Shanghai. Uh, my question is quite simple. What is the probability of uh, duplicating your great investment track record in China's stock market in the next decade or two in terms of uh, investment personal? That's all. And I thank my friends from Hui Tianfu and Fugo Fund Management House for guiding me in raising this question. Thank you. Charlie, you're the expert on China. <laughs> it's like determining the order of presidency between a, a louse and a flea. Yeah. I do think that the Chinese stock market is cheaper than the American market. And I do think China has a bright future. And I also think that there'll be growing pains, of course. And, and but well, we have this opportunistic way of going through life. We don't have any particular rules about which market we're in or anything like that. Well, Charlie's delivered a headline anyway now. Longer predicts China market will outperform U.S. So, um, and I've just been informed. It's 12.15, so I apologize if you're hungry for holding you over for 15 minutes. So we'll reconvene around 1.15, and, and uh, I'll see you then. Thanks. Hello again, and welcome to our halftime show. I'm Andy Serwer. You've just been listening to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger over in the CenturyLink Center answering questions for some three hours. We're adjacent to the CenturyLink Center in the convention hall. Behind me, there are thousands of people in addition to the 17,000 who have been in the arena listening to Warren Buffett. Joining us now is Berkshire Hathaway director, Ron Olson. He's also a name partner at Munger, Tolls and & Olson. And uh, Ron, welcome, great to see you. Thank you. I like the backdrop of that last shot of me with DQ in the over my left shoulder. There is a lot of branding going on here, isn't there, Ron? <laughs> Incredible branding, and that, that's one of the joys of these businesses. So I, I just want to make it clear about the law firm that um, you are uh, a partner at and have been for many years, and Charlie was a partner there too, but left quite some time ago. Uh, Charlie Munger was a founder of our law firm, 1962. I joined the firm in 1968 as, I believe, the eighth member of the uh, firm as it was at that point in time. 
Charlie uh, has been retired as a partner in our firm for uh, over 50 years. So, uh, however, he has always officed with us, and he's always been available for consulting. And from the client's point of view, they're getting a fair amount of Buffett time, I mean, Munger time, without any charge uh, because I consult him, others consult him from time to time on various problems that we face. He loves law, but he loves his life investing and the independence that it has given him and his relationship with Warren. Now, Ron, you've known Charlie and Warren for many decades. Often people group them together, yet they're very different people. Can you talk about how they're different, maybe? Um, that's a good observation, Andy. I, th I think uh, they're different. Well, they, they pointed out one way uh, earlier today. Uh, Warren, he enjoys being out in the public and conversing with people like yourself. Uh, Charlie just soon sit at home or in his office in a, one of his comfortable chairs reading a book. Uh, that's one way they're different. Uh, they are... Uh, very much the same in one very important respect, and that is their rationality. I do not know of any two people who are more rational at the way they order their life and make judgments for Berkshire shareholders uh, than the two of them. A lot of good conversation and questions this morning, Ron. Shareholders asking about Wells Fargo. I want to get your take on um, that part of the uh, morning. So let's listen in and, and, and hear some sure. of that today. At Wells Fargo, you know, there were three very significant mistakes, but there was one that dwarfs all of the others. You're going to have incentive systems at any business, almost any business. There's nothing wrong with incentive systems, but you've got to be very careful what you incentivize. And you can incentivize bad behavior. And if so, you better have a system for recognizing it. Clearly, at Wells Fargo, there was an incentive system built around the idea of cross-selling and number of services per, per uh, customer. And the, the company in every quarterly investor pre presentation highlighted how many services per customer. So it was the focus of the organization a major focus, and undoubtedly people got paid and graded and promoted based on, on that number, or at least partly based on that number. Well, it turned out that that was incentivizing the wrong kind of behavior. So Berkshire has a big stake in Wells, and they had these problems last year. Do these questions rise to the board level? Is this something that you talk about? And, and what kinds of things rise to that level, Ron? Um, we certainly have talked about the Wells uh, issue, and probably it, it, one of the things I think is important for shareholders to appreciate about the relationship between Warren and the board is a lot of that conversation goes on not just in formal board meetings, but often on one-on-one -on -one, uh, kinds of conversations. And for instance, if we're looking at an acquisition in a say the energy field, you can bet on additions to the Warren-Charlie exchanges, Walter Scott's going to be consulted. When we come to a problem like Wells, I think I probably had a little more interaction with uh, Warren than, than others did. Uh, he and I sort of went to school together on the Solomon problem, uh, 1990. Uh, and we learned several things that he actually alluded to today. One was you've got to stop the bleeding. If you've got a wrong going on, you better be damn sure if you're the CEO and you become aware of it that you stop it. And John Goodfriend didn't at the time. Uh, we were later coming into Solomon, and uh, John Stumpf uh, was a little slow uh, at Wells. Secondly, it's important to get the facts and get them out and, uh, and move on. We, ever since Solomon, have had a sort of a shorthand uh, when we face a crisis situation. Get it right, 
get it out, get it over. Uh, and they were a little slow in getting that done. So, um, yeah, the board, in response to your question, uh, certainly cares about the what's going on at Wells. We've got a huge investment in, in Wells, but we have great confidence in the long term, as Warren and Charlie have emphasized with regard to the businesses we own most of or all of, uh, we have a lot of confidence in the durability of the long-term earning power of Wells. It's got a, millions of depositors that are, uh, I think, provided an, an enormous base for its continued earning power, despite what has been uh, a serious hiccup. All right, some very interesting perspective from Ron Olson, Berkshire Hathaway director. Ron, thanks so much for coming by. I'm glad to do it. Thank you, sir. Good luck. A lot more to come today. In a few minutes, the chairman of Coca-Cola, Mutar Kent, and the company's new CEO, James Quincy. Jen. Hey there, Andy. Uh, we are up in the press box in the arena. Everybody uh, filing out to get some food. I'm joined by Robert Miles. He's an author and also teaches a class on sort of all things Warren Buffett, trying to value companies the way that he does. I want to ask you, what jumped out at you from today's meeting? I, I kind of picked up on uh, what they were talking about when uh, they mentioned Google and maybe making a mistake there by not getting into that. Did that uh, get your attention? That, that was one thing, as well as the autonomous vehicles. But in 2000, uh, during a surprise celebration of Warren's 70th birthday, I asked him at lunch what his favorite website was. Mm. And unfortunately, he didn't say Yahoo, but <laughs> he did say it was Google and that it used to be Alta Vista, but he explained the metrics of, uh, instead of pay for play, but pay based on the search of others. And that was four years before they went public. So I guess that really brings it back to the comments where uh, Charlie Munger said we, we kind of blew it on, on one of those stocks there. Uh, let's talk about the autonomous vehicles. Why is that so, um, so bad and such a possible headwind for the company? Well, because they're in the insurance business and autonomous vehicles will fortunately make us safer. No so more that, accidents. Well, we hope. And I understand that tractors today, farm tractors, are using autonomous drivers in their tractors. So it is already being integrated into automation in the United States as well as around the world. So when it comes to trucks and also comes to vehicles, it's going to obviously impact the railroads, as they mentioned, as well as their auto, automobile insurance. Uh, two other tech companies that came up, IBM versus Apple. They had a question, and uh, the, 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 I think one of the things they said was, we're not apples to apples exactly, they're not apples to oranges. What did you think about that answer? Well, they're apples to IBMs, I guess, <laughs> and he saw uh, Apple as being a consumer goods business, uh, as well as IBM uh, obviously being business services. I was just at the IBM annual meeting and they did talk about their cloud business as growing and representing an ever increasing part of their business, but they have ha had to pay their medicine to recreate themselves, and, but they have bought back uh, $35 billion worth of their stock as well, returning value to the shareholders in th that way. Certainly on shareholders' minds, especially given uh, the news on Friday about decreasing their holdings. Robert Miles, thank you so much. Andy, I'm going to throw it back to you. All right, thanks, Jen. And coming up, we have a lot more special guests, including Glenn Close and Kathy Ireland. Get that. So what's the process for selecting questions in the meeting? Carol Loomis is one of the journalists asking those questions, and I asked her, how do you get a question asked? Well, I think everybody who sends me a question probably wonders that, too. Uh, first of all, um, uh, there are three journalists who ask questions, and you're really talking about what did the three journalists um, pick, although there are analysts, there are three analysts who are also asking questions, and then uh, there is uh, uh, questions from the audience, which are a wild card. You have no idea what's going to be said now. Uh, the questions start coming in to the three journalists, of which I'm one, and I'm the one who asks the first question, so this is very important. As far as I'm concerned, it's very important. 
officially they should start sending them in after the annual report, annual letter comes in. Some will send you early, but I don't pay any attention to them. And um, they start coming in and there's a huge surge of questions on email. They, all, they have three email addresses for the journalists and they start coming in immediately after the annual letter comes in. So and there's a huge surge uh, in the last few days of February and the first few days of March. Then it drops off to uh, almost nothing. And then at the end, and oh, they're also t told that they get a better chance of getting their question answered if they send it in early. And at least half the field pays no attention to that. So you get these big complicated questions at the end of the period and by that time you've got your list of what you think you might ask and those don't get much attention um, and, and that's very important. So how many questions do you get and how do you pick them? Well I, I, I'm going to break that down. Uh, first of all how many, the, the, the first question is how many people email me? That's going to be someplace around 225 or maybe 250. And some of those questions are also being sent to the other two journalists. And sometimes you will see a line up there that has all three journalists' email on it, so you know that. But others will maybe send one to you, uh, a separate email to you and will also send it to the other two journalists, uh, Becky Quick from CNBC and Andrew Sorkin from the New York Times. So you don't know. The, their, it would hit their best chances of getting a question answered. I'm telling trade secrets here. If they would send all three of us and not tell us that they were sending to the other three, other people will send you their very best question or what they think is their very best question and hope that you choose that because they're not overloading you. And then the journalist has to sit down with... Um, you're, so you're talking about 500 questions you could choose from and pick, we get to, each one of us gets to ask six. And um, you have to have a, um, a, a field, you have to have a personal field of maybe 12 questions because in between you're asking a question and uh, you're getting to ask your next question, there are going to be, I think it's five people who are going to ask questions and you don't, know whether they're going to take one of the questions that you were going to ask uh, the second thing. So it's a big lottery. I've had shareholders tell me, well, the questions seem to run to the, to the same. Actually, I don't believe there is that much sameness to them, but it probably seems so to a diehard uh, Berkshire fan. There's almost, there's almost literally a library of books that have been written about Buffett by now, including one by Carol Loomis, you can see right behind me, there's Carol Loomis's book, the cover right there, uh, Tap Dancing to Work. And people are buying up those books. We're joined now by chairman and CEO of Gabelli Asset Management, the legendary investor, Mario Gabelli. Mario, great to see you. Andy, always a privilege and delighted to be with you to talk about my favorite subject, Thanks stocks. Thanks for coming by, stocks, I love that. So what's your takeaway from uh, the morning meeting? Well, I think it's a continuation of what you read in this annual report and that Warren continues to be a cheerleader for companies in the United States and the United States. The rule of law, meritocracy, and the free market system are all of the flaws and they continue to allocate capital right. And so the questions were interesting. There was obviously some gal from Germany that asked something that I couldn't even understand. It kept going on and on and the crowd got a little anxious. But um, a balance, uh, good topical questions and good questions that you might consider. Uh, that were around for an extended period of time, like continuity of management and so on. I mean, in a way, it's extraordinary, these two guys in their 80s, and they continue to broaden their purview in terms of understanding the world. I mean, now it's China. They've actually gotten interested in technology stocks, but maybe that's through their money managers, right? Well, Todd and Ted had, had an influence on the other side of what I would not have thought I would have heard Warren talking about was owning four airlines. Uh, he always had this quote that said, you want to become a millionaire, start with a billion and buy an airline, and that goes back to one of his investments back about 20 years ago in the airline industry. Mario, you've known for investing in media stocks, so I want to ask you about that particular sector right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of anxiety. Um, a company will report numbers, and then people will say, oh, the business is dissipating. 
What's your overall take? And then I want to ask you about some specific stocks. Well, Andy, if you, you and I were sitting here in 1955, there was two and a half billion people in the world. Today, there's seven and a half billion. And to the degree that they have content and connectivity, they had it then, but there was limited. I think we just introduced color television. And today, we have an abundance of ways to watch content. So content and how do you repurpose it on a global basis is intriguing. But the part of content that millennials like and that people like and they like in real time is uh, live entertainment. Now, whether that could be sports, uh, for example, buying a baseball team, uh, a soccer team like Manchester United, a baseball team like the Atlanta Braves, which we think you're buying at a bargain, or just watching Beyonce or uh, Coachella, or one of those concerts. So we look at those, that ecosystem and participate that way. Quick last question. Still room for active managers out there? We're talking so much about passive investing. Well, you think about what Warren said in his annual report. Todd and Ted, his two money managers, have $21 billion, and they're active managers. He's not indexing that money. So, you know, there is a more than a good place. And as more we go index, there's more opportunity for us. And uh, you're going to have John Bogle up next, and we are a 1% relative to John. He's got $4 trillion, I've got $40 billion, so it is what it is in terms of what we manage, and we're strictly equities. All right, Mary Gabelli, thanks so much for coming. Great by. to be here. Great to play, make a lot of money in the ac active equity markets. Thanks, Andy. And speaking of uh, Ted Weschler and Todd Combs, we'll be hearing from them later on in the program. So Great. Ask them the right that. questions. Thank you very much. Good thanks, to be Mario. here. Buffett is a big fan and a big investor in Coca-Cola. Earlier, I spoke with the company's leaders. I'm here with the two top executives of the Coca-Cola company, Mutar Kent, chairman, former CEO, and the new CEO, James Quincy. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Great to be here. You guys you. just did a handoff of the CEO thing. Mutar, let's start with you. You were CEO for nine years. Mm -hmm. What do you think your greatest accomplishments were as the chief executive? Well, certainly one of the greatest things that I'm the most proud of, uh, proudest of is to um, uh, have this smooth uh, succession of leadership at the company. And James has taken over in, in our smoothest uh, transfer of leadership in the company um, and succession. And succession, as you know, is uh, always talked about, but it's not easy and it's not always smooth. So we're very proud to have had a very smooth, e great uh, succession. And uh, I'm very, uh, I believe um, we're in really good hands, um, and uh, I'm very proud. And uh, certainly, you know, when you look at the foundation of the Coca-Cola company compared to what uh, nine years ago, um, it's very strong. And I know that James and his team are going to build on uh, the, that strong foundation of $21 billion brands of uh, the shareholder value that we have created over the last uh, eight, nine years, about $100 billion plus, and then take it to new levels. So I feel really good. Uh, and I think um, the best days are ahead. Just to follow up a little bit, Mutar, I mean, how is it different? How is the company different now than from when you came in? Well, firstly, um, we were a hybrid business. We own 25% of our global bottling business. We are now very rapidly moving um, in the last throes of moving to a um, pure business where we have uh, franchised all of our uh, bottling businesses to new partners, existing partners that are doing really well. And so uh, about 50% of the total global bottling business has been restructured in the last three, four years. Th that is a massive undertaking. Taking. And I think uh, when you look at um, the impact of that over the next five to ten years, um, I believe that that's going to be very positive under especially great leadership like James and his new team. All right, James, congratulations on the new gig, by the way. Thank you, thank you. And uh, just started, what, how many days ago? A whole five days ago. <laughs> All right, how do you like the job? <laughs> so far, so good. <laughs> So, sort of a similar question, but looking forward, what are your top priorities as the new chief executive of Coca-Cola? Well, I think it's, uh, I think Mutar kind of set it up there, said we've spent, uh, under his leadership, uh, a number of years setting a really strong foundation, changing the, the way that we uh, interact with our bottlers and refranchising, and now it's about the next stage of growth. Um, it's about going on and completing the play and expanding the portfolio. Um, you know, we're known for our sparkling beverages and they'll continue to grow and be great. We're actually uh, establishing good leadership positions in other categories. We're very excited about them. So that's where the next uh, stage of growth is going to come from. It's a vibrant beverage industry. 
Uh, we're the leader and we want to expand that leadership across the board, the whole portfolio. Yeah, I want to ask, uh, I mean, there's so many SKUs. Here's a one, this is uh, kind of the, uh, something for the annual meeting, obviously. It's a Chinese Coke with uh, Buffett on it, mm -hmm. right? Yes, indeed. And uh, this is just kind of fun. But there are so many different drinks that you have, your portfolio. Does that make it more difficult to manage the business? Clearly, the more SKUs, the more different products you have, it makes it more complex to manage business, absolutely. But in the end, I think as we see the, the business and the development of what the consumer wants, as they spend more and more money on beverages, they don't want the same thing all the time. They want greater diversity in choice. And so part of what we need to do is respond not just with different products, different drinks, but different sizes. Uh, and so we did. We launched this... Uh, this hopefully famous, but certainly famous in China. This is Cherry Coke. This was launched in China uh, with Mr. Buffett's face on it, uh, available downstairs now. Uh, you've got to sell every day. Um, and we'll keep uh, building new products and new sizes. All right, Mutar, speaking of Warren Buffett, we're here, of course, at the Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting. Warren Buffett, of course, a large Coke shareholder, has been for a long time. How do you keep that shareholder happy? How have you done that? Well, first, you know, it's the the most incredible privilege to have Warren Buffett as your largest share owner, and um, we've I've certainly lived that every day um, as the former CEO, and I know James will continue living that privilege, and it's it's an amazing privilege. He's so engaging, uh, he's so passionate, he's so authentic um, as a person and as a share owner, and uh, I'm so proud to call him a friend a partner um, and have learned so much from him. And it's just an amazing, amazing privilege. And Warren is a brand himself and um, we're a brand business. And, you know, we just have s had so many wonderful conversations about brands and what they mean to people today versus yesterday. And uh, we always say in the Coca-Cola business, a brand is a promise and a good brand is a promise kept. And I think Warren lives that motto so well every single day of his life. And as I said, um, it's been an incredible privilege and continues to be an incredible privilege to have him as our largest uh, share owner. And um, having fun like these cans that James just showed you uh, when we launched Cherry Coke to have him uh, agree to have his portrait on the cans in China and he's so well known in China, has, is, and then you, these are the other small incredible benefits of having such an incredible share owner. Now the important part is making sure that Warren Buffett continues to say that he's at least 25% Coca-Cola. <laughs> right, James? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. He did say when he get to 90, he might up it to another can a day. <laughs> right. All right, we're going to have to leave it at that. Thanks so much for Thank coming you. by. Thank James you. Quincy, Mutar Kent, Chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Andy. You. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. A lot more still ahead in a moment. The founder of Vanguard, Jack Bogle, who Warren Buffett this morning said has, quote, done more for the average investor than probably anyone in the country. Let's go down now to the floor and Jen. Hi there, Andy. Well, I'm here with Jim Weber. He is the CEO of Brooks. I literally just ran from the press box all the way down here, and I could have used some, some running shoes, in Absolutely, fact. Uh, tell us about Brooks. What is different about you guys than every other running shoe company that's out there? Well, 15 years ago, we decided to focus on one and only one thing, to be a running company, and hopefully gain the trust of runners to be their number one choice for their gear head to toe. We've never looked back, so that's what makes us different. We left athletic footwear and apparel, and all we do is run. So you're not like about athleisure or basketball or hiking, it's literally just running. Every day that you move or get a run in is better, and that's what we're cheering on and celebrating. And so all the gear we, we make is made to run in. You don't have to run in it, but if you did, it's going to work for you. Okay, so if you really just want to be a lazy athleisure person, you can still wear the shoes. Uh, talk to me about the uh, special shoe that you guys have here, because everybody, there's 40 different companies down here. At the Expo, and a lot of them have something special. 
for the shareholders at the annual meeting, and this is yours. I'll hold it up and let people see what's inside, and you can tell us. Well, absolutely. We, you know, sponsored athletes can move footwear in the athletic world. We have two of the most prolific sponsored athletes, maybe in our industry, and Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. So we put them in the shoe. It's a Berkshire Hathaway Special Edition, and it happens to be our ghost shoe, which is up 44% this year. It's our number two shoe. It's just a fantastic running shoe. So the shareholders are buying a lot of them. You know, tell me about uh, being in retail right now, online versus brick and mortar. How important is it with a shoe to have a real presence in the world? Or can this all be done online? You know, I think in footwear, we all know in the industry that the in-store experience is never going to go away. Some, they want to touch and feel a shoe. They want to try it on. They want advice on what the right shoe for them is. So that's never going to go away, but no question about it. Shopping behavior is changing dramatically. It's impacting every retailer and every brand. I've never seen this much change in consumer in my, my career. A lot of change, especially happening this year, it feels like it. Jim Weber from uh, Brooks, thank you so much for uh, showing us uh, this fun shoe and just talking to us about the business. Thanks for coming by. All right, Andy, back to you. And Jen, I'm going to be running in those shoes tomorrow morning, so we'll be checking them out. Right, exactly. I forgot. Andy's running in these tomorrow in your race, so we'll get a real report. We'll yeah. Be well, for you, Andy. well uh, thank you. I need it. All right, the shareholder meeting will resume in about a half an hour. So, how did Warren Buffett choose his two deputies, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler, widely considered to be the two men who will ultimately take over investment decisions at Berkshire? That was one of the questions I asked Buffett when I spoke to all three of them, especially for today's show. Well, they're they're chosen for both ability and character. And uh, uh, for a very long time, uh, investments were handled by just me and Charlie Munger, my partner. Uh, and then uh, maybe seven or eight years ago, Charlie and I talked about the desirability of bringing on uh, somebody or maybe more than one somebody to both manage money now, but also uh, in preparation for the day that Charlie and I won't be around. Having anybody join the Berkshire family and be an integral part of investing significant money. You know, I, that's a, that's a, it's a big responsibility and I wanted somebody who was going to be there for keeps. And uh, I first found Todd six or seven years ago and, and Ted five or so years ago and, and now we're all set and they're handling ten billion dollars each. Uh, when we started it was maybe two billion or so now. I've added capital to it but, but it's one of the best decisions that Charlie and I have ever made was was uh, bringing these two on board. So just to follow up though, Warren, I mean, was it a gut decision? You said you had all these people who potentially would want to take these jobs. It's looking at what they had done, had done, and how they had done it, and what kind of people they would be. I mean, that uh, uh, I want somebody uh, that I'd be happy if they were marrying my daughter, and. Uh, uh, it, it's a similar type of situation. I mean, it, it, there can't be any question about character. So, Ted, I mean, this is an incredible job, right? But maybe somewhat daunting. You're managing money for and with Warren Buffett. What's that like? That's terrific. You know, it's a, in many ways, it doesn't change much from my prior world where I, I ran a fund, and I've always been kind of a a one-man band analytically and kind of our day job is reading and I spend the vast majority of my day reading. I try to make about half of that reading random, things like newspapers and trade periodicals. But to be able to do that in an environment uh, like Berkshire and be able to uh, you know, learn by osmosis, by uh, being able to uh, compare notes with Warren. Uh, we get together for uh, lunch every uh, Monday, the, the three of us and Tracy, if she's in town, she'll join us. and. Uh, to compare notes on all sorts of things, uh, and it's mainly uh, you know Berkshire, Berkshire culture and uh, uh, things that have happened over the Warren's investing life. It's, it's very special. I, you know, I, I first was uh, introduced to uh, uh, Warren, not physically, but uh, through a friend of mine in 1979 who said, "There's this guy who." out in Omaha that when he writes, you really should read what he writes because it's, it's got a certain clarity to it. And uh, I started reading it and it was, uh, I've read uh, over the years just about everything I think Warren put out there. And uh, to have that as a backdrop and then come into the organization and be able to interact on a regular basis 
it's terrific. And Ted, I know that you met Warren through a charity yes. lunch. Yeah. And Todd, I, I wanna turn to you and ask you, how did you meet Warren and also what's it like working here? Well, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I echo everything Ted said. Um, I get asked a lot how my life has changed from before to after and absent moving to Omaha in terms of performing the investing function day to day, very little has actually changed, uh, except the removal of some friction uh, in terms of the fact that you don't have monthly reporting and LPs and we have the benefit of permanent capital and so forth. But I met Warren, to go back to your, the first part of your question, through Charlie. And I called Charlie up just randomly and I had always wanted to meet him. I had been out to a few meetings and uh, I called Charlie up and we hit it off. We had breakfast for three or four hours and, um, and luckily he called me a couple weeks later and we continued discussions and this kind of went back and forth for over the period of a couple months. So, so how do you guys work together? I mean, you have this Monday lunch. Do you divide up the stock market into specific sectors? I'll start yeah, with you, they, Warren. They've each got 10 million. They could put it in one stock. You know, they can, they can put it in one stock, they can put it in 10 stocks, they can put it in 100 stocks. They can, uh, there's a couple things you have to be careful. I, they, they, we wouldn't ever do anything in Microsoft because uh, Bill is on the board and it might look, no matter what, the, we, we wouldn't have inside information mm -hmm. if, we, if they were to buy something one day and something happened the next day, everybody would think we had it. So there's a few, very, very few. Uh, they, we wouldn't want to go over 10% on something that, that we already had it. But, but so there's a, maybe 10 stocks in total that are off limits or 20 or something, but they don't have to check with me before they buy or sell anything. Uh, sometimes they will have talked to me about something they're doing. Other times I will just look at the monthly recap I get and then see what they bought or sold. They, they, it's, it's entirely their decisions on, 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 on what they buy and sell. And diversification industries, there's no rules of any kind except avoid anything that there's a regulatory problem on. And what's your day like then? How, do you I get in around seven or eight, and I read until about seven or eight at night, and uh, I go home and uh, see my family, and then I'll read uh, for another hour or two uh, in bed at night. And, uh, you know, there might only be three to four phone calls the entire week, so there's very, very few interruptions. Uh, I have a great assistant who knows everything that I read, and she kind of provides everything, and there's a back and forth between us where I'll mark it up. And, uh, and give it back to her, and we have a system for filing and so forth. But it's literally just reading about 12 hours a day of everything I just uh, mentioned. Charlie describes himself as a book with legs. Yeah. <laughs> and he, these, oh. these are the only two guys we could find that read as much as we did. <laughs> I, I, should, I should point out one advantage they have at Berkshire, uh, uh, of a very general sort, but we have you know dozens and dozens and dozens of businesses. And I've always said that that I'm a better investor because I've had experience in business and better businessman because I've had experience in investments. And Berkshire is about as good a place as you can find yeah. to really understand competitive dynamics and all that over the years. I like, always talk about you know learning to learn and being lifelong learners. And, and you know, that's something that impacted me because I started to read about that when I was in college. And you know, I looked at the last five years for me at Berkshire and they have been the steepest learning curve of my life. And that, that's pretty powerful to say when you're 50. So you talked about a, a planning and, and you said that these guys came in running two billion, now they run 10 plus billion. You, right. you run, I think I read 120. It's hard to tell. I mean, we've got 80 billion in treasury bills. That right. doesn't take a lot of running, but, right. <laughs> but, the, uh, but all the rest of the liquid assets are, are under my auspices, but you know, as it, I've turned over a fair, a fair amount, and and uh, do you have a plan, Warren? I mean, how does it work? I wouldn't have a formal plan, but I mean, it's it's, it's clear where we're going. Uh, 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 there's a lot of money to invest at Berkshire. We our number one hope is that we find operating businesses to invest in, but we'll always have a ton of marketable securities, and we'll probably have a fair amount of cash at all times too. Uh, uh, but ideally, we would have less cash than we have now because I'd rather own a business than own treasury bills. Do you ever have your eye on making Berkshire the number one company in the Fortune 500? Well, I think that- You're getting there. I, th I think over time, if we can find ways to reinvest all the earnings, uh, it, should, it should become that because we're reinvesting all the capital out. Whether we can do that intelligently at scale, 
for how long is, is an open question. I mean, the, the, the money belongs to the shareholders, and we should only keep it if we think we're turning a dollar into more than a dollar when we keep it. And, and that gets harder, a lot harder, as we get bigger, and our success will be less in the future in doing it than it has been in the past, for sure. Uh, but if we can keep finding things, uh, we'll keep generating cash to buy them. <laughs> I want to ask you guys about some specific stocks, if I can, because, you know, there was the big, high-profile Apple acquisition, and, you know, people are curious about who made that call. Does anyone want to take credit for that success? <laughs> and usually there's a... We, we like to keep people guessing on that stuff. <laughs> there's, there's no... Going back to my point about uh, the advantages of not running a fund and constantly reporting and dealing mm -hmm. with... I never like talking to my LPs about ideas that no. I had, and I think you guys are both the same, because then you, you become somewhat wed to it. It's harder to change your mind over time. Uh, you become pre-committed to your positions and so forth. So that's always been my stance. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, why wouldn't you want to talk about stocks that you specifically picked? And or, or so is it just because you want to keep this kind of a, well, it is. a team I think thing? The point that Todd had is really important, that if you speak up and put it on record, you end up getting too wedded to your, your thesis. You know, you, and, and that's dangerous because everything you're invested in is a function of the facts and circumstances on a given day. It and changes. And we'll ask about it later on. You know, and, and we're, not, we, we're not giving investment advice to people. And we, we don't want to recommend, we don't want to be talking about X where one way or another you get a slant on it by the time the interview is done. And have somebody, you know, we, we, could, we, could, we could change our mind next week or a month later. And somebody's out there that thinks we're giving investment advice to them. It's just, it's, it's, it doesn't make any sense. We will likely be hearing from those guys for many years to come. Over my shoulder, Jen is with <laughs> folks at one of the most popular exhibits here today, Dairy Queen. Jen. Hi there, Andy. Yeah, I know that you drew the short stick, and <laughs> I got to come to Dairy Queen, saving the best for last year. I'm joined by John Gaynor. He is CEO of Dairy Queen. So uh, let's just start with Warren comes in here and he gets one of these in the morning. What does he get? Well, Warren comes in in the morning, he gets the vanilla orange bar. And he's been doing that every year that I've ever been here. So a lot of people come up to the booth and they say, well, I want what Warren eats. So we bring a lot of vanilla orange bars down. But in my hand, I have a special treat for you. Yes, what is this? This does not look as, and I, I don't know if it's fair to call the vanilla orange bar healthy, which I, I, I think it is moderately. What is this one? Because well, this looks delicious. This is our blizzard of the month. And we have a tie-in with Marvel Guardians of the Galaxy. And this is our awesome mix blizzard. So, what is in the awesome mix blizzard? Well, I'm glad you asked, OK? It has a brookie piece which we are calling a Berkey piece for the weekend, okay? But you know, it's cookies and brownies, caramel topping, and choco trunk. And the blizzard is the only treat that you can serve upside down. Wow, you have to keep that in the freezer. I actually didn't know, that. I'm glad it stayed in. That's what's actually happened with my Jello that I made, the Jello from the Kraft Heinz guys. I don't know if you well, went over there. You know, I can't get them out either. I would rather have this in Jello. And, you know, we're in 27 countries, and the Blizzard brand alone now is over a billion-dollar brand. Hey, what is it like to work with Warren Buffett? How much communication do you actually have with him? Well, as you hear, Warren really allows us to run our businesses. And I remember the first time I met Warren, he said, use me however you need. So if you need to call Warren or write Warren, he gets back to you immediately. I mean, it's truly amazing. But what you hear at the meeting is he really entrusts us to run our brand, and he really tells us our job is to protect the Dairy Queen brand, in my case, and to protect the Berkshire Hathaway brand. Can you give us any sneak peek? What's the next blizzard of the month? Well, I'll tell you, one of my favorite coming up is we have a triple truffle blizzard. Right. But, you know, at DQ, we have great food as well. And last month, we launched our five buck lunch all day. So it's been, our fans love our five buck lunch. It's an entree, fries, drink, and a DQ Sunday. And for one dollar extra, you can upgrade to a small blizzard. So it's not all about ice cream at Dairy Queen. It's also food, beverages, and cakes. 
$5 lunch. All right, well, right now I'm going to eat my $1 vanilla and uh, orange bar, just like Warren. Andy, back to you. You know, you better bring some of those up here when you come back up, okay? <laughs> It's going to be melted. Uh, all right, we'll figure we it out. We'll let you have any. All right, Jen, thanks. I'm joined by founder and former CEO of Vanguard, another very legendary investor, Jack Bogle. Jack, great to see you. Andy, good to be with you again, always. And what an incredible shout-out you got this morning from Warren Buffett. H how did that make you feel? <laughs> well, it was, to me, much more than a shout-out. I mean, it was a couple of pretty nice paragraphs. And it made me feel, I mean, I'm just a human being, Andy. It made me feel absolutely wonderful for a man like that to recognize it, recognize what I've done. And he's been a great booster of our 500 index fund. He's been a great booster of our my books, which is always nice at the box office there. And uh, we, we know each other a little bit. We met, we first met actually at the time of the uh, Solomon Brothers, uh, which uh, the c catastrophe they went into back in around 1985. We were both speaking out in the West Coast. And that was the first time I met him in San Diego. And we've had a nice, very nice relationship ever since. So praise from the master, calls me a hero, wants to build a statue for me. All nice. I mean, it's embarrassing, but it's nice. <laughs> Do you feel somewhat vindicated, Jack, after all these years of preaching this and seems like the world's coming around to you? Well, I guess vindication is a good word for it. I never sought vindication because I knew I was right. You know, the index fund delivers your fair share of the market return to investors. And I mean, I'm, I'm gonna guess that 300 people around here today have thanked me already. And only 299 of them wanted a, a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, what happens when the whole investing world becomes an index? Can, can there be too much indexing and what would that do to returns? Well, in number one, if everybody indexed, the only word you could use is chaos, catastrophe, whatever. There would be no trading. There'd be no way to convert a stream of income into a, a pile of capital or a pile of capital into a stream of income. The markets would fail. Now, what's the chance of everybody indexing? It's zero. And at what point then, maybe is a more realistic question, indexing is around 23 or 4% of U.S. stock market today. Uh, could it get to 50% without having any uh, bad, bad consequences? Easily. We have too much trading in the market. The index really just neutralizes X percentage of the market, 25% or 50%, and it's just those stocks don't get traded. So the other stocks would be traded, and the market would go on as ever, and uh, might get a little less efficient. But if it gets a little less efficient, and some managers can win by more, some managers will lose by more. This is the equation. <laughs> so I don't, I'm not concerned about it. It's going to take a long, long time to get anywhere near 50%. And uh, things will change a lot in a lot of other ways by then. Do you have any idea what percent uh, it becomes dangerous? And I, I, I think you could easily be at 75% and not have it become dangerous. But dangerous in what sense? Uh, you know, the markets are going to be efficient as long as they're you know, managers or investors who are trying to find little holes in the system and create value, discover value, price discovery, as they call it. And so I, I don't worry about that. And uh, I meant not to be too negative about it, but it's certainly not going to happen during my lifetime. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you about systemic risk, which we discovered um, can be a huge problem um, in 2008, 2009. Is there a potential for a systemic risk in investment companies, in big fund companies? Well, not as long as the markets function. The markets are great arbitrageurs of the past and the present and the future. And when they do that, the stock market responds very, very quickly. And the, the market clears, as they say. It may clear at substantially lower prices. And uh, you know, if it's an, an interim thing or a rumor, it will bounce back to a fair relationship between price and value. I do have a concern about liquidity in the municipal bond fund market, Big, very big part of the, particularly Vanguard business, but also the fund business. And the bond market doesn't have that kind of liquidity, but in the stock market, where most of the problems are apt to come from, is I think going to clear very quickly. What about ETFs, Jack? I mean, are there too many of them? It seems like they're so specialized, they kind of defeat the purpose of what they were created for. I couldn't have said it better myself. All right, you wax on it. You're, you're the expert. Uh, the, the reality is there are too many. They're too narrowly diversified. They're too speculative. And they're traded far, far, far too often. The Standard & Poor's Spider, so-called, 
S&P 500 ETF is the most widely traded stock in the world every day. It turns over at 6,000% a year, Andy. And for me, conservative investor, I think 3% turnover is kind of pushing the envelope a little bit. So what about mutual funds versus ETFs? Where do you come out on that? Which one's better? Well, we have, I have three categories. One is index funds, which are divided into two categories. Traditional index funds, like that S&P 500 fund that I started back in 1975. Which has how much money in it now? Well, all our index funds together have around $3 trillion. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're, they're designed to be bought and held forever, the right. traditional index fund. I call them TIFs. The ETFs is the second component that makes up the index funds, and they, that's where the big trading is. And it's amazing in the, uh, in the market decline, Andy, of, uh, if from, I guess, the, the 2007 high to the 2007 low, 2009 low, money came in, ca positive cash flow for the traditional index funds every single month. And the, the ETFs, 40 billion out that month, 40 billion in that month. I mean, it's, it's just incredible. And uh, so it's, it, it, the idea is to buy and hold American business forever. And gambling is trading back and forth, buying triple leverage, which you can do with an ETF, and betting whether the market's going up or down. These things are rank speculations. They just make no sense for investing. So, uh, and the remainder of the fund market, which is about... Uh, two-thirds of the mutual fund market, are actively managed funds, and they're struggling. Uh, you know, Vanguard alone, in the last 15 months, has taken in, I think it's $400 billion, and the whole mutual fund industry has taken in 350, counting us. So the rest of the industry has lost $50 billion in that period. They're not happy about it. Active managers are not happy, but they don't know what to do. They can't <laughs> tell their managers, go, go perform better, because in the long run, as a group, they're average before cost, and they're below average after cost. All this is so simple, but I wonder how it could possibly have taken all those years until 1975 to start the index fund, and why nobody else started one. <laughs> right. All right, Jack Bogle, thank you for that very insightful perspective. Good to see you. <laughs> it's great to be with you, Andy. It wouldn't be a Berkshire Hathaway annual meeting without the tens of thousands of people who descend on Omaha every year. Jen spoke to a few of them. So what time did you get here? We got here at 5.30. We got here at 5.30. 3.30. Didn't have to pull the shades because it was definitely dark already. 3 a.m. Yeah. And is this your pizza? Yeah. And we spent 15 hours from Hong Kong to Chicago and another seven hours to uh, take a bus from Chicago to here. Now, are you awake or are you asleep? Yeah, yeah a little bit sleepy. Yeah. So I'm here to get a good seat. I figured if I'm doing this, I'm doing it. Is that what everybody wants, is a seat down low? Yeah. So we, we came here at, at about 1 o'clock in the morning. Wait, you got here at 1? Yeah. You know, if I'm going to make a 10-hour trip, I want to make sure I get a good seat. Right, you guys did a very good job getting early. The only thing is you are very close to the garbage can. We have a straight shot all the way in the back right at them. I don't know why we get the worst seats in the house, but we do and we love them. You know, I want to make sure I can see their faces. Why? So you can like look them in the eye while they're speaking? Uh, yeah, get some tunnel vision like that. So what do you want to hear Buffett say? I think uh, the transition from uh, his IBM sale to uh, the new Apple's purchases, I think that, that'll be interesting. Well, I want to hear about uh, 2016, his new purchases, Duracell, how that fits into the portfolio. It'll be interesting to hear Warren spin on Trump this year. An instruction to us about investment or about life. So I don't know what I want to hear, but I know I want to hear it. And I hope I get one great takeaway um, that I can use to make some money. All right, you go. All right, Berkshire is all about great brands. And one of the most successful brands here today is not a company or a conglomerate. It's actually a person. And she is having her beautiful headset put on right now. I thought that I looked OK in a headset, but get ready. We are delighted to have with us actress, hey. model, author, entrepreneur, a brown Andy, powerhouse, and mother of three, Kathy Ireland. Hello. I'm sorry that I am still eating my Dairy Queen from my last interview. No, but it's I understand. it's lovely to see you. How <laughs> well, is thank your- Thank you so much. Thank how, you for those kind words. Uh, how has uh, your annual meeting been so far? It's been fantastic. You started off with the paper toss, and I have to say, after many years of hard work and practicing, 
the fiercest competitor of all, Mr. Buffett. I believe we tied. Ooh. And that, I mean, that just brought me into a happy dance. I felt like Ginger Rogers to his Fred Astaire. I've always dreamed of dancing with Mr. Buffett, and it was fun. I bet he liked that. Hey, Kathy, let me ask you, how did you first become connected to Warren Buffett? Irv Blumpkin, the Blumpkin family, Nebraska Furniture Mart, they were our first retail partner in the home industry. Uh, our first flooring partner was part of Berkshire Hathaway. Today we're with Norison. We're with a wonderful company, Larson Jewel, Kathy Ireland Home by Larson Jewel for Art, a Berkshire Hathaway company. And it's, it's, it's a phenomenal organization. Does this change to you every year or does it feel the same? I know this year you got to actually dance with Warren, but Andy and I have been talking about sort of all the right. rituals mm -hmm. and the repetitiveness of it, but there is something a little bit different every year, right? Every year I, I notice more excitement, more and more people. I mean, this year it feels like it's just grown phenomenally. Something that is consistent that I love. My favorite part of this, I love the movie that Mr. Buffett does every year. My favorite part is Solomon Brothers, where he shares. It is such an important message to everyone. Lose money for us, I'll be understanding. You mess with one shred of our reputation, I will be ruthless. That's a powerful lesson for everyone. And it, it makes me think of Mrs. B, Rose Blumkin, who... 80 years ago, founded the Nebraska Furniture Mart. Today, it's the crown jewel of Berkshire Hathaway. And uh, happy 80th birthday to Nebraska Furniture Mart, and here's to another 80 years. All right, Kathy, thank you so much for coming by. Have a great annual meeting, Kathy Ireland. Thank you. Great thank to you. Keep see working you. on your paper toss. Right. No, Next I'm year, it might not be a tie. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. All right, Glenn Close and Warren Buffett are also great friends, and I recently caught up with Glenn Close in character playing Norma Desmond on Broadway. Take a look. I'm here with the greatest star in the world, the fabulous Norma Desmond. Hello. So, Ms. Desmond. Yes. Um, we'd love to talk. Excuse me. Get that thing away from me. <laughs> We're here to talk about your dear friend, Warren Buffett. Yes. And I'm curious, and we all are, how did you first get to know Warren? That's a lovely story, actually. We found ourselves in Omaha. Stopped to try to find something to eat. And while we were waiting at the side of the road, uh, this adorable little boy came up to the car. He must have been, oh, seven or eight. He had a little bucket full of soapy water and a sponge and this crispy towel. And he asked if he could wash our windshield. And I said, well, that would be a lovely idea. It was quite dusty. And I said, what is your name? And he said, Warren Buffett. And I said, well, Warren, go right ahead. I'll smoke a cigarette. You wash the windshield. He did a beautiful job. After which I pulled out a very crispy new dollar bill and I gave it to him. And I said, now, Warren, what are you going to do with that dollar bill? And he said, I'm going to go to the nearest candy store and I'm going to buy up all the Tootsie Pops, which I will then resell to my friends at school. And I said, no, Warren, no, 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 come here, come here. Warren, invest. It came from you. Now that is some story for a number of reasons. Very interesting. Warren. Interesting, isn't yes, it? Yes, indeed. Yes. Warren Buffett, your friend, likes to go on television. Do you like to go on television? No. Just no? No. It's that small? No. OK. All right. Um, just one more question, Norman. Thank you so much for your time. Warren Buffett, as you may know, has announced he's going to be giving all of his money away at some point to the giving pledge. And you, obviously, are so wealthy. Have you given any thought about what you might do with it someday, Ms. Desmond? Well, Warren will live on by giving his magnificent fortune to charity. I will live on by never dying. Wow. We really you are a lovely it. man. I will. Yes. Thank you. You have yeah. a lovely head. Thank you very much for that. Um, and you're ready for your close-up? I am always ready for my close-up.
I have to tell you, that was hysterical. She was so great. I mean, of course, this is completely in character, Glenn Close playing Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard, now on Broadway. The Berkshire meeting is due to resume soon. Um, Jan, it was an interesting morning we heard about tech stocks, we heard about driverless cars. What stood out for you? You know, at the end, just, I, I know they've done it before, but when they really go after uh, hedge fund managers mm. and also going after the compensation consultants, so interesting to me uh, when they go on, uh, Charlie Munger especially, going on those rants. So I, I love that, but just really the, the honesty, the stuff about the reputation when they were talking about Wells Fargo, I thought uh, that really resonated among the crowd that I was sitting with this morning, as well as when they talked about those um, investments they missed, Google and Walmart. Now, you remember yesterday that I told you that the first question Carol Loomis was going to ask was what she thought was the toughest issue, and that was Wells Fargo, remember? And they did address that head on. And uh, it was very interesting also, we had Ron Olson, the Berkshire director, talking about how that question escalated to the board level mm -hmm. at Berkshire Hathaway and listened to him talk a little bit about it and saying how he was personally involved in that discussion, being a lawyer and being in California. So I thought that, I agree with you, I thought that was really interesting. And about that it, it really, it becomes a much bigger problem when it gets to the CEO and then nothing happens. And Warren Buffett talking about that, you know, look, when it, if it, something comes to me, you have to deal with it. He talked about that at Wells and talked about what that meant at Solomon. Just sort of the position of when you're the CEO, the buck stops with you. And Olson also said it reminded him and, and Buffett both of Solomon Brothers and the problems they had back with that company. Driverless cars was interesting to me because he talked about how that was a threat to two of Berkshire's businesses. And I hadn't really thought about this. Number one, Geico, the auto insurance mm -hmm. business, because presumably that will revolutionize insurance rates right. for autos. And then also driverless trucks and the impact that that would have on uh, the trucking, uh, on the, excuse me, on the railroad business mm -hmm. of Berkshire. And so I, I, I kind of was very interested in that as well. Yeah, and it's a risk for both of those areas. Although I was thinking maybe it could be good for Apple, but not as big of an investment. Uh, but we do see Apple playing in that space. Uh, China being possibly a, a less uh, expensive market than the U.S., Charlie Munger saying that. Did that surprise you at all, especially given what we have uh, been talking about on the Shanghai Stock Exchange recently? Well, you know, I mean, maybe to finish Charlie's point, which is extremely presumptuous and don't listen to a word no, I say. No, you totally but can. Hi higher risk, higher return, you know, and, and, you know, I think that's the opportunity. You get in at the wrong time and try to time that, um, you're going to be in, a, you know, you can get really hurt. I think it's also interesting to point out the presence of Chinese investors here. You heard a number of Chinese investors asking questions. There are, I don't know if it's thousands, there's certainly hundreds of Chinese people here. They've, they're coming in groups. Um, we just saw a group uh, of them. There's a room adjacent here, and you can see right in here. Now, yep. look at this. These are uh, all manner of Chinese investors who are watching the meeting, and, and we can toot our own horn here. They're listening to our Mandarin translation mm -hmm. of the stream. and. You know, Warren Buffett, there's something about him that really resonates um, with Chinese uh, people and with Chinese investors. My um, Coke can. Well, we one saw of it that is Coke can. The Coke can by the cherry Coke. I mean, I think that one of it, it, it is the honesty, and it's very refreshing coming from both the of them. Coke I or think, the, well, no, right. not the Coke, <laughs> uh, Warren Buffett. Right. And his story of what he's been able to do, and I think that that really resonates. You know, I also want to sort of talk a little bit about what's going on here in this hall with all these exhibits and the people here. And, you know, it struck me, and I was talking to um, the owner of Gratz, which is the steakhouse that right. Warren Buffett goes to, and he told me, you know, it's not unlike an, a conference where, you know, yeah, you go and listen to the presentations. And he said, you know, honestly, to me, you know, some of this can go on and on. But out here, you know, people come to get dilly bars at the Dairy Queen exhibit. They come to schmooze, bump into people, see old friends. And just like a conference when a lot of the action mm -hmm. is out in the exhibit hall, you know, there is the same sort of feeling here. And, you know, we talked about um, the fact that the stream and people may want to stay at home instead. But, you know, from everything I've heard, you know, it hasn't hurt that at all. And, and the guy, 
the, the owner of Garatz told me that, you know, he, he's had his busiest week ever. Well, having just recently been on the floor, I can tell you it is uh, not empty at all. We had to fight our way through the crowd trying to get from Brooks over to Dairy Queen. One other thing that stood out to me uh, was when they talked about Amazon and Jeff Bezos. Yes. Uh, that CEO coming up with such uh, high praise for him and another company that they, they didn't get in on. Yeah, you know, it was interesting, right, and I love that point that Charlie Munger made where he said, we failed you, we failed Berkshire shareholders by not getting into Google because we saw it because Geico was using Google early on and we said, wow, this is an incredible business. Well, the next step, particularly if you're Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett is to say, we better invest in that company. Mm -hmm. And they said the same thing to your point, Jen, about Amazon, we kind of missed that. It's sitting right there in front of you and it was sort of a, a strange compliment. I, I, I forget who they attributed to, but they said if you had one bullet to shoot one competitor in the head, a lot of people would say it would be Jeff Bezos at Amazon. Now, no threats here, Jeff, at all. It's just, yeah. it's, a, it's a metaphor, and, and, and I'm sure he understands that, but you know, he has built a juggernaut of a business with Amazon that competes in a, a number of business lines and getting bigger. Do you think there'll be more uh, talk or questions about what exactly they do with the cash that they have sitting around? Yes, I, I do, and you know that actually pertains to uh, a very uh, another very interesting point that um, they talked about, which is taxes mm -hmm. and the new administration. And they say that they have this um, uh, deferred cash as well, a deferred amount of money, and and the the tax rate on that actually has huge implications that if there's a big tax cut, mm -hmm. um, that is worth a lot more. And then of course, you know, if uh, another administration comes in, you know, wow, it's three and a half years later now all of a sudden, um, it could change back again. So the uncertainty there is a real issue. But you know, it, it's interesting, when I hear executives complaining about this, Jen, you know, I like to say that Tax rates are always changing. Right, that is true. Uh, while we are talking about this, I just want to let you know that we are waiting for the Q&A to resume upstairs in the arena. People uh, taking their seats up there. The journalists are in place, but we are still waiting for Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger themselves to get there. And we will take you to that as soon as it starts. I think when they were talking about the tax rates, uh, Charlie Munger used the word jiggle that he wouldn't do, he would, he wouldn't change anything because of a tax jiggle, or I wouldn't I don't know. jiggle I, anything I don't see about. Charlie jiggling that much. I, I saw your Jello the, jiggling. Oh, whoa, well, we haven't even eaten my Jello, jello, jello Andy. No. I, I agree I've with been, the DQ guy. I'm, I'm more of a DQ than I've a, a I've been jello having person. so much stuff. It's crazy, but I haven't had the Jello yet. Uh, that's that's next on my list. You know, uh, another thing, just uh, it just things kind of occurring to me here that um, I really was really um, interested in was when Warren Buffett starts talking about railroad statistics. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why, because that just speaks to the very core of Warren Buffett. He gets these weekly reports from his managers and, and you know, he just goes through them line by line. So it's like freight in Western states. And he, he soaks that up like a sponge. He loves it. He's passionate about it. And he was just, you know, citing that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, you know, there are very few people who right can do up. that. No, it's incredibly impressive that they can sit up there and answer all these questions uh, coming out. Some questions, you know, they, they don't know what's coming from the audience, as you could see by the one that they had. Uh, from There's the railroad right there, by the way. Where, the oh, NSF. yeah, there you go. Mm -hmm. From the uh, the German woman on the environment and Coke. I was in the room for that. She got, kind of got booed, and they tried politely clapping, and then she got booed off of uh, there. But, yeah, they, I mean, they are really rolling with it. I, one thing, we see a lot of families out here and we talked about how it's this ritual. It's also the ritual for the CEOs because they don't come and see Warren all the time. They're not constantly talking to him. Uh, Warren Buffett talked about this a lot upstairs, just how much of a you know, runway he gives these companies to be sort of by themselves. So when they come here, it's also sort of special for them to get to talk to the other CEOs. This is when they get to see them. Yeah, and customers. And, you know, it, it, again, it's just such a singular thing. I, you know, it's funny because I was thinking about this earlier and I, we mentioned Jeff Bezos and there's not a lot of CEOs who could do this. I mean, first of all, you need the wisdom, you need the charisma, you also need the portfolio of companies. Mm -hmm. But if there's one company that could possibly get close to this, it would be Amazon. And 
You know, it doesn't have the breadth of products, and they'd have to set up sort of a lot of exhibit booths that right. replicated digital businesses. But do you think people would like to hear Jeff Bezos talk for a few hours? I mean, they yeah. would. They, it doesn't have to be. Like it to doesn't have Jeff to be Bezos all day. Talk. But three hours and turning it into something more than a dull, dry thing. I think Jamie Dimon is another person mm -hmm. that people would listen to. And again, it would be impossible to replicate this. I mean, J.P. Morgan doesn't own Dairy Queen. That's, <laughs> That's they need problem. to invest That's in something like that, like a, some sort of ice cream company. Yeah. Uh, yeah, who else could do it? Uh, you know, the problem is, even just a CEO alone, even the most charismatic, the smartest CEO, you need Charlie Munger. He makes the whole thing you need, work. You need Charlie Munger. Yeah. You need your right. straight man. The guy well, that you can turn to and say, yeah. Charlie, do you have anything else to say? I mean, and Charlie's like, I think you covered it. We are standing by right now because it looks like uh, we are they are about to walk out again. This is a resumption of the Q&A portion of the annual meeting. Here they are. Panel all here. Okay, we're back for action. Uh, and we'll go right to Becky. All right, this question comes from Ann Newman. She says that she's a shareholder of the Class B stock, and her question is, the primary investment strategy of 3G Capital is extreme cost-cutting after the purchase of a company. This typically includes the elimination of thousands of jobs. With the current U.S. president focusing on retention of U.S. jobs, will Berkshire Hathaway still consider future investments in 3G Capital if those investments result in the purchase of U.S. companies and the elimination of more U.S. jobs? Now the essentially 3G management, and I've watched them up very close at Kraft Heinz, is basically they don't they they believe in having a company as productive as possible, and of course the gains in this world uh, for the people in this room and people in Omaha and the people throughout America have come through gains in productivity. If there had been no change in productivity, we would be living the same life as people lived in 1776. Now, the people, the, the 3G people, do it very fast, and they're very good at making a, a, a business productive with fewer people than operated before, but that they've been you know, we've been doing that in every industry, whether it's steel or cars or you name it, and that's why we live as well as we do. We prefer at Berkshire, I wrote about this a year ago, we prefer to buy companies that are already run efficiently, because frankly, we don't enjoy the process at all of getting more productive. I mean, it's, it's not pleasant, but it is what has enabled the country to progress, and nobody has figured out a way to double people's consumption per capita without in some way improving productivity per capita. Uh, it's a good question in the whether it's smart overall uh, if you think you're going to suffer politically because political consequences do hit businesses. So I don't know that I can answer the question categorically, but I can tell you that they not only focus on productivity and do it in a very intelligent way, but they also fo focus the, to a terrific degree on, on product improvement, innovation, and all of the other things that you want a, a management to focus on. And I hope that at the lunchtime, if you had the Kraft Heinz cheesecake, you'll agree with me that uh, product improvement and innovation there is, a, is just as much a part of the 3G playbook as productivity. Uh, I don't personally, we have been through the process of buying into a textile business that employed a couple thousand people and went out of business over a period of time or a department towards a business that was headed for oblivion. And it is just not as much fun to be in a business that cuts jobs rather than one that adds jobs. So Charlie and I would probably forego personally having Berkshire directly buy businesses where the main benefits were come, would come from increasing productivity by actually having uh, fewer workers. But I think, I think it's pro-social to, to think in terms of imp 
improving productivity, and I think the people of 3G do a very good job at that. Charlie? Well, I agree. I don't see anything wrong with increasing productivity. On the other hand, there's a lot of counterproductive publicity to doing it. Just because you're right doesn't mean you should always do it. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Jay? Berkshire's cash and treasury bill holdings are approaching $100 billion. Warren, a year ago, you said Berkshire might increase its minimum valuation for share buybacks above 1.2 times book value if this occurred. What are your latest thoughts on raising the share repurchase threshold? Yeah, the, when the time comes, and it could come reasonably soon, uh, even while I'm around, the, where we really don't think we can get the money out in a reasonable period of time into things we like, you know, we, we have to re-examine then wh what we do with those funds that, that we don't think can be deployed well. And, and at that time, it would make a decision, and you might, it might include both, but it could be repurchases, it could be dividends. It, uh, there are different uh, inferences that people draw from a dividend policy than from a repurchase policy that, in terms of ex expectations that you won't cut a dividend and that sort of thing. So you have to factor that all in. But if we really, if we felt that, that we had cash that was unlikely to be used, excess cash, in a reasonable period of time, and we thought repurchases at a price that was still attractive to continuing shareholders uh, was feasible in a, in, a, in a substantial sum, that, that, uh, that could make a lot of sense. Uh, at, at the moment, we're still optimistic enough about deploying the capital that, uh, that uh, we, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be inclined to move to a price much closer uh, where there's only a narrow spread between an intrinsic value and the, the repurchase price. But at a point, the burden of proof is definitely on us. I mean, that, uh, I, the last thing we like to do is own something at 100 times earnings where the earnings can't grow. I mean, we're, as you put, point out, we've got almost $100 billion, so 90 plus billion dollars invested in a business, we'll call it a business, where we're paying al almost 100 times earnings, and it's kind of a lousy business. It's more after after tax earnings. Yeah, so it, you know, we don't like that, and we shouldn't use your money that way for a long period of time. And then the question is, you know, are we going to uh, be able to deploy it? Uh, and I would say that history is on our side, but it'd be more fun if the phone would ring instead of just relying to, on history books. Uh, and, I, you know, I am sure that sometime in the next 10 years, and it could be next week or it could be nine years from now, there will be markets in which we can do intelligent things on a big scale. But. It would be no fun if that happens to be nine years off, and I don't think it will be, but, but just based on hum how humans behave and how governments behave and how the world behaves. But like I say, at a point, the burden of proof really shifts to us big time. And uh, uh, there's no way I can come back here three years from now and tell you that we hold $150 billion or so in cash or more, and we think we're doing something brilliant by doing it. Charlie? Well, I agree with you. The answer is maybe. <laughs> he does have a tendency to elaborate. <laughs> Station 11. Thank you, Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger. I am Anil Naran from Short Hills, New Jersey and New Delhi, India. This is my 18th time to this wonderful event and profoundly thank you for your extraordinary wisdom, generosity, and time. As I'm involved with sustainable investments that also do not directly harm animals, I would appreciate your perspective, if any, 
on the practices of your CTB subsidiary, which is somewhat involved in pig, poultry, and egg production, somewhat indirectly related as you shared your concern on nuclear war extensively at the last annual meeting, I would love to pick your brain on Albert Schweitzer's Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech shortly after the first nuclear bombs were detonated, that compassion can attain its full breadth and depth if it is not limited to humans only. Thank you. Well, that's a pretty broad question. I would say on your first point, we have a subsidiary, CTB, run by Vic Mancinelli. And I, I sit down with him uh, once a year, and he, he's, he's a terrific manager. He's one of our very best. You, you don't hear much about him. Uh, and they do make the equipment uh, for poultry growers. Uh, and I would, uh, I can't answer your question specifically, but I would be glad to have you get in contact with Vic directly because I know that what you, question you raised is a, it's, it's a major factor in what they do. I mean, they, they, they do care about uh, uh, how, uh, how the equipment is used in terms of, of uh, poultry and egg production. And, and as you know, uh, a number of the, the largest purchasers and the largest producers are also in the same camp. But I, I, I can't tell you enough about it directly that I can give you a specific answer, but I, I can certainly put you in touch with Vic, and I think you would find him uh, extremely well-informed and doing some very good things in the area that you're talking about. In terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, the nuclear weapon question, uh, uh, I'm very pessimistic on weapons of mass destruction generally, although I don't think that nuclear probably is quite as likely as, as uh, um, either biological, primarily biological, maybe, and, and maybe cyber. I don't know that much about cyber, but I do think that's the number one problem of mankind. But I don't think I can say anything particularly constructive on it. Now, Charlie? Well, I don't think we mind killing chickens. And I, and I do think we're against nuclear war, so. <laughs> yeah. We are not actually a poultry producer, but we do, we do, uh, uh, they use our equipment. And, and uh, uh, that equipment has been changed substantially in the last 10 or 15 years. But again, I'm just not, I'm not that good on the specifics that I can give them to you, but I can certainly put you in touch with Vic. Andrew? Warren, since Todd and Ted joined Berkshire, the market cap of the company has doubled and cash on, cash on hand is now nearly $100 billion. It doesn't look like Todd and Ted have been allocated new capital on the same relative basis. Why? Well, actually, I would say they have been. Uh, I think we started out with $2 billion. Uh, I could be wrong, but my, my memory was $2 billion with uh, with Todd when he came with us, and uh, so there have been substantial ad additions, and of course, their own capital has grown just because, you can say in a sense, they retain their own earnings. So, um, yeah, they are managing a proportion of Berkshire's capital, or and or uh, also measured by marketable securities. I think they're managing a proportion that's, that's pretty similar, maybe even a little higher than when each one of them entered, and Ted entered a year or two after after Todd. Uh, um, you know, they, I think they would agree that it's tougher to run 10 billion than it is to run one or two billion. I mean, it, it, your expectable returns go down as you get into larger sums, but the decision to bring them on uh, has been terrific. I mean, they have they've done a good job of managing marketable securities. They, they made more money than I would have made with that same what is now $20 billion, but originally was $2 billion. Uh, and they've been of terrific help 
in a variety of ways uh, beyond just money management. So that decision, I'll, you know, uh, that's been a very, very good decision. And, and they are, they're smart, they're good at, they have money minds, they are good specifically at investment management, but they're absolutely first class human beings and they really fit, fit Berkshire. So that was, uh, Charlie gets uh, credit for, for uh, Todd. He met Charlie first and, and I'll claim credit for Ted and I think we both feel very good about the decisions. Charlie? Well, I think the shareholders are very lucky to have them because they both think like shareholders. Totally. After all, it came up that way and that is not the normal way headquarters employees think. Uh, it's a pretense that everybody takes on, but the reality is, is different. And these people really deeply think like shareholders, and they're young and smart and constructive, so we're all very lucky to have them around. Yeah, their mindset is 100 percent, what can I do for Berkshire, not what can Berkshire do for me? And believe me, you can spot that over time with people. And, and, uh, and on top of that, you know, they're very talented, but, but uh, you know, it's, it's hard to find people young, ambitious, uh, very smart, uh, that don't put themselves first. And uh, I would, every experience we've had, they do not put themselves first, they put Berkshire first. And believe me, I can spot it. Uh, when people are extreme in one direction or other. Maybe I'm not so good around the middle, but, but uh, you've got, you couldn't have two better uh, people in those positions. But you can say, well, why don't you give them another 30 billion each or something? I don't think that would, I don't think that would improve their lives or their performance. They, they'll, they may be handling more as they go along, but the truth is I'm, I've got more assigned to me than I can handle at the present time as proven by the fact that We've got this 90 billion plus around. I think there are reasonable prospects for using it, but if you told me I had to put it to work today, I would not like the prospect. Charlie? Well, I certainly agree with that. It's a lot harder now than it was at times in the past. Greg. Warren. Warren, plans for your ownership stake, which is heavily concentrated in Class A shares, are fairly well known. With the bulk of the stock going to the Bill, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and four different family charities over time, your annual pledges to these different charities involve the conversion of Class A shares, which hold significantly greater voting rights than the Class B shares. As such, the voting control held by your estate will diminish over time, with a whole layer of super voting shares being eliminated in the process. While the voting influence of Class B shareholders are expected to increase over time, it will not be large enough to have a big influence on Berkshire's affairs. With that in mind, and recognizing the great importance on having Berkshire buy back and retire Class A shares in the long run, I was just wondering if the firm has compiled a pipeline of potential future sellers from the ranks of the company's existing shareholders. Given the limited amount of liquidity for the shares, privately negotiated transactions with these sellers, like the one you negotiated in December 2012, would end up being in the best interest of both parties. Well, again, it would depend on the price <clears throat> of Berkshire. So. Uh, in terms of what I give away annually, you know, it's uh, the last two years it's been about 2.8 billion per year. Uh, that can be, uh, you know, that's one day's uh, trading in 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 Apple. I mean, it, it, the amount I'm giving away is in, in, in terms of in terms of Berkshire's. Market cap. I mean, it, you know, you're down to uh, uh, seven tenths of one percent of the market cap. So it's not a big market factor, and I, and it's really really wouldn't be that illiquid. So I know of a few big holders that you know might have eight or ten thousand shares of A, but but the market can handle it. Now, when we bought that block of, I think it was twelve thousand shares of A. I mean, we bought it because we thought it increased the intrinsic business value of. Of, of Berkshire by a significant amount, and we paid the seller what the market was at the time. 
And, you know, we are open to that up to 120 percent, and who knows if it came along at the time and it was 124 percent or something, it was a very large block, and the directors decided that 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 was okay, it still was a significant discount, we might very well buy it. But in terms of the orderly flow of the market or anything like that, there, there will be no problems, uh, just as there haven't been, you know, when I've given away, I do it every July, when I've given away the last two years, uh, some of the foundations may keep it for a while, but they have to spend what I give them. And they may build up a, a position in B for, you know, a, a a fairly significant dollar amount, but, but they're going to sell it. And it is true that for a period after I die, there will be a lot of votes still uh, in the estate and later in a trust. But, uh, you know, that will get reduced over time. I see no problem with our capitalization over time. You know, I like the idea of a fair number of votes being concentrated with people that believe in the culture strongly and, and uh, you know, would not be thinking about whether they get a 20 percent jump in the stock if somebody came along with some particular plan. But eventually that's going to get diminished. It continues to get diminished. And I think in terms of, you know, there's a very good market in Berkshire shares. And if we can buy them at a discount from intrinsic business, business value and somebody offers them some, a big piece and, and it, it may be at 100 stock may be selling at 122 percent, 124 percent. You know, I would pick up the phone and, and call the directors and see if they didn't want to make a change. And we did it once before. And uh, if it made sense, I'm sure they'd say yes. And if it didn't make sense, I'm sure they'd say no. So uh, I don't think we have any problem in terms of blocks of stock or anything. I don't think people that own it have a problem selling it. And I don't think we have a problem in terms of evaluating the desirability of repurchasing it. Charlie? Nothing to add. Okay. Station one. Hello, my name is Erin Beyer, and I was born and raised in Pasadena, California, and I currently live in New York City. It's been a dream of mine to come here today. I've been a proud beer shareholder for almost 20 years. Um, I asked my dad for stock for Christmas when I was 15. And I kept thinking at the opportunity to ask you a question today that I should make it one that would change my life. Well, that question is, do you know any eligible bachelors living in the New York City area? <laughs> well, you certainly, you certainly have the approach toward life that Charlie and I would have. <laughs> <laughs> but the question that might make my Monday, uh, back in the office, uh, back in 2011, you purchased Bank of America preferred stock with a warrant. You had the opportunity at a later date to exercise and convert those into common shares. When you're looking at evaluating that decision uh, to exercise that position, which would increase all of our Berkshire holdings, or the value of the Berkshire holdings, um, what are you going to consider when you're, you're looking at that? Well, it's almost, well, if, if the price of the stock is above $7 a share, which seems quite likely, uh, whether we were going to keep it or not, it would still make sense for us to exercise the warrant uh, shortly before it expired, because it would be a valuable warrant, but it's only a valuable warrant if it's, if it's converted or if it's exercised and, and exchanged into common, and that warrant does expire. So it, it, uh, as I put in the annual report, our income from the investment would increase if the Bank of America ever got to where it was paying 11 cents a quarter. We get $300 million off the year off the preferred, and for us to use the preferred as, an, as payment in the exercise of the warrant, uh, we would need to, we would want to feel we were getting more than 300 million a year, by get, and and that would take 11 cents quarterly. They may or may not get to where they pay that amount before the warrant expires in 1921 or 2021. If we, if it does get to there, we'll exercise the warrant, and then instead of owning the the the, the five billion of preferred and the and the warrant, we'll have 700 plus million shares of, of common, then that becomes a separate decision. Do we want to keep the 700 million shares of common? I, if it were to happen today, I would definitely 
want to keep the stock. Now, who knows what other alternatives may be available in 2021, or, but as of today, uh, if our warrant were expiring tomorrow, we would use the preferred to buy 700 million plus shares of common, and we would keep the common. If they get to 11 cents quarterly dividend, we'll convert it and we'll very likely keep the common. And if we get to 2021, if the common's above $7, which I would certainly anticipate, we will exercise. Uh, so that's all I can tell you on that, but I certainly wish you success on your other objective. Uh, <laughs> and I think probably the fellow will be using very good judgment, too. Okay, Charlie. Well, I think it's a very wise thing for a woman that owns Berkshire stock and is a good-looking woman to put her picture up like that. It does give me a thought, though. We might, um, we might actually start selling ads in the annual report. And, and <laughs> Okay, that incident, that BFA purchase, it literally was true that I was sitting in the bathtub when I got the idea of checking with the BFA whether they'd be interested in that preferred. But I've spent a lot of time in the bathtub since and nothing's come to me, so <laughs> it, it, clearly <laughs> I either need a new bathtub or we got to get in a different kind of market. Carol? <laughs> Now, this is a question from uh, George Benaroya, and it adds a layer to the discussion about 3G a little bit ago. Uh, he says, I am a very happy long-term shareholder, but this is a concern I have regarding Berkshire Hathaway's Kraft Heinz investment. This investment has done well in economic terms. The carrying value is $15 billion, and the market value was $28 billion in 2016. But the DNA of 3G is quite different from ours. We do not make money by buying companies and firing people. 3G, 3G fired 2,500 employees at Kraft Heinz. That is what private equity firms do, but we are not a private equity firm. Our values have worked, have worked for us for over 50 years. There is a risk that as 3G continues to deviate from our principles, they will eventually harm both our value and our values. How do we prevent that from happening? Well, it's interesting. I, I mentioned earlier that it was very gradual, but it would have been probably a better decision. Uh, we fired 2,000 people over time, and, and some retired and left and all of that, but, but at, at the textile operation. you know, it. it it, it didn't work. And at uh, Hoshul Cohn, the successor, we fortunately sold it to somebody else, but eventually they, they closed up the department stores because department stores, uh, at least that particular one, and a good many actually, including our competitors in Baltimore, could not make it work. Walmart came along with something, and now Amazon's coming along with something that changed the way people bought things. You, you, we mentioned our poultry, the CTB, which is a lot of different farm equipment. The farm equipment often that CTB develops, the idea is that it's more productive than what already is out there, which means fewer people are employed on farms. We had 80% of the American public uh, population, working population, working on farms a couple of hundred years ago. And if nobody had come up with things to make it more productive, farming, we'd have 80% of people working on farms now to uh, feed our populace, and we, it means that we'd be leaving a, living in a far, far more primitive way. So there, you know, if you look at the auto industry, it gets more productive. If you look at, if you look at any industry, they're trying to get more productive. Uh, Walmart was more productive than department stores, and uh, that will continue in America, and it better continue, or we won't live in, our kids won't live any better than we do. Our kids will live better than we do because America does get more productive as it goes along, and people do come up with better ways of doing things. The, uh, when Kraft Heinz finds that they can do uh, whatever amount of business, $27 billion worth of business or something, 
and they can do it with fewer people, they are doing what, what American business has done for a couple hundred years and why we live so well, but they do it very fast. They are, they are more than fair in terms of severance pay and all of that sort of thing, but they don't want to have two people doing the job that one can do. And I frankly don't like going through that, having, having faced that. I faced that down at Dempster in Beatrice, Nebraska, and it really needed change. But the change is painful for a lot of people, and you know, I just would rather spend my days not doing that sort of thing, having had one or two experiences. But I think that it's absolutely essential to America that we become more productive uh, because that is the only way we have more consumption per capita, is have more productivity per capita. Charlie? Well, I, you're absolutely right. We don't want to go back to subsistence farming. I had a week of that when I was young on a western Nebraska farm, and I hated it. <laughs> and, uh, and I don't miss the elevator operators who used to sit there all day in the elevator and run the little crank, you know. <laughs> So, on the other hand, it, as you say, it's terribly unpleasant for the people that have to go through it. And why would we want to get into a, the business of, of doing that over and over ourselves? We did it in the past when we had to, when the businesses were dying. I don't see any moral fault in 3G at all. But uh, I do see that there's some political reaction that doesn't do anybody any good. Milton Freeman, I think it was, used to talk about the time, probably apocryphal, he would talk about the huge construction project in some communist country, and they had thousands and thousands and thousands of workers out there with shovels digging away on this major project. And, and then they had a few of these big earth-moving machines behind, which were idle, and which could have done the work. And, one twentieth of the time of the workers. So the economist suggested to the, the local party worker, or whoever it was, that you know, why in the world didn't they use these machines to get the job done at one tenth or one twentieth the time instead of having all these workers out there with shovels? And the guy replied, well, yeah, but that would put the workers out of work. And Friedman said, well, then why don't you give them spoons to do it instead? You know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Jonathan? I understand that Berkshire is much more liquid than is ideal right now with 113 billion of consolidated cash and bonds versus policyholder float of 105 billion. But I have trouble calculating how much incremental buying power Berkshire has at any point in time. You've talked about having a minimum of 20 billion in cash on a consolidated basis. But for regulatory risk control or liquidity purposes, is there some minimum amount of float beyond the 20 billion that has to be in cash bonds or, say, preferred stocks? Or can all but 20 billion be put into co either common stocks or invested into wholly owned businesses if you found attractive opportunities? Yeah. What, what does the balance sheet look like if you were fully invested? And where does additional debt fit into the equation, if at all? Yeah. The, I wouldn't, I wouldn't conflate the cash and the bonds. I mean, when we talk about $20 billion of cash, we could own no bonds beyond that. Uh, 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 $20 billion would be the absolute minimum. It's a practical matter. I'm never, since I've said $20 billion is a minimum, I'm not, I'm not going to operate with $21 billion any more than I'm going to see a, on a highway a, a truck sign that says maximum load 30,000 pounds or something and then drive 29,800 across it. So we won't come that close. But the answer is that uh, a we could use we're not inclined to use debt. Obviously, we found something that really lit, the, lit our fire. Uh, we might use some more debt, although be a, it's unlikely under today's circumstances. But we can 20, 20 billion is an absolute minimum. You can say that because I say twenty billion is an absolute minimum, it probably wouldn't be below a twenty four, twenty five. Uh, and we could do we could do a very a very large deal uh, if we thought it was sufficiently attractive. I mean, we have not put our put to the floor on anything for for really a very long time. But if if we if we saw something 
really attract. We spent 16 billion back when we were much smaller in a period of two or three weeks, probably three weeks maybe, in the fall of 2008. And we never got to a point where it was any problem for me sleeping at night. I'm, and and uh, uh, now we obviously have a lot more money to put out. So if a good, Charlie, at, at what point, if I called you, would you say, I think that's a little bit big for us uh, today? I would say about $150 billion. Well, in that case, I'll call you. <laughs> don't, don't, uh, I'm a little more conservative on that than actually Charlie, but we both would do a very, very big deal. If we, we don't have to agree perfectly. Yeah, it'd have to be. But if we find a really big deal that makes compelling sense. Now you're talking. We're going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, station two. Hello, Mr. Buffett, Mr. Manager. My name is Felipe Picchioni. I'm, I'm 19 years old from Brazil. And uh, your partnership with George Paulo Lehman and his associates at 3G has been very successful, taking into account great outcome of transactions such as the Kraft Heinz merger. Even though you and George Paulo have different investment methods, would you and Charlie consider him to be your, a member of your board or even your successor? I don't think that will happen, but I, I think it would complicate things in terms of the board membership. But we love the idea of being their partner, and I, I don't think I think there's a good chance that we will do more and perhaps even bigger things together. But uh, the we're probably unlikely to be doing much change in the board, uh, uh, certainly in the next few years, and. And uh, there will be a successor, and the successor could very well be while I'm alive. Uh, but uh, that will be, there's a very high probability that will be from somebody that's been in our company uh, for some time. I mean, the world could change in very strange ways, you know, but, but that, that's a very, very high probability. Charlie? Well, all I can say is that my back hurts and I come to these functions because I want to indicate to the my fellow shareholders that they probably got seven more good years to get out of Warren. <laughs> Charlie is inspiring to me, I gotta tell you that. But, but, but uh, we we we've been very 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 lucky in life and uh, uh, and so far our, our luck seems to be holding. Okay, Becky <laughs> Um, this question comes from Drew Estes in Atlanta, Georgia, and he asks, is Fruit of the Loom experiencing difficulties related to the distribution channel shift towards online and the troubles in the brick and mortar retail world? If so, do you believe the difficulties are short term in nature? And then Drew goes on to add, I'm hoping millennials haven't bucked the underwear trend too. Yeah. <laughs> Well, he may know more about that than I do. Um, <laughs> the, the answer is essentially no so far, but, but anybody that doesn't think that online isn't changing retail in a big way uh, and that, that anybody who thinks they're totally insulated from it uh, is correct. I mean, the, the world is changing big time. And like I say, at Fruit of the Loom, I don't, it really hasn't changed. My, and at our, our furniture operation, which is setting a record so far, again this year, uh, for the shareholders weekend. You know, I, I mentioned in the report, but I think we did $45 million in one week. And our furniture operations, uh, it's, it's hard to see any effect from online, outside of our own online operations, uh, we had really good same store gains. Uh, you can take, you know, whether it's Nebraska Furniture Mart, but R.C. Willie, whether it's in Sacramento or Reno or Boise or Salt Lake City or Jordan's, which uh, in Boston has done very well on a same store basis. 
So we don't really see it, but, but there were a lot of things we didn't see 10 years ago that then materialized. So one thing you may find interesting is that the Furniture Mart here in Omaha, which is an extraordinary operation, the, the online is growing very substantially. Uh, and I may be wrong on this, but I think it's getting up to, uh, I'd like to check this with the Mumpkins before I say it, but, but I think it's getting pretty close to 10% or so of volume. But it's a very significant percentage of those people still go in and, and pick the product up at the furniture mart. So apparently, uh, uh, they, it, it's the time spent entering the store or maybe a check on lines or whatever it may be. I'm, I'm surprised that it gets to be that percentage. But the one thing about it is we keep looking at the figures and trying to figure out what they're telling us. So far, I would not say that it's affected Fruit of the Loom in a significant manner. I would not say it's affected the furniture operation in a significant manner, but I have no illusions that that 10 years is going to look, from now, is going to look anything like today. If you think about it, you know, if you go back 100 years to the great department stores, what did they offer? They offered incredible selection. You know, if you had a big department store in Omaha, you had you had the 1,000 bridal dresses, and if you lived in a small town around, the local guy had two or something of the sort. So, so the department store was the, the big, exciting experience of variety and decent prices and, and convenient transportation because people took the streetcars to get there. And, and then along came the shopping center, and they took what was vertical before, and they made it horizontal, and they changed it into multiple ownerships, but they still kept incredible variety and, and, and uh, assortments and convenience of going to one place and, and, and accessible transportation because now the car was the method. And now you go to, and, you know, and then we went through the discount stores and all of that, but now you've got the internet and you've got the ultimate in terms of, of, of uh, uh, assortments and you've got, you've got people that are coming in at low prices and and the transportation is taken care of entirely. So the evolution that has taken place, the department store is, 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 is online now, basically, except much expanded in assortment, much more convenient and, and lower prices. So uh, the world has evolved and it's gonna keep evolving, but the speed is, has uh, increased dramatically and what will happen with brand, the brands are, are going to be uh, tested in a variety of ways that, that, and have to make decisions as to whether they try to do it online themselves or work through, a, through an Amazon or whether they try to hang on to the old methods of distribution while embracing new ones. There's a lot of questions in retail and in branding that are, are very interesting to watch and, and you'll get some surprises in the next 10 years, I can promise you that. Charlie? It's, it would be certainly be unpleasant if we were in the department store business. Just think of what we avoided, Warren. Yeah, we got very lucky, actually, because we were in the department store business, and our business was so lousy that we recognized it. If it had been a little bit better, we would have hung on, and we owe a tremendous, our tremendous gratitude uh, to Sandy Gottesman, our director, who's here in the front row, because he got us out of the business when Charlie and I and Sandy were partners in that, and something that we paid $6 a share for, I think it's worth about $100,000 a share now because we got out of the business. And if it had been a, a somewhat better business, you know, it might be worth 10 or $12 a share now. So, so sometimes, sometimes you get lucky. Uh, we don't miss it either, do we, Charlie? <laughs> oh, she'll go. No, we don't miss it. <laughs> Jay. This question is on Berkshire's intrinsic value. A substantial portion of the company's value is driven by operating businesses rather than the performance of the securities portfolio. Also, the values of previously acquired businesses are not marked up to their economic value, including Geico, Mid-American, and Burlington Northern. Based on these factors, is book value per share still a relevant metric for valuing Berkshire? Well. It's got some relevance, but it's got a whole lot less relevance than it used to, and that's why I, I don't want to drop the book value per share factor, but the market value uh, tends to have more significance as the decades roll along. Uh, it's a starting point, and 
clearly our securities aren't worth more than we're carrying for uh, uh, carrying them for at that time and on the other hand we've got the kind of businesses you mentioned but we've got some small businesses that are worth 10 times or so you know what would they're carried for we've also got some clunkers too uh, but I think the, the best method of, of course is just to calculate intrinsic business value but uh, it can't be precise. We know, we, we, we think the probability is exceptionally high that 120% understates it. Although if it was all in, secu it was all in securities, you know, 120% would be too high. But as the businesses have evolved, as we built in unrecognized uh, value at the operating businesses, unrecognized for accounting purposes, uh, I think it still has some use as being kind of the base figure we use. Uh, if it were a private company and 10 of us here owned it, in instead we'd just sit down annually and, and calculate the businesses one by one and, and, and use that as a base value. But that gets, that gets pretty subjective when you've got as many as we do. And uh, so I think the easiest thing is to use the standards we're using now, recognizing the limitations in them. Charlie? Yeah, I think that equities in an insurance company offsetting shareholders' equity in the company are really not worth the full market value because they're locked away on, in a high-tax system. And so uh, I basically like it when our marketable securities go down and our own businesses go up. Uh, Yeah, we're working to that end. We've been working that way for 30 years now or something like that. We've done a pretty good job, too. Yeah. We have a lot of, we've replaced a lot of marketable securities with unmarketable securities that are worth a lot more. Yeah, and it's actually a more enjoyable way to operate, too, beyond that. But, yeah, we know a lot of people we wouldn't otherwise yeah. be with. Good people. Okay, station three. Hello. Hi. My name is Michael Monahan, and I'm from Long Island, New York. I don't know if this question qualifies as investment advice, so I have a short, different question if you don't want to answer this one. <laughs> Unlike the last shareholder from Zone 3, this will not be a stump speech nor a protest. One of your most well-known pieces of investment advice is to buy what you know. Additionally, you said earlier, one of the main criteria for buying is if you could ever understand the business. Ever since I came to my first meeting in 2011, you were not known for being a tech guy. You have said smartphones are too smart for you. You don't have a computer at your desk. And you've only tweeted nine times in the last four years. <laughs> it was either that or going to a monastery. <laughs> Despite this, you've recently been investing, looking, and talking more about tech companies. My question to you, and also to Charlie to comment, is what turned you from the Oracle of Omaha to the tech maven all along. <laughs> well, I, I don't think I would, uh, I don't think I've talked that much about tech companies, but the truth is we made a large investment in IBM, I made a large investment in IBM, and which has not turned out that well. We haven't lost money, uh, but in terms of the bull market we've been in, it's been a significant laggard. Uh, and then uh, fairly recently, we, we took a large position in Apple, which I do regard as more of a consumer goods company in terms of certain economic characteristics, although that it, you know it has a huge tech component in terms of what that product can do or what other people might come along to do to leapfrog it in some way but i i uh, i think i'll I think I'll end up being no guarantees, but I think I'll end up being one for two instead of 0 for two, but we'll find out. Charlie, I, I, I make no pretense 
whatsoever of, of being on the intellectual level of some 15-year-old that's got an interest in tech. I think I may know, have some insights into consumer behavior. I certainly uh, can get a lot of information on consumer be behavior and then try to draw inferences about what that means about what consumer behavior is likely to be in the future. Uh, but we will find with the one the other thing I'll guarantee is I'll make some mistakes on market level securities and I'm, I've made them in other areas than uh, than tech. Uh, so it, you, you'll not bat a thousand, you know, no matter what industries you you stick you, you try to stick with. I know insurance pretty well, but I think we probably lost money on an insurance stock, perhaps, you know, once or twice over the years. So it, it uh, you don't bat a thousand. But I have gained no real knowledge about tech in the last, well, since I was born, actually. <laughs> Charlie? I think it's a very good sign that you bought the Apple. It shows either one of two things, either you've gone crazy or you're learning. <laughs> I prefer the I prefer the learning explanation. Well, so do I, actually. <laughs> Andrew. Hi, Warren. Uh, this one's a fun one. Um, Thomas Kamei is here. He's a 27-year-old shareholder from Kenfield, California. And I should preface this, this question by saying uh, that he was here 17 years ago. At 10 years old, asked you a question from the audience asking you if the internet might hurt some of Berkshire's investments. At the time, you said you wanted to see how things would play out. He's now updated the question. <laughs> what do you think about the implications of artificial intelligence on Berkshire's businesses beyond autonomous driving and Geico, which you've talked about already? In your conversations with Bill Gates, have you thought through which other businesses will be most impacted? And do you think Berkshire's current businesses will have a significantly will have significantly more or less employees a decade from now as a function of artificial intelligence? Well, we've I, mixed a couple questions together. Yeah, I certainly have no special insights on artificial intelligence, but I, I will bet a lot of things happen in that field in the next couple of decades and probably a shorter time frame. They should lead, I would certainly think. But again, I don't bring much to this party. But I would certainly think they would result in a significantly less employment in certain areas. But that's good for society. And it may not be good for a given business. But let's take it to the extreme. Let's assume one person could push a button and essentially, through various machines and robotics, all kinds of things, turn out all of the output we have in this country. So everybody, there's just as much output as we have. It's all being done by, you know, instead of 150-some million people being employed, uh, one person. You know, is the world better off or not? Well, it certainly would work, involve less hours a week uh, of work per week and so on. I mean, it would be a good thing, but it would require enormous transformation in how people relate to each other, what they expect of government, you know, all kinds of things. And, of course, as a practical matter, more than one person would keep working. But pushing the idea that way is one of the, you'd certainly think that's one of the consequences of making great progress in artificial intelligence. And that's enormously pro-social eventually. It's enormously disruptive in other ways, and it can have huge problems in terms of a democracy and how it reacts to that. It's similar to the problem we have in trade, where trade is beneficial to society, but the people that see the benefits day by day of, us, of trade don't see a price of Walmart on socks or whatever they're importing that says, you know, you're buying, you're, you're paying X, but you would pay X plus so many cents if you bought this domestically. So they're getting these small benefits and invisible benefits. And the guy that gets hurt by it, who's the roadkill of free trade, feels it very specifically. And that translates into politics. And so you can, it gets very uncertain as to how the world would adjust, in my view, to great increases 
in productivity. And without knowing a thing about it, I would think that artificial intelligence would have that hugely beneficial social effect, but a very unpredictable uh, political effect if, uh, if it came in fast, which I think it could. Charlie? Well, he, you're painting a very funny world where everybody's engaged in trade, and the trade is I give you golf lessons and you dye my hair. And uh, that would be a world kind of like the royal family of Kuwait or something. And I, I don't think it would be good for America to have everything produced by one person and the rest of us just <laughs> engaged in leisure. How about if we just got twice as productive? What? How about if we got twice as productive in a short period of time so that 75 million people could do what 150 million people are doing now? I think you'd be amazed how quickly people would react to that. In what way? Fa favorably. I, that's what happened during the period when everybody remembers with such affection, back in the Eisenhower years, 5% a year or something, people loved it. Nobody complained that they were getting air conditioning and they didn't have it before. Nobody wanted to go back to stinking, sweating nights in the South. And well, if you cut everybody's hours in half, it's one thing, but if you, if you, if you fire half the people and the other people keep working, uh, I just think it gets very unpredictable. I, I mean, I think we saw some of that in this election because I, I, I think that, that... Well, we've adjusted to an enormous amount of it. It just came along a few percent per year. Well, and, and the question then is... I don't, think, is you have to worry, I don't think you have to worry about it coming out of 25 percent a year. You know, I, w I think you have to worry about it. You're going to get less than 2 percent a year. That's what's worrisome. Hmm. Okay, we'll move on. <laughs> but. It will be, you know, it's an absolutely fascinating subject to see what happens with us, but it gets very, very hard to predict if, if in some way, you know, we've got 36,000 people, say, employed at GEICO, you know, and, and uh, if, some, if you could do the same, perform all the same functions, or virtually all the same functions even, and do it with five or 10,000 people, and it came on quickly, and the same thing was happening in a great many other areas. You know, I, I don't think we've ever experienced anything quite like that, and maybe we won't experience anything like it in the future. I, I don't know that much about AI, but but uh, I don't uh, think I don't think you have to worry about that. Well, that's because I'm 86. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to come that quickly. Yeah. Okay, Greg. Warren, during the past five years, Berkshire Energy's investments in solar and wind generation have been about equal with around $4.7 billion dedicated to capital projects in each segment. Based on the company's end-of-year capital spending forecast for 2017 through 2019, investments in wind generation were expected to be more than seven times greater than investments in solar generation in the next three years, with just over $4.5 billion going into wind generation. Just wondering how much of that future spending is tied to Pacific Corp's recently announced $3.5 billion expansion plan which is heavily weighted towards improving and expanding the subsidiary's existing wind fleet, and whether the economics for wind are that much better than solar, given that Mid-American has also been spending heavily on wind investments, or is this just uh, <clears throat> this disparity between the two segments being driven more by genuine capacity needs, which would imply that you have much more solar capacity than you need? Yeah, it is, we, don't, uh, we don't look at it as having more solar capacity than we need or anything like that. It, it's really a question of what comes along. I mean, and, and these, the projects, they're internally generated, they're externally off, offered to us, and we've got a big appetite for wind or solar. We have seen, you know, just based on those figures, we, we have seen more wind lately, uh, but we have, we have no bias toward either one. I mean, if we, if we saw five billion of attractive solar projects we could do and, and didn't happen to see any wind during that period, it wouldn't slow us down from doing the five billion or vice versa. So we are, we all, we have an appetite, uh, a huge appetite uh, for projects in either area. We're particularly well situated, as I think I've explained or talked about in the past, because we pay lots of taxes, and therefore, solar and wind projects all involve a tax aspect to them, and we can we can handle those uh, much better than many other 
certainly electric utilities. Most electric utilities really, uh, A, don't have that much money left over after dividends, and B, some, frequently the taxes aren't that uh, significant. At Berkshire, we pay lots of taxes and we've got lots of money, so it's really just a question of doing the math on the deals as they come along. Uh, we've been very fortunate in Iowa uh, in finding lots of, of projects that made sense, and as a result, uh, we've had a, we've got a much lower price for electricity than our main competitor in the state. We've got a lower price than in any states that touch us. We've told the people of Iowa we won't, they won't have a price increase for many, many, many years, guaranteed that. So it's worked out extremely well. But if, if somebody walks in with a solar project tomorrow and it takes a billion dollars or it takes $3 billion, uh, we're ready to do it. There's no specific, and, we, and the more the better. Uh, there's, no, there's no specific preference between the two. It, it obviously, it depends where you are in the, in the country. I mean, Iowa's terrific for wind. And obviously, California is terrific for, for sun, and, and there, there, there are geographical uh, uh, advantages uh, to one or the other. Uh, but from our standpoint, we can do them any place, and we will do them any place. Okay, session four. Hi, my name is Joey, and I'm an MBA candidate at Wharton. Thank you for having us. Amazon has been hugely disruptive due to the brilliance of Jeff Bezos, whom Charlie earlier called the business mind of our generation. What is your current outlook on Amazon, and why hasn't Berkshire bought in? Well, because I was too dumb to realize what was going to happen. <laughs> Even though I admired uh, Jeff, I've admired him for a long, long time, and, and, and watched what he was doing, but I did not think that he could succeed on the scale he has, and I certainly didn't, th I didn't even think about the possibility of do doing anything with Amazon Web Services or the cloud. So uh, if you'd asked me the chances that while he was building up the retail operation, that he would also be doing something that was disrupting uh, the tech industry, uh, you know, I, that would have been a very, very long shot for me. And I've, I've underestimated uh, I really underestimated the brilliance of the execution. I mean, it's one thing to dream about doing this stuff on, online, but it takes a lot of ability. Uh, uh, and, you know, you can read his 1997 annual report, and he, he laid out a roadmap, and it, he's done it and done it in spades. And if you haven't seen his interview on Charlie Rose three or four months ago, charlierose.com, go to and listen to it, because you'll learn a lot, at least I did. So I, I just, I, I just plain, it always looked expensive, and I really never thought that he would be where he is today. I thought he would do, I thought he was really brilliant, but I did not think he would be where he is today when I looked at it three, five, eight, 12 years ago, whenever it may have been. Charlie, how did you miss it? <laughs> it was easy. <laughs> it, what? was done there was very difficult, and it, it was not at all obvious that it was all going to work as well as it did. Uh, I don't feel any regret about missing no. out on the achievement of, achievements of Amazon, but other things were easier, and I think we, we screwed up a little. No. <laughs> we won't pursue that line. <laughs> well, I, I meant Google. Well, we, we missed a lot of things. Yes. We missed a lot of things. And we'll keep doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and we'll have a two Luckily, minute. Luckily, we don't miss everything, Warren. That's our secret. We don't miss them all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we better move on, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he may start getting specific. Uh, Carol. The creator of this question, uh, Jim Kiefer of Atlanta, has uh, higher, even higher expectations for Warren's longevity than Charlie does. 
Mr. Buffett, we all hope you win the record as mankind's oldest living person. But at some point, you and our Charlie will go. And Berkshire stock may then come under selling pressure. My question is, if Berkshire stock falls to a price where share repurchase is attractive, can we count on the board and top management to repurchase shares? I ask this question both because of past comments you have made about not wanting to take advantage of shareholders and because some of the passages in the owner's manual lead me to believe this might be an instance when the board does not choose to repurchase shares. Can you clarify what course of action we might expect about repurchases in the circumstances I have outlined? Yeah, well, as far as I'm concerned, they're not taking advantage of shareholders if they buy the stock when it's undervalued. That's the only way they should buy it. And uh, they should, but in doing so, there, there were a few cases back when Charlie and I were much long, younger where there were very aggressive repurchases or the equivalent of repurchases by people. And the repurchases instantly made a lot more sense than, than they do now. But they were done by people who either, for various techniques, tried to depress the shares. And if you're trying to encourage your partners to sell out at a depressed price by various techniques, including misinformation, but there's other techniques, uh, you know, I think that's reprehensible. But that, our board wouldn't be doing that. I'll, I'll take exception to the first part of it, but I'll still answer the second. I think the stock is more likely to go up. Uh, if, I, if I died tonight, I think the stock would go up tomorrow. Uh, and there'd be speculation about breakups and all that sort of thing. So uh, uh, it, it, it would be a good Wall Street story that, you know, the, this guy that's obstructed uh, uh, breaking up something that where the some of the parts might sell for more than the whole. They, they wouldn't necessarily be, probably be worth less than the whole, but might sell for temporarily for more than the whole. And it would happen. So I would, I would bet in that direction. But if for some reason it went down to a level that's attractive, I don't think the board is doing anything in the least that's reprehensible by buying in the stock at that point. They, they're no false information, no nothing. It's just, and, and their buying means that the seller would get a somewhat better price. Or if there are a lot of sellers, they'd get a mildly better price than if they weren't buying. And the, and the continuing stockholders would benefit. So I think that I think it's obvious what they would do, and I would think it's obvious that it's it's pro shareholder uh, to do it. And I think they would engage in pro shareholder acts you know, as far as the eye can see. I mean, we've got that sort of board, Charlie. Well, I think you or I might suddenly get very stupid very quickly, but I don't think our board is going to have that problem. Well, I want to think about that one. <laughs> Okay, Jonathan. Uh, Warren, in the past, you've enjoyed discussing accounting for options grants. So I'm curious, what's your view of the new accounting standard which mandates that companies report lower tax provisions based on so-called excess tax benefits enjoyed when share-based compensation ends up being more profitable for the grantees than when it's initially modeled? These so-called benefits, excess benefits, used to go through the shareholder's equity line on the balance sheet. Which accounting method makes more sense to you, the old method or the new? Johnny, I think you know a lot more about it than I do. So if, if I were asked to answer that question, I'd probably call you up and say, what should I say? I, it's, not a, it's not a factor that will enter into Berkshire, so I really have not, I mean, I've heard just a little bit about uh, th that accounting standard, but I really don't know anything about it. Charlie? It's not a big deal, Warren. Yeah, well, I know that. <laughs> yeah. It's we, there are a few things in accounting we really disagree with, and whether they might be material to somebody trying to evaluate Berkshire, and and you know that primarily gets into amortization of intangibles. It will certainly, it certainly gets into realized capital gains and that sort of thing, and we will go to great lengths to try to tell our 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 partners basically. Uh, not all of whom, you know, are accounting experts or anything, and we, we 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 will try to make clear to them at least what our view is, you know, the same way as if I had a family business and I was talking to my sisters or something about it. Uh, but unless it's material, 
uh, we'll probably stay away from trying to opine on any new accounting standards. Uh, if it's material to Berkshire, we'll go to great lengths uh, to at least give our view. Charlie? Well, I certainly agree with that. Okay. That so is that what he's talking about is not very material to Berkshire. No, it isn't. And, and, and it really won't be, you know. And, no. And, um, some of these others are those, uh, and, and we will bring those up if they, as, they, as they come up. And, uh, they, uh, you know, we are reporting 400 and some million dollars less in our earnings than a precision cast parts had remained a public company. Well, is, is precision cash part, I mean, is the earnings less real, is the cash less real, is anything? Because it, it's moved the ownership. I don't think so. And I want to convey that belief to shareholders, and they can, they can debate whether it's right or wrong. But I, I think it's a mistake not to comment if, if uh, and just assume that the owners understand that, because it, you know, it's a fairly arcane point. And, uh, so we point it out, but we also point out if we think depreciation is, is inadequate as for valuation purposes, that depreciation is, is inadequate at, at a very capital intensive business like, like BNSF, which we, I must say, still love <laughs> anyway. Charlie, any more? No. Okay, section five. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Adam Berkman with Sterling Capital in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Earlier today, Mr. Munger commented on the valuation of China versus the U.S. market. My question for you is, are market cap to GDP and cyclically adjusted PE still valid ways to consider market valuation? And how do those influence Berkshire's investment decisions? Thank you. Charlie, I think, well, instructed, I guess Charlie, Charlie's overall value in China. I would say that <clears throat> both of the standards you mentioned <clears throat> are not paramount at all in our valuation of securities. It, it's, it's harder. People are always looking for a formula. <clears throat> And there is an ultimate formula, but the trouble is you don't know what to stick in for the variables. <laughs> but the — and, you know, that's the value of anything being the present value of all the cash it's ever going to distribute. But the — the P-E ratios — I mean, every number has some degree of meaning, means more sometimes than others. But evaluation of a business is uh, — it's not — it's not reducible to any formula where you can actually put in the variables uh, perfectly. And both of the things that you mentioned get themselves get, get uh, bandied around a lot. It's not that they're unimportant, but sometimes they're, they're going to be very important. Sometimes they're going to be almost uh, totally unimportant. It's just not, it's not quite as simple as as having one or two formulas and then saying the market is undervalued or overvalued or a company is undervalued or overvalued. The most important thing is future interest rates. And, you know, so, and people frequently plug in the current interest rate, saying that's the best they can do. After all, it does reflect a market's judgment. And, you know, the 30-year bond should tell you what people who are willing to put out money for 30 years and have no risk of of dollar gain or dollar loss at the end of the 30-year period, but, but what better figure can you come up with? I'm not sure I can come up with a better figure, but that doesn't mean I want to use the current figure either. So I, I, would, I, would, I would say that uh, uh, I, I, I think Charlie's answer will be that, it, that he does not come up with China versus the U.S. market based on, on what you've what you've mentioned is yardsticks, but no, Charlie, you tell him. All I meant was that well, I said before that the first rule of fishing is to fish where the fish are, is that a good fisherman can find more fish in China if, you're, if fish is the stock market. That's all I meant. Yeah. One, I'll, I'm going to go back. It's a happier hunting ground. This doesn't really directly relate to this question. I want to go back to one question that was mentioned earlier. I really think 
If you want to be a good evaluator of businesses, uh, uh, an investor, uh, you really ought to figure out a way without too much personal damage to run a lousy business for a while. I think you run a whole, you learn a whole lot more about business by actually struggling with a, a terrible business for a couple of years than you run by than you learn by getting into a very good one where the business itself is so good that you can't mess it up. Uh, I don't know what I don't know whether Charlie has a view on that or not, but it certainly it's it was a big part of our learning experience, and I think a bigger part in the, in the sense than running being involved with good businesses was actually being involved in some bad businesses and just seeing uh, how awful it was. How awful it is and, and, and how little you can do about it and, and how IQ does not solve the problem and a whole bunch of things. I, I, it, it's, it's a useful experience, but I wouldn't advise too much of it. <laughs> what do you think so, Charlie? Here. It, it was very useful to us. There's nothing like personal painful experience if you want to learn. And we certainly had our share of it. Okay, Becky. Um, this question comes from Tom Spanfelner, and he'd like to be called Tom Span from Pennsylvania. He says, in life, business, and investing, strategies often work until they don't work. Other than a massive insurance loss, any thoughts on what could cause the Berkshire Enterprise to not work? I think the only good question. Yeah. Well, if there were some change, if we got some infection, uh, outside agent of some sort to change the culture in some major way, you know, an invasion of of, of different thoughts. But as a practical matter, uh, I don't think anything, you know. And, it's the things you can't think of, but I can't think of anything that can harm Berkshire in a material, permanent way, except weapons of mass destruction, but I don't regard that as a low probability. Uh, it would take a, a recession, a depression, a panic, you know, uh, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, that they all would have some effect, and in some cases it might even be that we would do better because of them. But if there were a successful, as measured by the aggressor, nuclear, chemical, biological, or cyber attack on the United States, and there are plenty of people that would like to pull that off, or organizations, and maybe even a few countries, it could it could disrupt society to such an extent that it would harm us. But but I think with the variety of earning streams, with the asset positions, with the general philosophy of the place, the culture, I think it, we would be very close to the last one affected. But if somebody, somebody figures out how to kill millions of Americans and, and totally disrupt society, then, you know, then all bets are off. Charlie? Yeah, well, I agree. It would take something really extreme. Yeah. And just take the question, like, British Petroleum took a huge loss with one oil well blowing, and Berkshire has all these independent subsidiaries, and they really are independent. And the parent company is not on it. If there's one horrible accident somewhere, we would tend to pay, of course, to maybe more than our legal liability, but we are not one accident in one subsidiary that caused a big lot of damage. We're better protected than most companies. And ah. In every way, Berkshire is structured to handle stresses. It, it's the kind of thing we think about all the time, and we've thought about it ever since we started, but, but I, I really don't know any company that could take more general adversity or even some sp specific adversities. But if you get into the what could happen with weapons of mass destruction. Uh, you know, that, is, that is something we can't protect about, but I, if that ever happens, uh, there'll be more to worry about than price of Berkshire. Uh, Jay. 
Berkshire Hathaway specialty insurance generated $1.3 billion of premium volume in 2016. This business is on the smaller end of commercial property casualty insurers in terms of scale, although its volume did grow 40% last year. In a highly competitive commercial P&C environment, what gives you confidence that Berkshire Hathaway specialty is destined to become one of the world's leading commercial P&C insurers, as you said in this year's annual letter? Yeah, I think it will be, and I think how fast it grows depends very, it does depend very much on the market. I mean, we're, we are not, you know, we are not interested in, in trying to be a price cutter in a market where the prices already aren't that attractive. Uh, but we have built the scale worldwide, and a lot of this just has been added in you know, recent months and just over the past year. <clears throat> we have, we, we will grow, we will grow a lot, but if the market should turn hard for any reason, we would grow a lot faster, but we are destined at Berkshire Hathaway Specialty to be one of the leading PC firms in, in the world, just as we were destined to have, when Ajit came in, even though we had nothing, uh, we were destined to become a very important reinsurer throughout the world, and in certain ways, almost the only reinsurer for certain types of risks uh, in the world. And uh, we've, got the, we've got the people, we've got the capital, we've got the reputation. Uh, there, there is no stronger uh, company in the insurance world, and there won't be, than the Berkshire Hathaway insurers. We've got the talent there. We, so it will grow. It may grow slowly some years. It may have big jumps, just like the reinsurance operation did many years ago. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's a very important addition uh, to Berkshire that brought that on. I wish, just wish we could have started a little earlier, but it, we had to have the right people, and they came to us. And, and as you say, we wrote whatever it was, a billion three or a billion four last year, and we'll write more this year, but we won't write as much as if, if, if we were in a hard market. Uh, station six. Good afternoon. My name is Sally Burns. I'm from Australia, but I currently reside in Austin, Texas. My question, Mr. Buffett, I have heard that Mr. Munger says your greatest talent is that you're a learning machine that you never stop updating your views. What are the most interesting things you've learned over the last few years? Well, it is fun to learn. I would say Char <clears throat> Charlie is much more of a learning machine than I am. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a specialized <laughs> one, and he's a much, and he does as well as I do in my specialty, and then he's got a much more general absorption rate than I have about what's going on in the world. But, you know, it, it's a world that gets more fascinating all the time. And, and a lot of fun can occur when you learn you were wrong on something. It, you know, it, that's when you, really, when you really learn that the old ideas really weren't so correct, and you have to adapt a new one, uh, new ones. And that, is, of course, is difficult. I don't know that I would pick out. Well, I, I think actually what's going on, you know, in America is terribly, terribly interesting, you know. And, Politically, all kinds of things, but uh, just the way the world's unfolding, uh, it's moving fast. I, I do enjoy trying, you know, to figure out not only what's going to happen, but what's even happening now. But I don't think I've got any special insights that would be useful uh, to you. But maybe Charlie does. Well. I think buying the Apple stock is a is a good sign in Warren. <laughs> and <laughs> now he did run around Omaha and ask if he could take his grandchildren's tablets away. And <laughs> I mean, he did market research. And I do think we keep learning. And more important, we keep, we don't unlearn the old tricks. And, and that is really important. 
you look at the people who try and solve their problems by printing money and lying and so forth. Take Puerto Rico. Who would have guessed that the territory of the United States would be in bankruptcy? Well, I would have predicted it because they behave like idiots. <laughs> So, we, did, we did not buy any Puerto Rico bonds. No. <laughs> and if you go to Europe, talk about, you go to Europe, you look at the government bond portfolios, bond portfolios we're required to hold in Europe. There's not only no Greek bonds, they're the bonds of not, nobody but Germany. Just everywhere you look in Berkshire, somebody is, is being sensible. And... That is a great pleasure, and to combine that with being very opportunistic, so that when something comes along, like a panic, well, it's a nice, it's like, it's like, it's like playing with two hands instead of one in a game that requires two hands. It, it, it helps to have a fair-sized repertoire, and Warren, we've learned so damn much there are all kinds of things we've done in the last 10 years we would not have done 20 years ago. Yeah, that's true, although if you take, <clears throat> it's interesting, I, I, I've mentioned this before, but one of the best books on investment was written, I think in 1958, I think I read it around 1960, uh, by Phil Fisher called Common Stocks and Uncommon Profits. And he all the countries went, companies went to hell eventually. <laughs> But it, it, it talked about the importance, I mean, or the usefulness of what he called the scuttlebutt method. And, and uh, you know, that was something I didn't learn from Graham. But every now and then, it turned out to be very useful. Now, it doesn't solve everything. And I mean, there's a whole lot of more. I acid. saw you do it with American Express and the salad oil scandal. Yeah, yeah. You're still doing it on Apple, you know, decades later. Yeah, yeah it, 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 in certain cases, you actually can learn a lot just by asking a lot of questions. Uh, and and I give Phil Fisher credit. Uh, that book goes back a lot of years, but, but as Charlie said, the, some of the companies he picked as winners forever uh, did uh, sort of peter out on him. But, but the, the basic idea, I mean, you can learn a, a lot of things just, just, just by asking in some cases. I mean, I used to... I mean, if I got interested in the coal industry, just say, to pick, pick one out of the air, you know, when I was much younger, more energetic, if, if I went and talked to the heads of 10 coal companies and I asked each one of them w way later into the conversation after they got feeling very, uh, it felt like talking, and I would just, you know, I'd just say, if you had to go away for 10 years on a desert island and, and you had to put all of your family's money into one of your competitors, which one would it be and why? And then, you know, and then I'd ask them if they had to shell short one of their competitors for 10 years, all their family money, why? And they, everybody loves talking about their competitors. And if you do that with 10 different companies, you'll probably have a better fix on the economics of the coal industry than any one of those individuals has. I mean, it, it, there's ways of getting at things, and sometimes they're useful, sometimes they're not. But sometimes they can be, can be very useful and... and you know, the idea of just learning more all the time about, I'm, I'm more specialized than that by far than Charlie. I mean, he wants to learn about everything and I just want to learn about something that will help Berkshire. But the, it, it, it's a very, you know, it's, it's a very useful attitude toward, have toward the world. And of course, I don't know who said it, but somebody said the problem is not in, in getting the new ideas, but shedding the old ones. And, and there's a lot of truth to that. We would never have bought Iskar, if it had come along 10 years earlier. We would never have bought precision cast parts if it had come along 10 years earlier. We are learning, and, and my God, we're still learning. Okay, Andrew. Hi, Warren, this is my final question. In 2012, you were quoted as saying, I think the healthcare problem in, uh, is the number one problem of America and of American business. We have not dealt with that yet. Do you believe that the current administration's plan to repeal and replace ACA will ultimately benefit the economy and Berkshire or not? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll answer, I'll give you two, two answers here. The first one being that if you go back to 1960 or thereabouts, <clears throat> corporate taxes were about 4% of GDP. I mean, they bounced around some. 
and now they're about 2 percent of GDP. And at that time, health care was 5 percent of GDP, and now it's about 17 percent of GDP. So when American business talks about taxes strangling our competitiveness or that sort of thing, they're talking about something that as a percentage of GDP has gone down from 4 to 2, while medi medical costs, which are borne to a great extent, by business have gone from 5 to 17 percent. So medical costs are the tapeworm of economic, American economic competitiveness, I mean, if you're really talking about it. And uh, that, and, and business knows that, they don't feel they can do much about it, but uh, it is not, the tax system is not crippling Berkshire's competitiveness around the world or anything of the sort. Our, our health costs have gone up incredibly and will go up a lot more. And if you look at the rest of the world, there were a half a dozen countries that were around our 5 percent, if you go back to the earlier years. And while we're at 17 now, they're at 10 or 11. So they have gained a 5 or 6 point advantage, the world, and even in these countries with fairly high medical costs. And that's with socialized medicine. Yeah. So it's, it, 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 it's a huge, it's a, whatever I said then, goes and, and is accentuated now. Uh, and that isn't a problem. I mean, that is a problem the society is, is having trouble with and is going to have more trouble with. And uh, regardless of which party's in power or anything of the sort, it's, it, 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 it almost transcends that. Uh, uh, in terms of the new act, uh, it was passed a couple days ago versus the Obama Administration Act. Uh, it's a very interesting thing. Uh, all I can tell you is the net effect of that act on one person is that my taxes, my federal income taxes would have gone down, down 17 percent last year if, the act, if what was proposed went into effect. So it is a huge tax cut for guys like me, and you can, you'll have to figure out the effects of the rest of the act. But the one thing I can tell you is if it goes through the way the House uh, put in, I mean, it, anybody with $250,000 a year of adjusted gross income and a lot of investment income uh, is going to have a huge tax cut. And when you, there's a tax cut, either the deficit goes up or they get the taxes from somebody else. So as it stands now, uh, it is, that is the one predictable effect, if it should pass, is it? Uh, and it, the Senate will do something different and go to a conference and who knows what happens. But that is, that is in, the sta in the law that was passed a couple of days ago. Charlie? Well, I certainly agree with you about the medical care. What I don't like about the medical care is that a, a, a lot of it, we're getting too much medicine. There's too much chemotherapy on people that are all but dead. And all kinds of crazy things go on in Medicare and, and in the other parts of the health system. And there's so many vested interests that it's very hard to change. But, but I don't think any rational person looking objectively from the outside at the American system of, of medical care. Uh, we all love uh, the new life-saving stuff and the new chemotherapies and the new drugs and all that. But my God, the system is crazy. And the cost is just going wild. And it does put our manufacturers at a big disadvantage with other people where the government is paying the medical costs. And so I agree with Warren totally. If you had to bet 10 years from now, we'll be at higher or lower than 17 percent of GDP. Well, if present trends continue, it'll get more and more. There are huge vested interests in having this thing continue the way it is. And, uh, and they're very vocal and active, and the rest of us are indifferent. So naturally, we get a terrible result. And, and I would say that on this issue, both parties hate each other so much that neither one of them can think rationally. And I don't think that helps either. It's It, it, it is kind of interesting that, you know, with the federal government spends 
raises, we'll say three and a half trillion or something like that. And I mean, the, the degree of concern everybody has about that, although that's stayed fairly steady in the 18 percent or so of GDP, plus or minus a couple points. But three trillion plus is spent on health care, and and everybody wants the best, and it's perfectly understandable. But it's a very, very, it's, it's a big number compared to the whole federal budget. I mean, there's some overlap and all of that, but it, it it's. If you talk about world competitiveness of American industry, it's the biggest single variable where we keep getting more and more out of whack with the rest of the world. And uh, it's very it's very tough for political parties to attack it. It's, you know, it basically, it's a political subject. But a lot of it is deeply immoral. If you have a group of hospital people and doctors that are sort of feasting like a bunch of jackals on the carcass of some dying person. It's not a pretty sight. Tell them about that group out in California that... Oh, yes. Perfect, this is, yeah, this this is, is Redding. This is one of my favorite stories. There are a bunch of very ambitious cardiologists and heart surgeons in Redding, and they got the thought that really what a heart was was a widow maker. So everybody, every patient that came in, they said, you've got a widow maker in your chest and we know how to fix it. And so they recommended heart surgery for everybody. And of course, they developed a huge volume of heart surgery and they got very wonderful results because nobody comes through heart surgery better than the man who doesn't need it at all. <laughs> and, and, and they made so much money that the hospital chain, which was tenant, brought all its other hospitals. Why can't you be more like Reading? And this is a true story. And it went on and on and on. And finally, there was some beloved Catholic priest, and they said, you've got a widow maker in your chest. And he didn't believe them, and, and he, he blew the whistle. He was a priest, you can see why he didn't believe them. <laughs> <laughs> and at any rate, he, yes, well. Well, when you get a routine, you just keep using it, you know. The heart is a widow maker, it's a widow maker. Later, I met one of the doctors who threw these people out of the medical profession, and I said to him, in the end, did they think they were doing anything wrong? He said, no, Charlie. They thought that what they were doing was good for people. That is why it's so hard to fix these things. The self, the delusion that comes into people as they make money and get more successful by doing god-awful things should never be underestimated. And it, there's a lot, of, a lot of that goes on. And it, and it, it went on to such gross craziness. And you thought little Wells Fargo looks like innocence, you know, had a little trouble with this incentive system. But when the heart surgery rate was 20 times normal or something, you'd think you'd notice if you're running a hospital. And, but they, they did notice they wanted the other hospitals to more, be more like it. They had a terrific success ratio. Okay, Greg. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Warren. Uh, as you look forward in taking into consideration some of the headwinds faced in the U.S.-based utilities, including weaker electricity demand growth as increasing energy efficiency impacts demand, uh, distributed generation, which hits vertically integrated utilities doubly hard as they face both declining energy sales revenue and increased network costs to support reliable delivery, and third, higher interest rates, which would increase borrowing costs. What are the key attributes that Berkshire Energy would be looking for in future acquisition candidates? In yeah. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. In, in particular, are there advantages or disadvantages attached to, say, transmission assets relative to generation assets that would make you favor one over the other? Yeah, well, generation assets, you can say, have inherently more risk because that 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 some of them are going to be stranded, stranded, or yeah, and obsolete. Now the question is how they treat stranded and all of that sort of thing. Uh, we, on the other hand, more of the capital investment is in the generating assets, so that tends to be where a good bit of the capital base is. Uh, we, we like the utility business okay. I mean the. the Electric, electricity demand is not increasing like it was, as you point out. They're going to be stranded assets. Uh, they, if they're stranded because of rank foolishness, 
you know, they will probably be less inclined, or the utility commissions will be less inclined to, to let you uh, figure that in your rate base as you go forward, as opposed to things that are where societal demands are just changing. But we still think the utility business is a very decent asset. The prices are very high, um, but that's what happens in a low interest rate environment. I would be, I'd be surprised if 10 years from now, we don't have significantly more money in uh, not only uh, wind and solar, but, but probably, we'll probably own more utility systems uh, than we own now. We're a buyer of choice uh, with many utility commissions. In fact, if we can put up the slide, there's a slide which shows uh, something about our pricing uh, compared to uh, other utilities. And uh, Greg Abel and his group have done an extraordinary job. They've done it in safety. They've done it in, in reliability. They've done it in price. They've done it in, in renewables. It, it's hard to imagine a better run operation than, than exists at Mid-American Energy. And uh, people want us, with that record, people want us uh, to come to their state in many, in many cases. Uh, but when prices get to the level they have, I mean, some utilities have sold at extraordinary prices, and uh, we can't pay them and have it make sense for Berkshire shareholders. But just because we can't do it this year doesn't mean it won't happen next year or the year after. So I think we'll get a chance. And our utilities are not normal. The way Greg has run those things, they're so much better run in every way than normal utilities. They're better regarded by the paying customers. They're better regarded by the regulators. They have better safety records. They try, it just everything about it is way the hell better. And it's a pleasure to be associated with people like that and to have assets of that quality. And it's a lot safer. If somebody asked Berkshire to build a $50 billion nuclear plant, we wouldn't do it. Yeah. I mean, we have public power here in Nebraska. I mean, it's been sort of the pride of Nebraska for many decades. It's all, there are no privately uh, held uh, utility systems and totally public power. And, you know, those utilities have no requirements for earnings on, on equity. They have, they can borrow at tax exempt rates. We have to borrow at taxable rates. And you know, Nebraska, you know, the wind, it, not that much different than, than Iowa, and we're selling electricity across the river uh, a few miles from here, you know, at, at, at lower prices than exist in Nebraska. So it's, it, it's an extraordinary utility, and, and it was lucky when we got involved, and I, I thank Walter Scott, our director, for, for introducing me to it almost oh, 17 or 18 years, 18 years ago or so. Uh, and, and, uh, but I don't think the utility business as such, I mean, if I were putting together a portfolio of stocks, uh, I don't think there would be any utilities in, the, in, that, in that group now. But I love the fact we own uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy. But it's different, radically yeah. different, and a better. better. A lot better, actually. Station 7. Hi. My Hi. name's Grant, Mr. Lee from beautiful, historic St. Augustine, Florida. I've been a fan of yours and of Berkshire since I was a kid, um, looking through the stock pages and seeing one crazy stock that traded for $10,000 a share. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to convince my parents to buy it at that point. But now I'm a shareholder as an adult, and I'm here with my daughters, uh, Mabel, who's seven, and Willa, who's one year old, my wife. I voraciously read the letter every year. And I, I love the stories of, from the different companies, Geico and C's. BNSF that kind of teach investing lessons. And this year, when I was looking through the accounting information in the back, I noticed that one company, McLean, contributes a lot of revenue, a large portion of Berkshire's revenue, uh, and to a lesser extent, earnings. But I don't ever see much about it in the annual report. So I'm curious why we don't hear more about that company, 
And are there any investing lessons like we get from Seas and Geico that you can share about that company? Yeah, McLean, the reason you see their figures separately is because the SEC has certain requirements that are based on sales. And it, McLean is a company that has an extraordinary amount of sales in relation to intrinsic value or to net income. It, it basically is a distributor of, of well, it's, it's a huge customer, for example, of the, the, of the food companies, the candy companies, the cigarette companies that go up and down the line of anything that goes into convenience stores. But we bought it from Walmart, and Walmart is our biggest customer. Uh, I can't tell you the precise volume, but, well, to get Walmarts and Sam's together, you know, you're getting up to 20% plus. Uh, but it, it's nationwide, but in the end, it operates on about 6% gross margins and 5% operating expenses. So it, it has a 1% pre-tax margin, and obviously a 1% pre-tax margin only works in terms of return on capital if you turn your equity extraordinarily uh, fast. And that's what McLean does. Being a wholesaler, it, it's moving things in, moving things out very fast, very efficiently. And it does this. It also has uh, a few liquor distribution subsidiaries that have wider margins. But the basic McLean business is, you know, $45 billion plus makes 1% uh, pre-tax on sales. But the return on capital is, is, is very decent. But it sort of has an outsized appearance simply because of, of this huge volume of sales that, that uh, go through it. Grady Rozier, who runs it, is exceptional. He was there when we bought it from Walmart, uh, whatever it was, a dozen years ago. And uh, I've been there once. Uh, we've got thousands and thousands of trucks, uh, big distribution centers all over the country. Uh, it is a major factor in moving goods at wholesale. I mean, if you're if you're um, Mars candy or something of the sort, I mean, we we're, we're the we'll be the biggest customer. Um, but that that pretty well describes the business. You know, it's it's a business that is earns good returns in relation to invested capital and in relation to our purchase price. But you know, every every tenth of a cent is important in the business and collect. Moving your receivables exceptionally fast, uh, and consequently, you have, you, know, you have payables moving big time. So, the sales are 30 times receivables, or uh, times receivables, 30 times payables. You've got and, and maybe um, yeah, 35 or so times inventory. I mean, this is a business that's moving a lot of goods, but in terms of its, it's an important subsidiary, but not as remotely as important as would ind be indicated by the by the sales. Still very important making the kind of money that shows up in the 10K. Charlie? You said it all. <laughs> that was an interesting thing. Walmart wanted to sell it. They came to see us, and uh, we made a deal. Uh, the CFO came. We talked for a while. He went into the other room, called the CEO, and came and back and said, you have a deal, and Walmart has told me s subsequently that they never had a deal that closed as fast as the one with Berkshire. I mean, they, you know, we said what we would pay, it was cash, and we got it done very promptly, and they were terrific on their side. By the way, that reputation for being quick and simple and doing what we promised and so on has helped at Berkshire time after time. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't have made that deal without essentially having that reputation, but they knew. Well, you bought the Northern Natural Gas Company in one weekend, and they wanted the, Monday, the money on Monday. They needed the money on before Monday. Before the lawyers could compete the legal papers. We managed to do it. Well, not only that, but I, I think it took some clearance by uh, in Washington, and essentially I think I wrote a letter and said that if, if they didn't, if they decided after looking at it, they didn't want to clear it. We'd undo the deal. But these guys needed the money so bad, we were going to give them the money, essentially based on the deal clearing. And, and there wasn't any reason why it wouldn't clear, but there was just a procedural problem. But 
<clears throat> most companies can't do that. I mean, we, we, we can, we've got a flexibility that uh, really in most large companies just plain doesn't exist. There's too many people have to sign off on it or something of the sort. So the Northern Natural deal would not have been made if we'd had to follow the normal timetable. But, uh, and it's a lovely business to own. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now, we, we, we're moving from one station to another between now and 3.30, so we now go to Station 8. Good morning, or good afternoon, Warren. Charlie no, John hi. Norwood from West Des Moines, Iowa. You guys have iron bladders. <laughs> we won't tell you the secret of that. <laughs> I'm just wondering about a contraption under the no, table there. No. You can come down and inspect. <laughs> All right. <laughs> hey, I had a question for each. Uh, Warren, I was fortunate to ask you a question, I think in 2011, about legacy and what you wanted to be known for 100 years from now. And I'm kind of curious to hear what Charlie would like to be known for. And that, Warren, I'm 52, so I guess you started this, doing this when I was uh, born. And I, I'm kind of interested in a memory from your first annual, annual meeting. My first I remember when Warren got on this subject and they asked him what he wanted said at his funeral. He said, I want them to all be saying that's the oldest looking corpse I ever saw. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that may be the smartest thing I ever said. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, with me, um, very simple. I mean, <laughs> it, uh, <clears throat> I really like teaching, so basically that, that I've been doing it formally and you can say somewhat informally all my life, and I had certainly had the greatest teachers you can imagine, so uh, if somebody thought that, that I did a decent job at teaching, I'd feel very good about that. Yeah, I, and it makes me teaching and durable, it has to have a bit of wise assery in it. And that we've both been able to supply. <clears throat> and for those of you who are old-time basketball fans, <clears throat> I might mention that on Wilt Chamberlain's tomb, it was reputed that it was going to say, at last I sleep alone. <laughs> <laughs> okay, station nine. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mr. Meng and Mr. Buffett. Uh, my name is Ji Wenyan. I'm, I'm come from China. Uh, it's my first time to come to this meeting, and uh, I think I'm very lucky to have a chance to ask questions. <laughs> We're glad to have you. <laughs> Thank you. And everyone has uh, personal dreams, and uh, at different ages, um, maybe dreams will come differently. And uh, what's your dream now? <laughs> Charlie, we'll let you go. I didn't through. quite hear that. <clears throat> well, what's your dream now? She says, my, my dream. Well. <laughs> <clears throat> Let's skip the first one. <laughs> Sometime when I'm especially wishful, I think, oh, to be 90 again. <laughs> and I got some advice for the young. If you've got anything you really want to do, don't wait till you're 93. I'll do it. <laughs> no, that's the same thing I would tell students. Is, is it, you can't always find it the first time or the second time, but when you go out in the world, look for the job that you would take if you didn't need a job. I mean, don't postpone that sort of thing. Uh, somebody, I think it was Kierkegaard, said that, you know, life must be evaluated backwards, but it must be lived forwards. And, and you want to you wanna sort of, Charlie says all he wants to know is where he'll die, so he'll never go there, you know, and so you, <laughs> You do want to do a certain amount of reverse engineering in life. I mean, that's not, that doesn't mean you can do everything that way, but you really want to think about what will make you feel good uh, when you get 
older about your life, and you at least generally want to keep going in that direction. And and you know you, you need some luck in life, and you got to accept accept some bad things that are going to happen as you go along. But but life has been awfully good to me and Charlie, so we have no complaints. What you don't want to be is like the man, and they have his funeral and. The, Minister said, now it's the time for somebody to say something nice about the deceased. And nobody came forward. And nobody came forward. He said, surely somebody can say somebody something nice about the deceased. And nobody came forward. And finally, one man came up and he said, well, he said, his brother was worse. Yep. <laughs> Okay, we'll move to Station 10 and see if we can improve on it. <laughs> Hi. Uh, my name is Andy Li Jinning uh, from Loyal Valley Innovation Capital from Shanghai. This is my sixth year from Shanghai to here. Um, I, have say, I have to say to you too, Warren and Charlie, you are highly respected and deeply loved by millions and millions or even billions globally. Um, I have two questions today. First question, in your, in your letters to shareholders, you said you believe EBITDA is not a good parameter to value a business. Why is that? Can you elaborate on that? Second question, you both have very successful and happy lives. With great respect, my question is to each of you. In retrospect, from a personal standpoint, do you have regrets in life? If there is one thing you would have done differently in your life, family, personal, or business, what is it? Thank you very much. Yeah, I don't think you should expect us to answer that on personal, but uh, uh, if in, in business, I, I would say I wish I'd met Charlie earlier. <laughs> We've had a lot of fun <clears throat> ever since I was <clears throat> 29 and he was 35, but it would have been, it would have been even more fun if, we, if we'd uh, started many, many years earlier. We had a chance to. We worked in the same grocery store, but, but uh, <clears throat> not at the same time. In respect to EBITDA, Depreciation is an expense, and it's the worst kind of an expense. You know, we love to talk about float, and float is where we get the money first and we have the expense later. Depreciation is where you spend the money first, you know, and, and, and then record the expense later. And it's reverse float, and it's not a good thing. Uh, and to have that enter into a multiple, it's much better to buy a business that has everything else being equal, has no depreciation, because it has essentially no investment in fixed assets and makes X than it is to buy a, a company that, that where there's a lot of depreciation in getting to X. And I, actually, I may write a little bit more on that next year just because it, it's such a mass delusion. And of course, it's in the interest of Wall Street enormously to focus on something called EBITDA because it, it, it results in, in higher borrowing power, higher higher valuations and all of that sort of thing. So it, it's become very popular in the last 20 years. But I, it's, it's a very misleading statistic and be used in very pernicious, pernicious ways. Uh, Charlie, on either one of the subjects. I think you've understated the horrors of the subject and the disgusting nature of the people that brought that term into the valuation of business. It was just, it would be like a leasing broker of real estate who's, you had a thousand square foot new, uh, uh, suite to be leased, and he says it's two, got 2,000 feet in it. That's not honorable behavior, and that's the way that term got into common usage. Nobody in his right mind would think that depreciation is not an expense. Yeah, it, but it's very much in the interest of Wall Street. Yes, that's why, that's why they did it. Yeah. It made the multiple seem lower. And what's amazing I, is the way it's accepted, actually. And, um, uh, but anyway, uh, it, it, 
it just illustrates that how people use language, you know, and, and sell concepts that work to their own use. And, and 2 and 20 has the same sort of thing. I mean, the number of, the number of people, the, the amount of money that's overperformed after paying 2 and 20 compared to the expenses that have been incurred, I will assure you, makes for a terrible indictment of that particular arrangement. But as long as it can get sold, it will get sold. And, and, and now they use it in the business schools. Now that is that is horror squared. I mean, I mean it's bad enough that a bunch of thieves start using a term, but when it gets so common that the business schools copy it, that is not a that's not a good result. Okay. <laughs> Station eleven. Good afternoon. I'm Whitney Tilson, a shareholder from New York. My question is related to the ones asked earlier about job cuts. Perhaps the only thing that makes American workers angrier than layoffs is to shut down an operation entirely and move the jobs overseas. Ask anyone in Ohio or Michigan, and they'll tell you stories about companies that have been operating in those states for decades, benefiting from the educational system, infrastructure, and so forth, things that were paid for by local taxpayers. But then some high-paid consultants uh, came along and showed the company how it could reduce its costs by relocating production to Mexico or China, and poof, the good U.S. jobs disappeared. My observation is that most investors and those in corporate America today worship at the altar of maximizing shareholder value, which is code for doing whatever is necessary to boost the share price as high as possible. But in doing so, companies are taking actions that make millions of workers feel at best fearful and left behind, and at worst, deeply harmed by corporate America. It makes so many people so angry that I think it's testing the post-World War II economic order, which is rooted in free trade and even the strength of our democracy. I'd argue that it was decisive in our last election. So my question to you is, do you think that businesses should consider factors outside of pure economics when making these types of decisions? What obligations, if any, do they have to their employees and communities in which they operate? And lastly, if a Berkshire CEO came to you and asked for your approval to close a U.S. operation and relocate it overseas to save money, what questions would you ask beyond the economics of this decision? Thank you. Yeah, well, the, the truth is that in certain cases, uh, production that would otherwise, that had formerly been in the United States has definitely been supplanted by production that uh, come from other parts of the world. Originally, I was there when Fruit of the Loom was called Union Underwear and bought by Graham Newman Corp. in 1955, I believe, and it was probably all domestic then. And the truth is, if it was all domestic now, it wouldn't exist. Uh, we had the same thing happen with Dexter Shoe, and it was a wonderful company and skilled workers. And in the end, if we sold the shoes at a price that yielded what they cost us, uh, they were not competitive with shoes from around the world. A trade, uh, I would argue, both ways, export, import, uh, massive trade should be and is actually enormously beneficial, both the United States and the world. I mean, it will, it, greater productivity uh, will uh, benefit the world in a general way. But to be roadkill, to be the textile worker in New Bedford that was put out of a job eventually, to be the shoe worker in Dexter, at Dexter to be was put out of work, uh, is, 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 I mean, it, it would be no fun to go through life and say, I'm doing this for the greater good and so that shoes or underwear were sold for 5% less or something, and the American public will actually never know. So what you need is two things, in my view. You've got an enormously prosperous company, country. You've got almost $60,000 of GDP per capita. It's unbelievable. Six times what it was when I was born in real terms. So we've got the prosperity, and that prosperity is enhanced by trade. We were only exporting 5% of our GDP back in 1970, and that, that's up, I think it's around 12% or something like that. Now, we are doing what we do best, but we need an educator in chief who Logically, the president, I don't mean this specific president, as I mean any president that's been around for decades, has to be able to explain to the American public the overall benefits of essentially free trade. And then beyond that, 
we have to have policies that take care of the people that become the road call kill in the process, because it doesn't make any difference to me, if, as far as I'm concerned, if, if my life is miserable because I've been put out of business by something that's good for 320-some million people in some infinitesimal way, and it's messed up my life when I've tried to live it in the proper way. So we have got the resources to take care of those people. The investors I don't worry about. I wrote about this a few years ago. The investors can diversify their investments in such a way that, that overall trade probably benefits them and they don't get killed by a specific industry condition. But the worker, in many cases, can't do that. You're not going to retrain some 55-year-old worker in New Bedford who may not even speak English in our textile mill or something. I mean, they, if, if, if they get destroyed by something that's good for society, they get destroyed, unless government puts in some policies that takes care of people like that. And we've got a rich society that can do that, and we've got a society that will benefit by free trade, and I think we ought to try to hit both objectives of making sure that there, there is not roadkill and that at the same time we get 320 million people get the benefits of free trade. Mm. Charlie? Well, I don't quarrel with that. And we have unemployment insurance for that exact reason. But I'm afraid that a capitalist system is always going to hurt some people as it modifies and improves. There's no way to avoid it. Yeah, well, capitalism is brutal to capital if you're in the wrong businesses. And like I say, you can diversify those results. Capitalism is brutal to people that have the bad luck to be skilled or develop their skills for decades. But a rich cap, a very rich society can actually, if it's beneficial to society overall, it can take care of those people. I mean, it's just, you know, I, the new tax, the, the bill that was passed a couple days ago reduces my taxes, you know, by 17%, you know, and, and you know, is that needed by the government or anything of the sort? I wouldn't start spending the money. No, I, and I, but, but that was, that was the will. I mean, yeah. the, no, I agree. I don't think, who knows what happens with the bill. But I'm just, to have that happen, and, and I don't think that, I think if you polled a thousand people in Omaha that were walking through a shopping center as to whether my tax bill had been cut by some very large sum because of what passed, I don't think many people would have the faintest idea what happened there in, in terms of the coverage of it and all of that that took place. So I, we've got, we do have, it's probably more like fifty-seven or $58,000 of GDP per capita, family of four, $230,000. But, but nobody should be roadkill in this. Well, remember what Bismarck said, there are two things that nobody should have to watch. One is the making of sausage and the other is the making of legislation. Yeah. Well. I would say this, somebody ought to watch. <laughs> anyway, we've hit the magic hour of 3.30. We'll reconvene at 3.45 to do, uh, have a formal board, uh, formal shareholders meeting. And that may take a while, so you're welcome to stay and watch that, or you're welcome to shop. And, and I might even have a small preference to that, but go ahead, do whatever way you wish, okay. <laughs> Welcome to our post Q&A show. I'm Jen Rogers here with Andy Serwer. So the meeting is not quite done yet. You just heard that from Warren Buffett himself. We're gonna be heading back inside the arena again shortly for more official business. As Warren said though, you can, people can come back here and shop and he might even have a preference. Is there any more shopping to be done? You think these people are shopped out? There's one more item I forgot kind of thing is going on, no question about that. <laughs> so what was your takeaway from the afternoon session here? Well, it was all over the place. Um, and uh, at the end, there was some uh, dark humor. Uh, there was some, you know, and just that last line. I mean, the Zingers, those two guys, I mean, when they start doing that, actually, I have somewhat of a preference, I must say, when they start doing the life's lessons with mm -hmm. the Zingers yep. as opposed to the deep accounting. Now, the deep accounting is useful and worthwhile, but, you know, some of the stuff at the end, I love that Charlie Munger, I, when I die, I just want to be, you know, someone take a look at me and say, that's the oldest looking corpse I've ever seen. <laughs> right. I, I like that it. That stuff was great. I like it when he said, I, I, I want to know where I'm going to die so I never go yep, there. Yeah, yeah. 
I hope it comes across actually the live stream because being in the room there, you really, un you feel their friendship and you feel the depth of this relationship between them and uh, a little bit of that gallows humor. And then they go right into a question about EBITDA. Right, and, and you know, one thing when uh, they asked if he had any regrets, Warren Buffett, and he said, I wish I had met Charlie earlier. And I didn't really remember when they met. But they met apparently when Warren was 29 and Charlie was 35. That's pretty early on in one's life. And I guess Buffett wished they had met even earlier when maybe they were kids or something. Mm -hmm. It was kind of a kind of a sweet moment. Um, but you're right. They did rail about EBITDA. And, you know, it, it is really true that, you know, that is just taken for granted as a um, legitimate financial mm -hmm. metric. And I remember when it first came out and people sort of looked askance. And now, you know, Charlie Munger pointed out it's taught in business school and it really is a vehicle for Wall Street financiers to make something uh, prettier than it might be if you were just using traditional earnings. So uh, talking about EBITDA, there were also some questions about uh, what kind of threat could you see to Berkshire Hathaway? Uh, you know, a, a strategy always works until it doesn't. What could that be that would make it not work? And then they also talked about health care. It got, got a little political. Yeah, that's right. And, and they talked about uh, the health care bill uh, in Washington, and they also uh, talked about, you know, how it might affect the businesses. And, and, and I think we've uh, got uh, some of that on tape, right? Hi, Warren. This is my final question. In 2012, you were quoted as saying, I think the health care problem in, uh, is the number one problem of America and of American business. We have not dealt with that yet. Do you believe that the current administration's plan to repeal and replace ACA will ultimately benefit the economy and Berkshire or not? Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll answer. I'll give you two, two answers here. The first one being that if you go back to 1960 or thereabouts, <clears throat> corporate taxes were about 4 percent of GDP. I mean, they bounced around some. And now they're about 2 percent of GDP. And at that time, health care was 5 percent of GDP, and now it's about 17 percent of GDP. So when American business talks about taxes strangling our competitiveness or that sort of thing, they're talking about something that as a percentage of GDP has gone down from 4 to 2, while medi medical costs, which are borne to a great extent by business, have gone from 5 to 17 percent. So medical costs are the tapeworm of economic, American economic competitiveness. I mean, if you're really talking about it. It's like a tapeworm, he said. Yes, right? uh, healthcare costs, like a tapeworm. And all of those numbers there were mixed in with comments, uh, like one from Charlie Munger, that we're giving too much chemotherapy, you know, to, to people that are almost dead, and that kind of stuff getting uh, some applause lines. It seemed like people felt like we we're over, uh, treating some people, at least in yeah. the area where I was sitting. But it's definitely a contentious issue, and they dive right in. The range of their knowledge is, is pretty awesome. All right, so what's one of the most surprising things about Warren Buffett? Best-selling author Roger Lowenstein, who's written a number of books on Buffett, spoke to our Alexis Christophorus about that and a lot more. Take a look. So, Roger, you were really the first to pull back the curtain on the Oracle of Omaha, so to speak. What is something that you can share with us about Buffett that most people don't know? Well, I think it's interesting that he's never sold a stock of uh, a share of uh, Berkshire Hathaway. Uh, so, you know, ordinary investors who show up at the meeting uh, this year and every year who have redone their kitchens or sent their kids to college or, or whatever have benefited more financially. But Buffett's actually never reaped any financial benefit from Berkshire Hathaway. That's, you know, that's... That'd be like saying that John D. Rockefeller never got, any, never got anything out of his oil wells. That's, that's kind of remarkable, I think. That really is. And talk yeah. about investing for the long haul, which is one of his fundamentals of value investing. Do you think that that approach still works in today's market? Well, the idea of it is it works in uh, every market. And if you just unpack those two parts of that phrase, long-term and value investing, the idea is that over the short term, uh, nobody knows what a stock's going to do. So if you're going to be buying based on its intrinsic value, what the thing is really worth, you have to do it over some long term when it'll seek its value. And why shouldn't it always work to buy something for less than it's really worth and wait till it, the, the value comes out, as distinct from buying something because it's a dividend stock or it's a tech stock or it's not a tech stock. Right. All these things come and go. But buying for something less than it's really worth, that doesn't come and go. That stays. 
How would you categorize his investing approach? Because look, the idea of you know buying Coca-Cola and then sitting on it for 40 years, a lot of people don't do this anymore. Look, his approach is uh, to be really sure of, of something before he buys it. And one of the way, one of the way he exercises that discipline is to sort of almost never sell. Uh, not never sell, because he, he does sell stocks, but uh, he sort of says to himself, if I know I'm almost never going to sell it, I really, really got to like it before I get into it. And it's, it's not the, the not selling that makes these so good. It's having that discipline to buy things only when he really, really likes them. Now, every year he comes out with his sort of folksy letter yeah. uh, to investors. Sometimes he's criticized for the things he says in that letter. Do you think that it's changed the way we invest or we think about investing? It's changed the way a lot of people who read the letter uh, uh, invest because, you know, I've, I've talked to now, you know, hundreds of them over the years. And, yes, the letter is folksy. It's fun. It's blunt. It talks about uh, politics and sex and things that don't usually make their way into <laughs> annual reports. But what's distinct from an investor's point of view about the letter is it's been an ongoing tutorial about American business and finance and investing. There's real information there. There's real news. It's been the investing equivalent of poor Richard's almanac, and, and many, many Americans who read that have benefited and are wealthier because of it. Now, Buffett is a capitalist, but he seems to be somewhat immune from the criticism that CEOs and, and business leaders uh, sometimes are up against. Why do you think that is? Well, people don't criticize business leaders because they have capitalists uh, stamped on their rear. They have it because of the, they get criticized for the things they do. By and large, uh, you know, he doesn't do those things. The you know, uh, signature example is, is uh, executive compensation. $100,000 uh, a day, more or less, is the going rate for CEO. That's what he gets a year. You know, and he just, he, he, he's never, uh, he's always thought of his investors as his partners, his, his word, and he hasn't wanted to abuse them. Mm -hmm. He's never tried to dump stock on them uh, at a bad price. Uh, so he's treated them like partners. Now, you're well known for writing books that can be critical of Wall Street. There's a Gallup poll that says less than a third of Americans, less than a third, have confidence in banks nearly 10 years after the financial crisis. So why do you think that still is? I think, um, you know, banks are very much associated with the high side of the inequality gap uh, and all the things that have made uh, populism resurgent, that contributed to the Trump win. Uh, that have contributed to the anti-establishment mood, uh, you know, banks are part of that because obviously we've had other financial crashes without and other uh, uh, recessions, steep recessions, without this sort of, you know, enduring. But I, I think the, the fact that banks got a handout or perceived as getting a handout, some of them did get a handout uh, mm -hmm. during the crash, uh, and they seem to be doing fine, and the, you know, average factory worker and so on, blue-collar worker around the country, did not get a handout uh, or doesn't think they did and, and is not doing fine, uh, then people are upset about it. How can you blame All right, we're going to go back to Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett. Sharon Heck is Secretary of Berkshire Hathaway, and she will make a written record of the proceedings. Becky Amet has been appointed inspector of elections at this meeting, and she will certify to the count of votes cast in the election for directors and the motions to be voted upon at this meeting. The name proxy holders for this meeting are Walter Scott and Mark Hamburg. Does the secretary have a report of the number of Berkshire shares outstanding? If you don't mind, keep the lights on a little more so I can read this. Uh, outstanding, entitled to vote, and represented at the meeting. Yes, I do. As indicated in the proxy statement that accompanied the notice of this meeting that was sent to all shareholders of record on March 8, 2017, the record date for this meeting, there were 770,994 shares of Class A Brookshire Hathaway common stock outstanding, with each share entitled to one vote on motions considered at the meeting, and 1,310,304,247 shares of Class B Brookshire Hathaway common stock outstanding, with each share entitled to one tenth one thousandth of one vote on motions considered at the meeting. Of that number, 538,915 Class A shares and 734,450,954 Class B shares are represented at this meeting by proxies returned through Friday afternoon, May 5th. Uh, thank you, Sharon. 
That number represents a quorum, and will therefore, and we will therefore directly proceed with the meeting. The first first item of business will be a reading of the minutes of the last meeting of shareholders. I recognize Mr. Walter Scott, who will place a motion before the meeting. I move that the reading of the minutes of the last meeting of shareholders be dispensed with and the minutes be approved. Do I hear a second? I second the motion. The motion has been moved and seconded. We will vote on the motion by voice vote. All those in favor say aye. Oh, didn't hear very many, but opposed? The motion is carried. The next item of business is to elect directors. If a shareholder is present who did not send in a proxy or who wishes to withdraw a proxy previously sent in, you may vote in person on the election of, of directors and other matters to be considered at this meeting. Please identify yourself to one of the meeting officials in the aisle so that you can receive a ballot. I recognize Mr. Walter Scott to place a motion before the meeting with respect to election of directors. I move that Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Howard Buffett, Stephen Burke, Susan Decker, William Gates, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Thomas Murphy, Ron Olson, Walter Scott, and Merle Whitmer be elected as directors. Is there a second? I second the motion. It's been moved and seconded that Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Howard Buffett, Stephen Burke, Susan Decker, William Gates, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Thomas Murphy, Ronald Olson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitmer be elected as directors. Are there any other nominations or any discussion? The nominations are ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballots on the election of directors and deliver the, their ballot to one of the meeting officials in the aisles. Ms. Hammack, when you are ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Friday afternoon cast not less than 601,375 votes for each nominee. That number exceeds a majority of the number of the total votes of all Class A and Class B shares outstanding. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the Secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Hammack. Warren Buffett, Charles Munger, Howard Buffett, Stephen Burke, Susan Decker, William Gates, David Gottesman, Charlotte Guyman, Thomas Murphy, Ronald Olson, Walter Scott, and Merrill Whitmer have been elected as directors. The next item on the agenda is an advisory vote on the compensation of Berkshire Hathaway's executive officers. I recognize Mr. Walter Scott to place a motion before the meeting at this time. I move that the shareholders of the company approve on an advisory basis the compensation paid to the company's named executive directors as disclosed pursuant to item 402 of regulation SK, including the compensation discussion and analysis and the accompanying compensation tables and the related narrative discussion in the company's 2017 annual meeting proxy statement. Is there a second? I second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the shareholders of the company approve on an advisory basis the compensation paid to the company's named executive officers. Ms. Amick, when you are ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Friday afternoon cast not less than 608,000 765 votes to approve on an advisory basis the compensation paid to the company's named executive officers. That number exceeds a majority of the number of the total votes of all Class A and Class B shares outstanding. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Amick. The motion to approve on an advisory basis the compensation paid to the company's named executive officers is passed. The next item on the agenda is an advisory vote on the frequency of a shareholder advisory vote on compensation of Berkshire Hathaway's executive officers. I recognize Mr. Wall or Scott to place a motion before the meeting on this item. I move that the shareholders of the company determine <clears throat> on an advisory basis the frequency, whether annual, biannual, or triannual, 
with which they shall have an advisory vote on the compensation paid to the company's <coughs> named executives as set forth in the company's 2017 annual meeting proxy statement. Is there a second? Second the motion. It has been moved and seconded that the shareholders of the company determine the frequency with which they shall have an advisory vote on compensation of named executive officers, with the option being every one, two, or three years. Ms. Amick, when you're ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Friday afternoon cast 131,268 votes for a frequency of every year, 1,954 votes for a frequency of every two years, and 476,661 votes for a frequency of every three years of an advisory vote on the compensation paid to the company's named executive officers. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Amick. Shareholders of the company have determined on an advisory basis that they shall have an advisory vote on the compensation paid to the company's named executive officers every three years. The next item of business is a motion put forth by Clean Yield Asset Management on behalf of shareholders Tom Beers and Mary Durfee. The motion is set forth in the proxy statement. The motion requests that the company provide a report on its political contributions. And the directors have re recommended that the shareholders vote against this, the proposal. I will now uh, recognize Eileen Dury, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, to present the motion. To allow all interested shareholders present their views, I ask to limit the, the rem I asked to limit her remarks to five minutes. And uh, the microphone, microphone at zone one is available for those wishing to speak for or against the motion. Uh, zone one is the only microphone station in operation. For the benefit of those present, I ask that each speaker for or against the motion, with the exception of the original proposer, uh, limit themselves to two minutes and confine your remarks solely to the motion. And do we have at Station One the representative of Clean Yield Management? Or clean, okay. Sorry, Clean Good Yield Asset Management. Yep. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Board of Directors, and my fellow shareholders. My name is Eileen Dury, and I have been asked to read the following statement by the filers of this proposal, Tom Beers and Mary Durfee. Our proposal number four on the proxy ballot, calls on Berkshire Hathaway to fully disclose the extent of its political spending. Why do we ask for this? Corporate political spending is a controversial activity that must be carefully managed and overseen at the most senior levels of management. Mismanagement or misjudgment around political contributions can bring reputation damage, political risks, and legal consequences. In recent years, at the urging of shareholders and other stakeholders, scores of companies have adopted stronger disclosure and better oversight of political contributions. Best practices in this area include full disclosure of direct and indirect political contributions, descriptions of policies and procedures to ensure full legal compliance, and a commitment to board oversight. But our company's policies in this area are so non-existent or hidden that they have earned it a score of zero for six years running on the leading rating system for corporate political disclosure and accountability, the CPA Zicklin Index. In contrast, 56% of the S&P make public a detailed policy governing political expenditures from corporate funds. Peers such as GE, Travelers, Unum, CSX, and Norfolk Southern disclose political spending. In contrast, all we know about Berkshire's political spending is contained in the two-paragraph response to our proposal in this year's proxy statement, which seeks to reassure us that Berkshire's political spending is small relative to its size. But management's statement raises more questions than it answers. It says nothing 
for example, about whether Berkshire gives to third party like trade associations and 501c4s, which are leading dark sources of dark money contributions that are nearly impossible to trace. Since 2012, over $670 million in dark money was spent in the U.S. elections with no disclosure of who the underlying donors were. Fellow shareholders, as you know, our company is a large and complicated enterprise. Berkshire Hathaway ranks number four in the Fortune 500. At a time when the trend among large companies is to be more open about their political spending and their policies regarding dark money vehicles, it doesn't behoove or benefit Berkshire Hathaway to be so secretive if it has nothing to hide. If you agree, please vote in favor of proposal number four. Thank you. Are, are there other uh, uh, people who wish to speak? On a motion. Not that I know of. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you. And I, uh, I, I will tell you that, uh, to my knowledge, uh, in 52 years, Berkshire Hathaway, at the parent company level, has not made a political contribution. I don't. Uh, I, uh, I personally disagree strongly with the Citizens United decision, which was a five to four vote, and I think that that uh, uh, having unlimited contributions <clears throat> by wealthy indi <clears throat> wealthy individuals through super PACs and and uh, uh, or wealthy corporations, I do, I do not think it's a plus at all, and I think it's a minus in our democracy, and I think that that big money does uh, uh, can often distort the political process. It's a reality that any of our subsidiaries in heavily regulated industries are probably going to have to make some political contributions. Their competitors do it. And I tell our managers, basically, uh, if, if, if they assent, I, I don't want them making contributions on their own personal preferences in, in, in elections to be made from corporate funds, and I would regard that as a, a breach of trust with, with Berkshire. But I do recognize that if they're in the railroad industry or the electric utility industry or whatever it may be, that there is a necessity, essentially, to make political contributions. And I'm sure they give money to people that I wouldn't vote for, but that is a reality of doing business in, in, in certain businesses which have a significant political aspect uh, to their activities. So uh, I'm probably, my heart is with you to some extent in terms of I wish Citizens United had gone the other way. I don't like the idea of great sums being spent, but I, but I, uh, I, I do not think we. I, I think it, personally, <clears throat> I think that it could be disadvantageous to actually list all of the all of the uh, political organizations that to which people contribute when competitors don't. And I think there's expense involved in all three of the proposals that are coming up on this one. So I personally uh, voted against the proposition. Uh, but I do hope, like you, that money plays a lesser part in politics, big money in the future and undisclosed money than it does now. And <clears throat> I don't think the odds are good that the Supreme Court is going to reverse Citizens United. So with that, I would. Uh, Say the motion is now ready to be acted upon. <clears throat> if there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballot on the motion and deliver their ballot to one of the meeting officials in the in the aisles. Zamek, when you're ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received <coughs> through last Friday afternoon casts 64,000. 449 votes for the motion and 542,399 votes against the motion. 
as the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, as well as all votes outstanding, the motion has failed. The certification required by Del Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Amick. The proposal fails. The next item of business is put forth by Baldwin Brothers, Inc. on behalf of shareholder Marcia Sage. The motion is set forth in the proxy statement. The motion requests that the company provide a report reviewing the co company's policies, actions, plans, and reduction targets related to methane em emissions from all operations. The directors have recommended that the shareholders vote against the proposal. I will now recognize uh, Eileen Dury to present the motion. To allow all interested shareholders to present their views, I ask uh, her to limit her remarks to five minutes. Microphone at Zone 1 is available for those wishing to speak for or against the motion. Zone 1 is the only microphone station in operation. For the benefit of those present, I ask that each speaker uh, for and against or against the motion limit themselves to two minutes, although, Ms. Gray, that's five minutes in your case, and to combine your remarks solely to the motion. Good Thank afternoon, you. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and fellow shareholders. My name is Eileen Dury. I am here to move Arjuna Capital and Baldwin Brothers' proposal on behalf of Marcia Shage, a long-term investor in our company. Proposal 5 seeks to protect shareholder value by ensuring the transparent disclosure of our information regarding methane emissions. The reason for this proposal are clearly in the interest of protecting long-term shareholder value. Leet gas has a direct economic impact on our company, as it is no longer available for sale establishing a clear business case for reduction targets and control processes. In fact, LEAT methane represented $30 billion of lost revenue in 2012, equivalent to 3% of gas produced globally. The National Resources Defense Council estimates that capturing currently wasted gas for sale could reduce methane pollution by roughly 80%. And while the climate benefit of replacing coal with natural gas has been widely publicized, that benefit is negated when leakage rates exceed 2.7%, as methane carries 84 times the global warming impact of CO2 over a 20-year period. Recent academic studies are particularly troubling as they have identified methane leakage far north of current EPA estimates. Additionally, gas storage presents outsized risk. The 2015 failure of a gas injection well at Southern California Gas Company's Aliso Canyon storage field in Los Angeles revealed major vulnerabilities in the maintenance and safety of natural gas storage facilities. The incident exposed both a, both a lack of oversight and contingency planning in the face of a well blowout. Berkshire Hathaway has storage facilities that face similar risks, as it is estimated to hold the 11th highest volume of natural gas in the country. There are over 400 gas storage facilities around the country, many of which were drilled decades ago. Numerous independent researchers have concluded that if natural gas is to lead to a more sustainable energy future, then missing emissions must be addressed. Ongoing concerns have spurred public debate and led to regulatory action at the state and federal level. A strong program of target setting, measurement, mitigation, and disclosure would indicate a reduction in regulatory risk, as well as efficient operations maximizing gas for sale and shareholder value. Given this, we believe our company has a tremendous opportunity to move forward by providing shareholders with this important information. ISS, the leading provider of proxy voting advice, agrees and has recommended a vote in favor, noting such disclosures would allow shareholders to better understand the company's management of its methane emissions and any related risks. Thank you for your consideration. Are there other uh, people who wish to speak on this motion? I don't believe so. Okay. The motion is now ready to be acted upon. If there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballot on the motion and deliver their ballot to one of the meeting officials in the aisles. Ms. Amick, when you're ready, you may give your report. 
My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Friday afternoon cast 57,600 votes for the motion and 542,870 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, as well as all votes outstanding, the motion has failed. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Greg, incidentally, is there a, is there a live microphone? Near, yeah, there we go. Might talk a little bit about the methane situation. Sure, Warren. So thank you for your comments. And when you think about methane emissions, it is a serious issue relative to carbon. It was highlighted 84 times worse than a, a carbon emission, but I'd be very pleased to report on our situation at Berkshire Hathaway. So three different issues were raised in the comments. One was overall emissions from oil and gas production. So the first thing I would just highlight is that we do not own any oil and gas producing assets. So we don't have any wells and effectively don't have that risk. The second thing that was highlighted was the significant loss of gas at Aliso Canyon. It was a uh, injection well that failed, took many months to fix the well. And if you fundamentally look at the problem there, and we do own other storage facilities, but we do not use our technology or that type of well. All of our wells are cased to the top, which creates a very different risk and literally can be mitigated uh, within hours. And then the third issue which was raised was leakage rates. And it was highlighted, at least in a, a, a second response to the proposal, that the leading companies in the industry have a leakage rate of 1%, or they've put together programs to achieve a leakage rate of 1%. And I'm happy to report, when we look at our leakage rate from our pipelines, we're at 0.53 of 1%. So basically half of the leading companies in the industry. So with that, obviously support the, the recommendation of, of the shareholders. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. You've heard the vote and uh, the proposal fails. Um, the next item of business is a motion put forth by a shareholder, the Nebraska Peace Foundation. The motion is set forth in the proxy statement. The motion requests that the company divest of its holdings and companies involved in the extracting, processing, or burning of fossil fuels. The directors have recommended that the shareholders vote against the proposal. I will now recognize Mark Vicena to pre present the motion. And again, to allow all interested shareholders to present their views, I ask him to uh, limit his remarks to five minutes. And the microzone zone one is available for those wishing to speak for or against the motion. Zone one is the only microphone station in operation. And for the benefit of those present, subsequent speakers, I ask that they uh, uh, limit themselves to two minutes and confine your remarks solely to the motion. Uh, with that, if you'll proceed. Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Vecina. I represent the Nebraska Peace Foundation. We're here to present our proposal uh, asking Berkshire Hathaway to divest of its carbon-based assets uh, over a period of 12 years, uh, a period of time we believe is a, a very modest proposal indeed. Uh, last year, we were here with a proposal that Berkshire Hathaway uh, evaluate and report on the impact of climate change on their insurance uh, companies. After, our, after the meeting, we were approached by a number of shareholders who, who suggested we were pulling our punches, and they suggested the real question is divestiture. Uh, so we thought about it. We came back to ask for divestiture of the carbon-based assets. Uh, we recognize that for a public company that's involved in investing in other companies, uh, divestiture represents different kinds of challenges from 
those of university endowments, pension plans, uh, public foundations such as the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, uh, organizations which have divested or have implemented divestiture plans. However, we believe that uh, the necess necessity for divestiture involves more than just a social or ethical or even moral question, but also involves financial risk as the Bank of England in their recommendation to the insurance companies that they regulated, that they uh, investigate and report on the climate change risk to these companies, they pointed out that financial risk of holding these carbon-based assets was real, uh, unpredictable, uh, things like uh, regulatory risk, political risk, technology changes, investment uh, investor sentiment changes. These things pose risks towards the financial value of assets in this, in this uh, type of uh, investment. So um, we are proposing, as I said, divestiture of all carbon-based assets over 12 years. I'm going to be followed by three prominent American climate scientists, Frank Lemire, of the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, and uh, Richard Miller, uh, Creighton University theologian. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to make our case for this proposal. Thank you, and we'll proceed to the next speaker, please. Chairman Buffett, board members, and shareholders, my name is Michael Mann. I am a professor at Penn State University and a climate scientist. And as a scientist who spends much of my time communicating the reality and threat of climate change, it's an honor to have this opportunity to speak to you today. Warren Buffett, known as the Wizard of Omaha, is an inspiration to many, a symbol of the value of work ethic, self-made success, and the great reward that comes with foresight. Now, foresight means recognizing both opportunity and risk. And when it comes to risk, there is no better example than climate change. I recently co-authored an article in the journal Scientific Reports, for example, demonstrating that climate change played a key role in the onslaught of unprecedented, devastating droughts, floods, and heat waves in recent years. And the impacts we're seeing now are just the veritable tip of the iceberg. Carbon emissions must be brought down dramatically within the next few years if we are to avert the worst impacts of climate change. Mr. Buffett coined the term Noah's Law in his 2015 shareholder letter to describe the risk posed by climate change, stating, if there is only a 1% chance the planet is heading toward a truly major disaster and delay means passing a point of no return, inaction now is foolhardy. Well, I couldn't agree more. And the science tells us that we are heading toward disaster in the absence of substantial reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Board member Bill Gates demonstrated bold leadership a year ago when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation announced it was divesting of fossil fuel holdings. Were Mr. Buffett to follow suit, it would send a profound message to the rest of the global business community, a message that we can both mitigate risk and seize opportunity in the form of massive growth in clean energy technology by tackling this problem now head on before it's too late. Thank you. Thank you. And I believe there's another speaker, maybe two. If you'll identify yourself, please. My name is Richard Somerville. I'm a climate scientist and a professor at the University of California, San Diego. Chairman Buffett, uh, board and shareholders, the world is warming. It is due to human activities. It is getting worse. The observational evidence is overwhelming. All the warmest years globally are recent years. We see the weather changing. We see more severe floods and droughts. Sea level rise is accelerating. Ice sheets and glaciers are shrinking worldwide. Climate change will become more and more serious unless emissions of heat-trapping gases and particles are quickly and drastically reduced. The biggest unknown about future climate is human behavior. Everything depends on what humanity does now. We have our hands on the thermostat that controls the climate of our children and grandchildren. In 2015, the nations of the world agreed in Paris on how much warming can safely be allowed. The Paris target was informed by science, and the science shows that to meet the target, 
emissions need to be reduced drastically and quickly. We cannot just muddle through. Dithering and procrastinating lead to catastrophe. Alleviating the disruption of climate change is cheap compared to coping with the damage that unmitigated climate change will cause. Want an example? Doing nothing about climate change means that sea level will become so high that coastal cities must eventually be abandoned. We caused this problem, we can solve it. And polls show that most Americans want strong actions to limit climate change. The forces driving clean energy are powerful. The market is turning against fossil fuels. The prices of solar and wind energy are dropping. They can already compete without subsidies. Vehicle elect electrification is happening fast. Clean energy provides jobs and economic growth. Progress and prosperity do not require emitting heat-trapping gases. Brookshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett are rightly admired and respected worldwide. Helping the world confront climate change should be an important part of their legacy. We owe it to our children and grandchildren. Thank you. Thank you. I believe there's one more speaker. Thank you, sir. I am David Titley, retired Rear Admiral, former oceanographer of the Navy, and now a professor of practice at Penn State. I've been a shareholder of Berkshire Hathaway since December 2000. Thank you, sir, for your leadership of this enterprise. When I was stationed at the Pentagon, I had the privilege of working directly for the Pentagon's foremost strategic planner, Mr. Andrew Marshall. He taught me how to think about risks, and especially risks that may seem distant or low probability, but one with very high impacts, such as weapons of mass destruction. Climate change is a fat-tailed, emerging risk. It's really a risk to people, to us. And when this risk is not managed, we have a security problem. One example would be Syria. Climate is one of the links in a long chain of events that led to the tragic outcome. Non-climate events, such as over a million refugees pouring into Syrian cities from the Iraq war, stressed Syrian governance. Then about a decade ago, an exceptionally intense drought and heat spell, linked with high confidence to a changing climate, devastated Syrian agriculture. Now you have millions of desperate people with nothing and a breeding ground for extremists. Syria is an example of why in the security community we say that climate change accelerates the risks of instability. It can make bad places worse, a lot worse. Senior military officers know you must address risks and take precautions while you can, before it's too late. The U.S. Defense Department understands the risks of climate change and has been working quietly to adapt to the changing climate for years. Winston Churchill is alleged to have said Americans can always be counted upon to do the right thing after exhausting every other possibility. But we will prevail, and you, sir, can help. Here's my ask. What are government and business leaders doing to stabilize the climate? We should reduce rather than accept the risks of unchecked climate change, because the ice doesn't care which party controls the White House or the Congress it just melts. Thank you. I am Frank Lemire, the Bear Clan of the Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska. It was the indigenous people of this continent who first consecrated the ground on which we live and grow, who offered up prayers and petitions asking that we be allowed to live and to provide a way for the generations to come. In exchange for the blessings given by the Creator, our forebears agreed to be good stewards of the land. The stewardship of our Mother Earth who provides for us has now changed, but the covenant remains the same. Let there be no mistake about that. If we continue to dis disrespect our Earth Mother, those things given us, bountiful harvests, protection for the elements, and good clean water will surely be taken from us. Our elders speak of this. It has been foretold. On Christmas Eve, my son came from Standing Rock to visit us for one hour. His mother and I worried about him. How is it there? Why did you go? I asked. He said, it is dangerous, Dad, but someone has to protect our water. I nodded and said, aho, that is good. He is a water protector. I stand on his shoulders. Many Wichoni, the protectors, proclaim water is life. Bearing that in mind, I am told that this waterway flowing south from Standing Rock and passing just a short walk from here would be fouled by any kind of breach in the Dakota Access Pipeline. 
My sense in my years tells me that this will happen. Millions would be poisoned. I am further told that this collective body holds a 15 percent interest in an oil company that is a 25 percent shareholder in the Dakota Access Pipeline. I would ask that you walk away from that investment. Stand with Mother Earth today. I am a Winnebago Indian. The Missouri River brought us here when we had no place to go. We stand with our Mother Earth now as she stood with us. Think about that. Many Wichoni, water is life. Peanut Gigi, thank you. Thank you. Dear Chairman Buffett, board members, and shareholders, I am Richard Miller. I'm an associate professor of philosophical theology and sustainability studies at Creighton University. I write and teach on ethical issues raised by the climate crisis. As a rationale for voting no on the divestment resolution, the board maintained that Berkshire should not limit its universe of potential investments based upon complex social and moral issues and that following state and federal laws was sufficient to meet your obligations. There is not only an overwhelming consensus in the scientific community about the reality and dangers of climate change, but there is also an overwhelming consensus among all major ethical theories that one is not morally justified to use increased profit as a rationale for doing harm to others. By continuing to invest in and thus promote the extracting, processing, and burning of fossil fuels, Berkshire is doing harm to people around the world and creating conditions that will threaten future generations. While one is not morally justified to use increased profits as a rationale for doing harm to others, one cannot also opt out of, out of ethical considerations by appealing to moral complexity. When you're doing harm to others, especially at the, this scale, there is no neutral space. Nor can you simply appeal to the fact that Berkshire is following state and federal laws when those laws are themselves unethical and that they allow the United States to violate the human rights of people around the world and set in motion catastrophic future for young people. The consensus among ethical theories will in due time become self-evident to the average person, analogous to the way slavery as an evil is self-evident today. Indeed, the recognition of the immorality of investing in fossil fuels is rapidly gaining ground as more and more institutions divest their fossil fuel holdings. Mr. Buffett, you're standing on an ethical house of cards and it is only a matter of time before it comes tumbling down. Like the thousands gathered here and the millions on live stream, I admire your considerable achievements, but I am afraid that if you do not change course very soon, history will not judge you kindly. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. The, mo the motion is now ready to be acted upon, and if there are any shareholders voting in person, they should now mark their ballots on the motion and deliver their ballots to one of the uh, meeting officials in the aisles. Ms. Amick, when you're ready, you may give your report. My report is ready. The ballot of the proxy holders in response to proxies that were received through last Friday afternoon casts 7,784 votes for the motion and 594,044 votes against the motion. As the number of votes against the motion exceeds a majority of the number of votes of all Class A and Class B shares properly cast on the matter, as well as all votes outstanding, the motion has failed. The certification required by Delaware law of the precise count of the votes will be given to the Secretary to be placed with the minutes of this meeting. Thank you, Ms. Hammack. The proposal fails. and. Um, Mr. Scott, do you have a motion? 
I move the meeting be adjourned. Is there a second? I second the motion. The motion to adjourn has now been made and seconded. We will vote by voice. Any discussion? If not, all in favor say aye. All opposed say no. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming and come again next year. We're back to wrap up the day. Uh, the adjournment vote going very swiftly, Andy. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, we covered a lot of ground. I mean, everything sure from driverless cars to taxes to health care to life's lessons. Um, so for sure, something for everybody. Uh, I mean, it was uh, wide ranging. Uh, I mean, hours and hours they were up there answering questions. That final bit there, just a little bit of the, the business of what that kids at home, that's what a regular annual boring meeting looks like. This is a, a really different one. While that was uh, going on, we actually got a chance to talk to somebody uh, that had been up there. Yeah, there are uh, a lot the of meeting. questions being asked. That's right, Jen. And, and one of the people asking a question today was Whitney Tilson. And he just stopped by our set here at Berkshire. Take a look. We're joined now by Whitney Tilson, founder of the hedge fund Case Capital and a well-known Warren Buffett watcher. Whitney, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Can you tell us about your history with Berkshire Hathaway and Warren Buffett? How'd you get involved? How long ago? Um, well, I've owned the stock for a little more than 20 years. Um, so uh, this is my 19th consecutive Berkshire meeting. And so I'm um, dyed in the wool. Um, Berkshire and Buffett and Munger junkie, I'm, I'll uh, freely admit. And so you actually uh, contributed to the book about Charlie Munger? Yeah, Poor Charlie's Almanac. Um, I was uh, such a uh, such a Munger junkie that um, there were DVDs or CDs back of some of his speeches back in the day, you know, pre pre everything being on the internet. And so I had a number of those uh, talks that he gave, some of his iconic talks over the last few decades uh, transcribed. So when Peter Kaufman was putting together this book, uh, Charlie said, go get the transcripts of my speeches from Whitney Tilson. Uh, and so I ended up writing a chapter of the book and uh, contributing a number of the transcripts that made up um, what's a, a classic, classic book I highly recommend. So you just got to ask a question upstairs. Yeah, the last question the of the last day. I was very of lucky. The day, yeah. And it was about jobs moving overseas. Yeah. What were you trying to get at with them? Well, I think Buffett and Munger are exemplars. I think Berkshire Hathaway is an exemplar. They don't play the quarterly earnings game. They don't have high-priced uh, consultants coming in telling them to slash jobs here, move plants overseas there, uh, to try and make their quarterly numbers and juice their stock price. Uh, and uh, I wanted to give them the opportunity to talk about you know, how they have built a company that is the fourth largest in the United States by revenues, has a $410 billion market cap, but they've done it the right way. Uh, and they haven't played all these silly games, and they haven't done it on the backs of their own workers and on the backs of this country by shipping jobs overseas or something. And this is a mega issue, not just in the United States, but in Europe as well, Brexit, et cetera, where there is a revolt going on among people in Europe and certainly people in the United States that is shaking the post-World War II economic order to its core because the average American worker out there feels like the system is rigged and it's not working for them and it's working for corporate America, it's working for the one percenters, et cetera. And I think Buffett and Munger are, are offering a, a humane way of doing business uh, and that you can be unbelievably successful and make a fortune and your stock can go up and up and up tens of thousands of times in their case, you know, over the decades. Um, and so I asked them about that and, uh, and to give them a chance to, to talk sure. about, you know, their method and how it's so different than the average thing in corporate America where everyone's worshiping at the altar of maximizing shareholder value, which is, it can be translated as do whatever is necessary to juice your stock as high as possible in the short term. Whitney, you came out recently, I think, and suggested that Berkshire Hathaway stock is undervalued? Yes. Um, Can you talk to us about that? That's sure, interesting. Sure. Um, it's hard to imagine the stock trading at $250,000 per A share. Uh, obviously, the, the B shares, if you don't have that kind of money, um, is undervalued. But uh, if you value, I've, I value Berkshire the same way Buffett has always valued it, which is you just value the cash and investments uh, at, at par. That's easy to value. And then you just put a reasonable conservative multiple on the pre-tax earnings of the business. Um, and so, you know, cash and investments are some 
somewhere around $170,000 per A share. The business is earning close to $13,000 per A share in pre-tax earnings. You put a 10 multiple on that, combine the two, and you get to about $300,000 per A share. So Berkshire today is, call it an 85 cent dollar. Uh, it's 15% below its intrinsic value. But keep in mind, intrinsic values growing at a nice pace. In, in the first quarter of this year, they just released earnings. Book value uh, was up 3.5% in only three months. For a company of this size to actually be growing at a somewhere around a 10% rate is pretty remarkable. So you've got um, a stock that's undervalued, incredibly conservatively financed, run by Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger with just enormous momentum, um, growing at a nice rate um, in a very fully valued market where I, I am struggling to find anything to buy. Uh, you know, Berkshire is sort of a, a sort of a layup. You can sleep very easily owning it, and you're probably going to do better than the S&P. And, and so, so it, it's not a back-up-the-truck price cheap today, but it's, it's a great value, I think. Real quick, given the comments that they had about Jeff Bezos and Amazon and yes. also missing Google, neither yes. value name, could you see them ever making an investment in those two companies? If we were to encounter a 2008 kind of situation where stocks get cut in half, perhaps, okay. um, uh, it's unlikely that they're going to chase them. Um, I was actually surprised. There was uh, Charlie, uh, Warren was a little more like, wow, we really missed Amazon. And Charlie's like, you know what? Uh, I don't beat myself up for mm -hmm. missing Amazon. That's just not the kind of thing that's in our sweet spot. And it was very hard to predict that they would be so successful in the cloud area. Right. You know, they, they were principally, for their first 10 years or so, was just in the retail space. Um, you know, as a Berkshire shareholder, I'm sort of glad that they're dipping their toe into being willing mm -hmm. to invest a little in technology. Um, uh, I, I'm sort of relieved that they sold a third of their IBM. I, I'm concerned about IBM as a business, but they'll probably do fine with Apple. Yeah, they said that was one of the things they'd learned, right? They've, they've changed and learned. Yeah. Uh, All right, Whitney Tilson, thanks very much for coming by. My pleasure. Very interesting. Yeah, some great perspective from someone who's followed Berkshire for a very long time. Definitely. Uh, Andy, this has been a lot of fun. Yeah. The great it has. time uh, down here with you and our whole team here. Likewise. And that's going to do it for us. Thanks so much for watching. The full replay of today's meeting will be available on Yahoo Finance shortly. The podcast of today's meeting will be available on the ACAST app from the Microsoft Store, iTunes, or Google Play. So if you missed anything, don't worry, it'll be there. You can find it. Thanks again for watching. Until the next time, on behalf of Andy Serwer and myself, I'm Jen Rogers. Goodbye. Bye.